Good morning, everyone. Hello, welcome. Yeah, there we go. I love the energy in the room. Thank you so much, everyone, for showing up. I would love to have you find your way into a seat so we can have Paul give our opening talk. That's right, everyone. We'll get started in just two minutes. So please come up here, find a seat, bring your conversation up to the front of the stage, and we'll get ready to introduce Paul. Cheers.
Good morning! Welcome! Thank you everybody so much for joining DSI Berlin. Let's get some energy! Woo! That's right, that's right, that's right. It always feels so good to have so many people excited about moving the future of science forward one step at a time. So before we start here, I just want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to join us and figuring out how we can help move science to the next generation. So thank you, thank you, thank you. For our opening talk, we have our legendary Paul. For those that don't know, Paul is an economist, a biohacker, and a Web3 pioneer. He founded Linum Labs and oversaw digital identity at Consensus. He's a co-initiator of VitaDAO BioXYZ and the co-founder and CEO of Molecule. Let's give him a warm welcome, Paul. Thank you so much, James. Uh, first of all, a massive thank you for all of you to being here this year. It's our second, uh, second D Cyberlin. Um, the first one was only a year ago, and it feels like so much has happened. Uh, so much has happened in the space. So much has happened since uh, I think we all sat here um, last. I think it was beginning of April, end of April. Um, the space is growing, and it's moving at an incredible pace. Um, and so, what I want to talk about uh, with you all today, as like having the honor to open. Um, thank you so much, James, for the for the kind opening and the kind words. Um, I, I really want to talk about what has happened in the ecosystem, where's the ecosystem moving, and how can we really accelerate uh, to kind of the next big inflection point. Can, uh, can you put up the slides? Yes. Cool. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Paul Kohlhaas, um, uh, CEO and co-founder of Molecule. My journey into the space is, uh, is quite atypical. So I'm not a, as James said, I'm not a scientist by training, um, but I spend a lot of time in online collaborative biohacking communities as a teenager. And uh, these communities were really, I think, pioneering new ways of open collaboration. And I witnessed those ways of open source collaboration again in the blockchain space and the software space. Uh, and I think a lot of what we're trying to do is create a, a replication of a much more open and scientific and collaborative space. So why are we here today? Why do we actually want to accelerate science? Um, I'm just going to ask very openly. Failure of what? Okay. Transparency in what? Yeah, great. Yes. <laughs> I think we're all here for uh, a burning desire to change, um, and and I think to to solve humanity's biggest challenges and our biggest problems. But what our biggest problems are is I think a very always a very unique perspective on being human. It's really I think what influences our our personal lives the most. Uh, or our collective lives as, as people. So the actual why do we want to accelerate science and for whom do we want to accelerate it? For whom do we want to make it more open? I think many of us are here to cure diseases. There are so many diseases that are still uncured today. Many tropical diseases, for example, that, um, that affect hundreds of millions of people across the world and that yet we still fundamentally lack the incentive and collaboration frameworks to actually accelerate science around them. Malaria, for example, is, is one of them. We want to live longer. Um, so I think one of the most uh, prolific communities in the DSI space has become VitaDAO, focused on aging and longevity research, with this fundamental desire of how can we alter our biology to live longer, healthier, and happier lives. We want to understand the universe. We want to reverse climate change. Um, there are even, I think, some of you are building um, DAOs or collaboration platforms to go to space. Uh, we want to create new forms of intelligence. 
And what unites all of this is really this fundamental desire to move forward. Um, and as some of you rightfully said, I think we're massively today lacking imagination, not what to research, but how to really research it and how to make it more transparent, more open and collaborative. So a quick recap for anyone that doesn't know the DSI movement, but I'm, I'm sure many of you do. The DSI movement is really trying to build new infrastructure, communication, and I think more so also a cultural layer, um, a cultural layer that empowers scientists with ownership and financial technology. Uh, and this is really a trend that is, has become very apparent across the crypto space. It's really about empowering individuals, uh, empowering self sovereignty. Um, I personally love this idea of making science permissionless. It shouldn't matter whether you're an MD, PhD at Harvard or a, a doctor in Nairobi, you should have the same access uh, to accelerate your science. To make scientific output self-sovereign and unstoppable. So I think, as we know, there's so much scientific work that gets shelved, that gets deprioritized, or also that never makes it to market because certain market forces don't want to accelerate, uh, accelerate a, specific, a specific cure. Uh, and then fundamentally, I think, in the same sense that open source software um, and the massive collaboration that that enabled, we need to make science much more accessible, participatory, and transparent. Science is really hard. <laughs> uh, I think, as many of you would agree, and Web3 is also really, really hard. Um, I, I first came into the, the crypto, or uh, back then it was still Bitcoin, the Bitcoin space in 2014, and it's incredibly confusing what, what is going on. It takes years, I think, to understand the culture of that community, how it operates. But I think in a very similar way, it takes years to understand academia. Um, and so DSI is really ultra hard, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, and yeah, I always, really, I always really like this meme. One does not simply decentralize drug development. Uh, that's something that we've learned at Molecule. Um, not the hard way, but we've had to learn it repeatedly over the years. Um, I think something that the Web3 space really excels at is um, having a lot of imagination and kind of creating a, um, a solution space where anything seems possible. And it's that same space that we need to bring into scientific research. So. Maybe going back a bit, how did I personally get here and, and how did Molecule come into being? Um, it's really a five, it's been a five year journey of continuous experimentation. Um, if you ever want to dig way back into the way back machine, there's an article called Liquid IP, IP NFTs and Bonding Curves, uh, which I published in August 2018. Uh, this was after kind of the rise of CryptoKitties. Some of you have heard of CryptoKitties. Um, and I'm sure you've heard me, heard me say this phrase, but what if instead of attaching pictures of cats to NFTs, we actually attached uh, a composition of matter pattern or the fundamental description in IP around a novel molecular structure or about novel scientific research? Um, with this idea, we then went on and we, we launched a, a first project called Molecule Catalyst, um, which funded psychedelic research at the University of Toronto. <laughs> so a very small psilocybin trial with a researcher called Rotem Petranker, um, I think it was one of the only researchers as well that we could kind of find at the time that was crazy enough to do something on chain, um, back then still using DAI, and our own custom-developed smart contracts. This was even before Uniswap, so maybe just to put things into perspective. Um, and we, I think we were trying to raise 200,000 or 150,000 for this clinical trial, and we managed to raise 5,500. <laughs> So that was very humbling. Um, and we began really thinking about where, like, I'm sure many of you have seen Venn diagrams. Uh, and a Venn diagram is really about finding good product market fit. And we realized the intersection of people in the world that are interested in funding psychedelic research and that know about DAI as a cryptocurrency and are interested in science at this moment in time was still very, very tiny. Um, actually, I don't know if Alexander Lange from our, um, one of our investors today, he's going to give a talk tomorrow. Um, but he is one of the people that participated in uh, this online crowdfunding um, in late 2019. So we learned a lot of that. One of the main things that we learned was it's going to be really hard to catalyze individuals uh, to fund just an individual research project initially. 
um, if you just go out to a crowd and you get those, that crowd to become the owner of a research project, it's actually very difficult to accelerate it. So we went out and we started looking for more and more research projects. Um, and then we found a really compelling one with the University of Copenhagen. Um, maybe some of you were at ARDD, the Aging um, and Drug Development Conference in Copenhagen last week. Um, my co-founder, Tyler, actually worked together with this researcher in a lab. Um, and, uh, but we asked ourselves, hey, it's going to be, again, really difficult to catalyze individuals around the risk also that is associated with a single research project. And um, uh, together with a few other folks, we then initiated VitaDAO uh, as a first way of financing this research project and curating and developing a community around it. Um, and then essentially began funding more and more research projects. I think to date, over seven different individual labs and universities have been funded through VitaDAO. And um, so this is almost like a year by year by year. Building things takes many years, especially at this very difficult intersection. Um, and then at, we launched BioXYZ to essentially help others replicate the design patterns that we saw around building design native DAOs. Um, I'm really excited that today so many of our first BioXYZ cohort are here. Um, they're already very actively funding research projects um, uh, across the world, which is amazing to see. Um, so what has emerged from this is an entire decentralized science landscape. Um, I want to give a big shout out here for the, to the ultra rare bio team and Jocelyn Pearl for continuously curating this ecosystem map. Um, and I, I actually think there's still a whole backlog. They couldn't, at some point they couldn't fit more projects on this, <laughs> but there's a whole backlog of projects that are actually not listed here. Um, and the space is continuously expanding. If you go on to DSci Global, for example, you'll see there's meetups almost happening on a weekly basis in a different city across the world, uh, which is so inspiring to see. Um, where are we today? Since, so I think since 2021, we've seen a massive community growth in DSci and also interest from leading figureheads in Web3, such as Juan Benet, the founder of Protocol Labs, Vitalik Buterin, um, and many leading thinkers in Web3 saying like, hey, this is one of the coolest use cases that we've seen for crypto because it's actually making a real impact and it's solving a huge problem today. Um, we've seen over 10 different bio DAOs launched um, in total with a cumulative market cap of I think 75 million. There's really serious investor interest despite kind of the ongoing bear market in crypto. There are over a thousand different research projects that at least we know of that have been reviewed across this ecosystem that's emerging today. And I think there's really some best-in-class research that is entering these DAOs. Um, so really serious research institutes, universities across the globe, considering to, to entertain this new model. So I think the total research funding via BioDAOs today is around 8 million that has gone directly into on-chain research. Um, we, are, we can count around 50,000 community members in DSI DAOs. Um, and while these are just kind of financial metrics, I think they are interesting metrics for the ecosystem. The cumulative market cap of all the bio DAOs is around 75 million. Uh, and this is despite kind of the downturn that we've seen in biotech, the downturn that we've seen in crypto. Um, but now, how do we get to 100 million in research funded and 100,000 scientists working in these organizations and really kind of a much larger market size for, for the space that we're developing? Like, what is the lever that we can pull on and that we can begin focusing on as a community that is really going to um, tenfold the impact that the space can have. So the hardest problem, in my view, really lie ahead of us. Um, we have to bridge Web3. Bridging Web3 into science presents, I think, a very large cultural divide. Um, scientific progress and breakthroughs can take years. Crypto tends to say, when moon? <laughs> <laughs> so, and these are fundamentally like philosophies that are quite at odd. Um, uh, so there's a lot of education and, and a cultural shift that needs to happen for us to bring this together. Uh, I think to merge the culture of science with Web3, science has to become much more direct. And with direct, I kind of mean like direct to consumer. Like figuring out how a specific, relating really to the communities that are forming here and relating to how a specific scientific innovation can, can, can have an impact in the world. Become more mimetic. Uh, I think many of the, uh, many of the D side DAOs that we've seen have, have begun taking to this. It, it's also about making science more fun. 
Uh, and um, as Tyler loves to say, it's all about having fun. <laughs> uh, and then fi finally, I wanted to put initially here more financial, but, but more sustainable and more commercially orientated. Uh, at least, I think, if we want this broad range participation. Um, and to merge the culture of Web3 with science, Web3 has to become much more usable. Uh, I think many of the DSI organizations that we interoperate with today operate across a very wide stack of Snapshot, MetaMask, Discord, and that entire, I think, user experience for scientists really needs to still become much better. Web3 has to become more long-term thinking. Um, quick wins, like quick profits, just doesn't really work well in science. And I think that's something that really needs to be, needs to be thought through, especially in the underlying tokenomic designs that um, various actors in the space are developing. Um, and then this interaction, again, I think more direct to consumer, is like how can Web3 folks, or essentially just the broader population, I think actually categorizing the crypto community as one kind of amalgam is, is the wrong thing to do. It's more like, I think Web3 really presents a new way of onboarding how patients, for example, can directly get involved. Uh, but then we need to build those intersections and I think the most important thing is really to begin thinking about flywheels. Um, so we have to enable flywheels that really empower Web3, citizen science, and direct community participation. At least that's where one of the biggest areas that I see uh, DAOs being really successful at. Um, so this is one of the OG Vita DAO sustainability loops. Uh, I think many of, you, many of you have probably seen this before. Uh, it's essentially this basic principle that um, uh, uh, the DAO kind of vets and funds different research projects. That generates IP, that IP can be monetized, and then proceeds flow back to the DAO, which can be reinvested into funding further research. Um, and I think the biggest, the biggest question mark that I have like thinking through this is really this IP generated and monetized. Um, and it reminds me, and so these are some of the research projects that we did our funded to date with an enormous success, really, really incredible researchers. Um, but what is actually happening with that research? Um, and so flywheels are, uh, I think, incredibly powerful tools that have been developed across, uh, yeah, this actually, I think, from um, Da Vinci, uh, one of Da Vinci's early flywheel draw drawings. But, for me, this is, I think simplifications are great, but I think as a community, we need to start really digging into the details of how science is actually being accelerated through these organizations, for example. So it's like this find research, fund research, monetize research, profit, sustainability. Uh, it reminds me, like this oversimplification reminds me a little bit of like this like meme from Cartman that some of you may be familiar with. <laughs> uh, and I think oversimplifications are great, but as a, and as a community, um, that set our aspirations very high, and it allowed us to, to already achieve a lot. But I think we really need to start digging in, um, uh, like digging into the weeds here. Um, so I think the reality for D side today is a bit more complicated in the sense of, at least for example, if you look at biotech or drug development, um, we are really part, of, I think, need to begin thinking much more on how do we actually translate research to patients, to industry, uh, and I think DAOs actually hold a key in, in achieving that. Um, so this is the typical, a typical innovation and drug development cycle today. Different research projects emerge. Uh, and this all today happens within the boundaries of one firm or one organization. And I think DSI is managing to really, to really break that up and accelerate that through much more open, open collaboration and interconnectivity. Um, so I think we're achieving to build the first pillars across this valley of death, but I think we really need to stay focused on what it will take to traverse the entire valley. So I think we need to focus much more on the ideal product and DAO market fit, where DSI can accelerate translation. Uh, and DAOs and DSI platforms together present really powerful tools to coordinate communities to collaborate, to perform tasks, to review data, and to develop assets directly with community feedback loops and distribution channels. And this can massively, I think, accelerate research across the value of death. Um, I'll give one example of this, uh, which is HairDAO. So HairDAO, for example, recently funded a research asset um, uh, directly. 
um, with a researcher called Rolf Paus, uh, and this was also based on community demand and selection. So the community said, hey, this is going to be a really exciting research project. We would, we would outright buy this if this was available. Um, the DAO then produces the asset and, for example, can sell early access to members. Um, community members can begin testing the asset, and I'm just keeping this very general, uh, and submit data in the form of a decentralized trial or just through a patient portal. HairDAO developed a patient portal to do this. And the DAO can improve the, the asset based on that data and monetize the asset. Can I have three more minutes? Cool. <laughs> um, and so at Molecule, we're really beginning to really focus on how do we get these flywheels going on an asset level to really help the DAOs and scientists accelerate science to patients, to industries, and, and to communities. Um, and the same flywheel could be applied in a synthetic biology use case. Or, um, uh, yeah, there's many applications for this. Um, so, as many of you know, Molecule really today makes IP fundable and ownable on chain. And our next goal is really that we're building collaborative environments for something that we call IPTs. You'll hear, uh, I think, a presentation from Benji later about that. Um, and uh, I think also, if you want to dig into the legal from Jesse, uh, how IPTs can actually help translate assets at a much faster rate. Um, so in June this year, we launched the first kind of fractionization of one of VitaDAO's core assets. Uh, and so IP, we call them IPTs, very easy, IP tokens. And they really create early liquidity and price discovery for IP. Uh, now, what can you do with liquidity and price discovery? You can create micro incentive systems around an individual asset or around an individual research project. So where I think DAOs first emerged and kind of blew up these big amalgams that started funding a lot, you have a large group of scientific reviewers, I think the next development will be really to kind of build microcosms around individual research projects. Uh, and this can even be applied outside of DAOs. Um, these IP tokens can be exchanged for work, for funding, or for contributions. For example, instead of paying the reviewers of uh, a DAO in the DAO's native token to do reviews, why not actually also incentivize them on an asset basis where they can be paid in individual ownership in, a, in an individual research project? So IPTs for us really enable open source collaboration without losing any commercial viability. Um, I'm going to skip this just for time. And we now, we increasingly think that this can be one core flywheel that kind of creates these microeconomies within communities, with the goal being to quickly distribute work that has to be done around progressing an asset, kill a research project. I think so much research like kept going on instead of actually just early on someone having the incentive to say like, actually, it, it's not going to work. Uh, actually, a majority of the costs in the whole biotech clinical development process come from assets, making it far too far into the pipeline. Uh, because with, if someone owns 100% of the IP, they always have an incentive to only share positive data and never negative data. And so we actually hope that these mechanisms can fundamentally surface negative data at a much quicker rate and either kill or accelerate research. Maybe to wrap it up, uh, we're building towards a world, I think, where scientists, instead of spending 80% of their time fundraising, um, spend 20% of their time raising funds and 80% doing science where patient communities can directly fund, govern, and access cures from DAOs, where scientists are fairly paid and incentivized for their work, permissionlessly. Um, I want to thank you uh, for being here today and for dedicating your lives to relentlessly building uh, towards an open scientific future. Um, and over the next two days, uh, tomorrow we have Funding the Commons, joining in for this space as well. I think that's going to be an amazing, uh, I think, create an amazing collaborative environment. Um, one of the core important things in Web3 is really this open collaboration. And look for the flywheels that will accelerate research and that will accelerate uh, DSI tenfold. Um, and have fun. Amazing, thank you so much, Paul. I really enjoyed getting up to date on where DSI had started. Crazy to think 2018, uh, you know, we still had an early paper on liquid IPs and how far we've come. Um, up next, we're gonna have Tyler. For those that don't know who Tyler is, he is the 
co-founder and chief scientific officer at Molecule. He's also a co-initiator at VitaDAO, SciDAO, and BioXYZ, as well as a biochemist by training. Tyler will be talking, his, his, top, his title for the talk is A Pattern Language for DSI. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, let's give it up for Tyler. Hi, everyone. Um, really amazing to be back here after a, a really momentum-driven year in the space. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I spend probably the majority of my time thinking about incentives in healthcare. Um, I had a kind of non-traditional journey into, into the space, started out really wanting to be a physician, kind of segued along the way into research because I had an interest in intractable cancers and realized that the only way to move the space forward was by really trying to understand mechanisms of biology. Later, kind of saw firsthand in the United States how the healthcare system fails uh, large numbers of people. There are ballpark 30 million people who are uninsured in the US who fall through the cracks of the system and spent the latter part of my research career, instead of thinking about how to do the best science, really thinking about how we can change the innovation and mechanism design landscape in, in places like the United States. And so, as, as Paul alluded to, a lot of our work with Molecule is really built around this idea of considering what levers do we have to fundamentally change the way that patients and patient communities can have a serious impact on therapeutics or innovation that they need coming to market. And Paul was the architect of what I thought was a really beautiful, really elegant idea. He, he mentioned it briefly in his talk, which actually relates to he was speaking more about the technical implications, so what does it mean to attach a composition of matter patent to an NFT? And I think I've spent a lot of my time thinking about the kind of governance and incentive implications of this with the idea that what would it mean if a patient population, a population of diabetics, for example, own the method of production for insulin? How might they price it? How might they access it? What would the world look like if communities of people who are affected by a disorder or whose families were affected by a disorders had the leverage around ownership in IP and governance in IP to make suggestions, to control how something is licensed, how something is accessed. And one of the biggest innovations that I feel that we've been responsible for pioneering at Molecule is the idea of these communities, we call them BioDAOs, um, which basically bring together a, a patient population, a researcher population, an enthusiast population around a common cause to basically fund research in that space, govern how it comes to market, and really try to ad advance acceleration, uh, advance, advance science and accelerate it, as Paul mentioned. And so, as part of now being in that space for two years, initially with VitaDAO, um, I've noticed and, and also been, I think, somewhat responsible for trying to create patterns that lead to or organizational success. And today I want to be talking about how we basically recognize and create these patterns together to really foster a culture of success and, and a culture of successful translational science in the DSI space. And maybe one other thing that I want to mention before I hop into the talk, I tried to make this as broad and applicable to many different groups of people as possible. It's really written for DAOs or people who are contributors in DAOs, who are building DAOs, but the core idea here I think can be applied very broadly and what I would love to encourage people to do is to take these kinds of frameworks that I'm presenting, apply it as a lens for looking at other talks throughout the day when you're talking to people from different communities and understanding together if we can try to identify a, a pattern language for, for decentralized science. So patterns are these really fascinating things. They're ubiquitous, they underlie virtually everything. In every sunset, in every heartbeat, in every mathematical equation, there lies a pattern. They're these kind of silent architects of our world, unspoken yet understood, unseen but always felt, and they're kind of the sentences of the universe. It's this really beautiful thing, you notice it in music, you feel it with love in conversation, but patterns transcend every space, they're also at the core of successful organizations, they're at the core of failed organizations, and what I'm trying to understand here is, is there a certain pattern language that we could identify that is responsible for creating a great project? And this is really, really important in decentralized science because of the incredibly high coordination overhead that you have. If you have a community of 
10,000 people coming together with maybe not the, you know, a very clear hierarchical structure, and you want to motivate those 10,000 people to coordinate effectively to solve a problem, one needs to figure out a huge number of patterns that will be successful for, for such a challenge. And so the inspiration for this kind of idea of a pattern language comes from a really visionary architect, author, and philosopher called Christopher Alexander. He wrote a very special book called A Pattern Language. It's related primarily with architecture. It's about this kind of timeless way of building. And he had this really beautiful idea to develop a framework that can be broadly applied to building anything from countries, cities, all the way down to like designing a doorknob. It was released in the 1970s. He's a particularly interesting thinker and really inspired this talk, um, be mainly because the frameworks that he used in architecture can be broadly extrapolated to any space, to the sciences, to design thinking in general. And his philosophy was, which I think is actually not so scientific but quite interesting, is that there is objectively good and objectively bad empirical good and bad design patterns. He wrote a lot about this on a book called, in a book called um, The Nature of Order, alluded to it in a pattern language, and I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, it's quite controversial, but I, I think it's quite powerful. The book is about unveiling the DNA of the built environment around human-centric design, and he describes 253 patterns from cities, like I mentioned, all the way down to doorknobs to form this living language for architects. And in it, there are various patterns that are organized in a hierarchy. There's like 253 of them, starting very broad, very high level, very macroscopic, and moving down to very specific details. So things like independent regions with their own governance structures, a four-story limit to any building, light on two sides of every room. And these patterns are quite beautiful in that if you follow them, you can go do anything from build a country, a house, a shed, um, yeah, to thinking about how to design a doorknob properly, which I think is quite beautiful. And so with that, I want to pose the question, what does the pattern language for decentralized science look like? How do we explore, how do we collaborate, how do we innovate by weaving this kind of tapestry of self-organizing, community-driven research models? And how can we, through our shared experience, contribute to this encyclopedic knowledge of this pattern language together? And so I've decided to take a first stab at this, um, and I've identified nine patterns that I'll discuss macro scale patterns, kind of these intermediate scale patterns, and then what I'm referring to as micro scale patterns, which I believe are really key to success for successfully building a decentralized community. Um, this is not exhaustive at all. These are also somewhat arbitrary and also somewhat subjective, so I hope you'll indulge me, but I've chosen nine patterns that I believe contribute to a story, and over the next days, I would like us to collectively identify dozens or hundreds of these patterns. So the first is, and I'll kind of tell this as a story, a clear mission, vision, and values that drives a project to have the potential to become a movement that builds dynamic, diverse communities where the law is driven by transparent governance, the fuel of that community is long-term term incentives that drive active and engaged contributors that have ownership over outcomes culturally, that have effective methods of asynchronous work, and where all of that knowledge is captured in a single source of truth. And I'll go into each of these individually and discuss a little bit about what each of them mean, why they're important, and then um, I hope that you, while you're listening, can begin to think about ways that you can apply this to your own project, or if you're beginning to get involved in a, in a DAO or a community, understanding when you see patterns that don't work or, or do work. So, Mission, vision, and values uh, is something that I think a lot of marketing folks might come in and talk to you about when you're beginning to start a startup or a project, but it's actually one of the most important rallying calls for any community. It is this guiding light that focuses all efforts, and it's something that should be ambitious and visionary enough to motivate people to join your cause. C communities that have problems coordinating or problems attracting and retaining talent tend to do so because they're not linking coordination to their mission, vision, and values. There's a million ways to come up with this. For a community like VitaDAO, it could be as ambitious as cure human aging, or it could be as specific as 
uh, a, a community funding research into biogerontology. Both of those statements will attract different types of people, and so it's really important to think about the type of community that you want to cultivate and how you want to cultivate it. Do you want to speak to researchers? Do you want to speak to laymen? Do you want to speak to both? But this is extremely important because it aligns your strategy and initiatives with a clear goal that everyone is moving towards. And in essence, every action of every contributor in a decentralized organization should map directly to this mission vision values, maybe once, maybe twice removed. But you can very quickly, in organizations with very high coordination overhead, get into a situation where it's actually relatively unclear what actions of what community members are contributing to the thing that you're trying to drive. So always having this guiding North Star clear is really the ability to, I think, step one to building a successful organization. And if you do that really, really well, you might have the potential to be a movement. And this is something that I think in DSI is quite different from building a startup or building a nonprofit organization. Movements ignite passion. They transform participants into champions of a cause. They're very resilient. A movement is very hard to start, but very hard to kill. Decentralized science has the trappings of a movement. It's not just about one goal, it's about many goals. It has the power to bring t people together around values, around ideas. People change their careers to join this thing because it feels like it's something that has momentum. We should be asking the, the, ourselves the question, how do we enable movements and, and how do we enable this kind of network effect that becomes unstoppable, whether it's related to curing a disease, translating a piece of innovation, going to space, whatever that is. Movements gather momentum through these network effects. And, and like I said, if you want to create network effects, you need to have a mission and a vision that really drive home a core message and that motivate people. And if they're really effective, and, and why is it important, for example, that something becomes a movement? It really enables massive resource mobilization. If you're trying to tackle the hardest problems facing humanity, curing cancer or something like this, we've seen historically that even $500 billion or a trillion dollars can't necessarily do that. Um, you need massive, massive resource mobilization and also the ability to find social proof. So let's say you've created an effective mission and vision and value statement. You're beginning to have the potential to become a movement. The next thing that you'll see is trying to mobilize this dynamic and diverse communities. How do you grow a community to be very effective at achieving a specific goal? And I think a big part of it is about creating inclusive communities with diverse backgrounds and diverse skills. As human beings, we have the tendency to look for people that mimic how we behave, how we act, how we think. Um, I, any of you that are founders or have a co-founder, um, you know, you're actually much better off looking for someone who has very different ideas than you, that sees the world very differently. Um, somebody who covers your weaknesses, and this is true within any community. You want to have people from very different backgrounds uh, with very different skills if you're going to try to effectively solve some of the biggest problems facing humanity. And you really want to have a representative sample of what humanity looks like because people have many different perspectives. One of the most interesting things about DSI and, and about these communities is that the community in many ways is, is the moat, if you want to think about it in those terms. You can fork a protocol, you can fork a piece of technology, but the community is something that is incredibly resilient and has a certain amount of strength. If you're trying to lobby the FDA to get a drug approved, it's not going to be how much money you have necessarily, it's going to be how many patients are part of this community that believe in something. And this is why it's really important to, to really grow it effectively and, and make everyone feel welcome. On the other side, one thing that I've learned is that offboarding is as important as, as onboarding. You, to have a truly inclusive community, you also need to be ready to exclude people who create massive issues in a community or who drive attention away from your, from your mission or your vision. This is something that people do not think about enough, in my opinion, in permissionless communities. It's often the case that people show up. It can be rife for opportunism, but you really want to have carefully thought out mechanisms to actually remove people that make creating inclusive communities possible. If any of you go out in the, in the Berlin club scene this weekend, you'll see a group of people who do this really effectively, in my opinion. Um, but this is re a really an important lesson, that offboarding is also equally important to good community building. Governance is how decentralized communities operate. And to effectively coordinate in, in an organization where everything is a function of creating a proposal, the rules of governance really needs to be known to every single participant. Decentralization only functions with effective governance, and rules, law, governance, whatever you want to call it, 
is usually written in blood, meaning that it's hard to anticipate. It's normally kind of retroactive. Um, and for those of you that are building DAOs, you really want to consider what your existential risks are. You want to create governance for that. You want to think about the type of incentives that you want to create and create governance that, that create the outcomes that you want. Um, but more important than anything else is actually that the rules of the game are known to every participant. People have the right to participate if they want or not. Um, and so it's probably actually more important that the rules of the game are known rather than being fair, I would even say. But transparent governance is this kind of bedrock of trust and accountability that enables coordination. And we kind of take it for granted that folks will want to vote on things and will want to participate in governance around projects. In many cases, it's not necessarily true. They just want to have their problem solved. They want to achieve the mission. And if they feel that their participation will meaningfully move something in doing that, they will likely participate. Um, but that is up to you to create when you're building your community. Tied directly to governance is this idea of long-term incentives. For those of you that come from the Web3 space, um, there are a lot of token economic designs and a lot of incentive designs that aren't necessarily sustainable. Airdrops are one of them, for example, that try to bootstrap networks very quickly with some efficacy, not always. The best incentive, and I think the Herodow community has been absolutely spot on by kind of enabling this, is is really solving this problem, is solving your mission, vision, value, like or solving your mission and achieving that vision. The most valuable people are those that are intrinsically motivated to contribute to something without necessarily needing to have a strong financial incentive to do so, although we obviously incentives are a big part of Web3. Um, in my opinion, a meritocracy is more important than a democracy in this sense. You want to reward people who put a huge amount of effort into making your community successful. And you want to be mindful of rewarding people who are um, p potentially opportunistic and, and just trying to make a quick buck. Favoring that long-term sustainable growth over short-term gain is the way that you will successfully and longitudinally build a, build a successful community. Much of DSI and much of BioDAOs is a function of good incentive engineering, and this is something that I think the space has, has the ability to really experiment with. We've actually seen very few designs here, but I think it's an area that, that you need to pay a, an extraordinary amount of attention to. Incentives, if they're well constructed, create engaged and active contributors. And you know, part-time contributors or people that show up for an hour a week won't necessarily build your project, but in many cases, they're the driving forces that will sustain it. That said, every project requires an extremely focused core team. It's a bit of an illusion to think that you can have an idea and that people will just show up and achieve your vision. It requires a core team with an insane amount of drive that are setting the culture, that are showing people how it's done, and this is kind of the model through which com contributors will join and kind of mimic and, and you know, basically perceive this culture. It's kind of a misconception if you're a builder in this space that, that you know, it's really important to have a huge quantity of people. Quality always beats quantity with respect to contributors. And so having a Discord community of 200 people that care deeply about a cause and are working every day to, to achieve it is much more valuable than having 10,000 people that are posting spam uh, in an online forum. Um, decentralization is a tool. It shouldn't exist for the sake of itself. And also being really cognizant about where to decentralize and where not to decentralize is one of the key decisions that you need to make when you're building a community. One of the things that I would love um, people to really observe as they go into the space as a contributor, uh, if, you're, if they're building your own communities, is understanding what areas have great network effects that you can leverage effectively, deal sourcing, academic networks, education initiatives, and what really doesn't work when you try to just outsource it to the community, and this be, so, might be something like operations, for example. And so onto the, the, macro, the micro patterns, these are just, a, again, a couple of things that I think are worth keeping an eye on. So ownership of outcomes. Accountability in DAOs can be incredibly diffuse, meaning that if everyone is accountable, nobody is. You maybe have 100 people, for example, working on initiatives. It's very unclear who owns it, but in, in my personal opinion, and this is obviously subjective, one person should be accountable for one outcome with many folks responsible. Communities and DAOs require leadership and ownership, just like any other community. Just because they're decentralized doesn't mean that they, they should be directionless. And one person needs to be strongly accountable for a specific outcome. DAOs also are in this very nascent stage where we're really learning how to reward people and how to incentivize. And it's really important to reward outcomes uh, and outputs over inputs. Is it okay if I go two minutes? Or Cool, thanks. 
I'm getting the, uh, the timing signal. <laughs> Uh, the last two I'll breeze through somewhat quickly, quickly, so effective asynchronous work is also absolutely key to making your organization succeed. It's, it's, it's wise to implement best practice from startups. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Everyone's work should be auditable to a large extent, and most importantly, you want to re reward outputs over inputs. You have people who might want to um, yeah, send or receive tokens for spending time on Discord. You don't really want to reward those people. You want to really focus on rewarding folks that actually move the needle on tangible outcomes for your community. And then finally, if any of you have ever onboarded to a DAO, you understand how difficult it can be to actually do wayfinding, to find your way effectively, to become a, a good contributor. And it actually comes down to having coherent single sources of truth. So as a contributor, it should be really obvious where to find an answers. Redundancy in decentralized communities uh, can be a problem, and so having a really tight, sustain sustainable single source of truth enables massive uh, efficiency gains. In the end, these are just a few patterns. There are potentially hundreds of useful patterns in, in decentralized science. Unlike architecture, uh, we don't really know what works well yet because, again, we're still in these early days and, and many of the patterns need to be discovered. We should be experimenting constantly to find these patterns and what works for some people might not work for everyone, but I would love to encourage all of you over the next two days to really pay attention to the conversations and think about, based on what you hear, what works. Speak to people who have been building DAOs, understanding them, those that have been contributing, and see if we can collectively develop this pattern language that will enable massive efficiency gains in our, in our space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tyler. I will keep an eye out for other patterns of success for when creating a community around decentralized science. Uh, just a quick update and announcement. Uh, we currently have the Berlin stage has opened up. So for those of you who are interested in going to talks there, uh, please feel free. But you may not want to miss this exciting coming up talk by Laura. For those who don't know, Laura is a longevity and women's health entrepreneur. She worked with companies like Louis Vuitton, Apple, Amazon, and launched a D2C platform for longevity. She's also the founder and core lead of Athena Dow a decentralized collective funding for women's health research. She will be giving a talk on Athena Dow titled, How to Barbie Desai. Please give it up for our very own Laura. <laughs> Thank you so much, James. Well, we get set up here. I just wanted to say thank you so much for having this talk at this time. I'm so used to doing women's health conversations at the end of the day on the last day of the conference. So, th so thank you to the organizing team at DSI Berlin. And um, this is very special for me because last, the first DSI Berlin, I was an MC. So it's come around a long way and it feels like a decade ago. It's only been like 14, 15 months. Uh, we're just setting up here. Sorry, just having a little of a, where's the? Bear with me. <laughs> Okay, well, we're um, having this little, I'm having a very great week with uh, computers lately. I don't want to, it's really funny because I keep having technical issues in every presentation, but this screen that you, is it good? No. I, okay, are we good? <laughs> yes. How can we put it in full view though? There. So this is going to take, you think that it's going to be sort of a light presentation because I mentioned Barbie, but it's not. 
Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, Barbie was all over this summer, and there were articles written about in The Economist and other very prestigious publications about the impact of the economy that Barbie had. Why? Because when you give women things that they need and they want, they are your best customers. So I'm going to start with the thing where I say I'm also not a scientist. I actually started my career in luxury fashion, and I spent most of the in my initial part of my career selling things to people that they don't need. When um, I sold my company, I decided, well, what can I do that actually makes an impact? What if I can use what I know how to do to sell something that people do need? And what do we need is women's, women need better health outcomes. Our movement is focused on being the, the centralized leading community and platform enable, enabling translational women's health research, education, and funding. So we have a huge problem. Women make half of the world's population. However, I want, to, I want you to look at this slide because this is the NIH budget in 2022. Women's health only took 11% of their total funding. All of women's health across the board is massively underfunded. Even fertility, which when you hear IVH clinics and you hear of startups in the fertility space, took less than 1% of the total funding in women's health research. Something doesn't make sense in the math. This is a meme that has been going around on our social media and we use it a lot in presentations and it comes from uh, a really good friend, Healthspan Capital, Nathan Chang. Uh, he invited me to do a presentation for one of his groups and this slide shocked me because in even longevity research, um, longevity startup funding, reproductive health is second last and just after pets. So yay my dog, bad for women. Potentially my dog is going to live longer than my ovaries. And this is a massive problem. You know why? Because we're leaving a lot of capital on the floor. If you're not driven by the mission to make uh, women's lives better, and what you're interested in is in economic output, $600 billion, it's project the, market, the menopause market is projected to be valued at. And you saw how little money we spend in women's health research for fertility, which actually has to do with reproductive aging. You also saw it in the longevity on the venture capital funding we are living a massive economic opportunity on the floor. So this is where the DAO ecosystem comes into play and why it's so powerful. Because you don't have to be a scientist, you don't have to be a researcher, you can be a patient, you can be a woman, you don't even have to be a woman, you can be a man, you can be a funder. There's, the DAO allows people who are motivated by a mission to come together to, for overlooked areas. And there's nothing more overlooked than women's health. Of course, I'm gonna say that, but truly, look at the data, I'm not lying. So, where are we starting first? We're doing women's health research, but you cannot say you're gonna do all of women's health, it's too many things. So we looked at the data, and we looked at the areas that are most underfunded. I'm personally also obsessed with menopause, but ovarian aging, menopause is massively underfunded. It's a massive market opportunity because not all women are gonna have children, but pretty much all women are gonna have menopause. Endometriosis and uterine fibers, 10% of the world's uh, female population has endometriosis. And we don't have ways to diagnose it, to treat it, it's insane. And this is the year 2023, where an AI, where we've achieved a level of AI that is insane, and yet we don't know how to actually figure out if a woman has endometriosis. So, I'm gonna give you some about how far we've come, but we're very, also very happy that we're already at our first, we already funded our first IPNFT. This was a long process that started about a year, it's been a year since Athena Dow got form, was formed. And uh, we had our actual ceremony about three weeks ago. We started with ovarian aging because a lot of us are alumni from actually Vita Dow and are passionate about the space. And um, when you look at the different IP NFTs that we have coming up and the kind of work that we, the researchers are doing, we're really, even though it's not a lot of money, science is very expensive. We've worked in a very cohesive way to try to make sure that we increase our odds of having the dream that I think when Molecule was started is a DAO that can bring a scientific project from research up to a therapeutic. Um, this is gonna be our, our second IP NFT with Dr. Joshua Johnson and I wanna point out something that the power of decentralization means that you can also be working with research institutes around the world. 
All three IP NFTs touch three continents. One is in Europe, another one is in the US, and another one is in Asia. And that is a very powerful format that you cannot achieve if you're being, doing just a research institute in the US or in Europe. It's truly global, and I think that's one of the most powerful tools that, when you're talking about decentralized science. One project that's very close to our heart is um, the, one, the last IP NFT, which is going to be with Lu Dong. She is only a PhD candidate. Um, she's a woman. The, the thing that is very close to our hearts is that for us, this feels like we can accelerate science. Why? Because as most scientists or researchers know here, science is very hierarchical. And the people that get the funding are always at the top of the pyramid. And it's usually the same names. So the fact that we can actually find a researcher so early in her career, it's, uh, I mean, we hope, we're not, sh we don't know if it's gonna have the outcome that we want, but the fact that we can do that, we think it's so important. And this is an opportunity that DAOs provide. Um, as I said, we started with the least funded areas of research, but we're going to move into uh, devices, um, oncology, autoimmune diseases. When it comes to women's health, things are varied. So you have to do it strategically, but who knows? One day, maybe we can actually be one of the groups having an open source artificial womb. I think one of the things that you hear also about decentralized science is monopolies. And the fact that some of these technologies are very expensive because there's initial investors that put all the capital. And th there's plenty of articles, if you look it up right now, that talk about how fertility treatments are very expensive and some women are being priced out of the market. And this is not just or right. Everybody should have the right and the access to have these technologies available to them. And with open science and these new mechanisms, we could potentially even out the quote unquote game. So just to give you some of our metrics so far, as I said, we already had our first IP NFT. We did our first call for submissions and we just finished our second call. The first call for submissions had 50 submissions. It was a proof of concept for us, the fact that we had Harvard and Cambridge, such respected institutes apply for funding. It, mean, it meant to us that this is badly needed. Um, from that, we got to six very high caliber projects and senior reviews that came out of um, that are of the DAO, and three of those are IP NFTs. I just wanna say that this is a very meticulous process of evaluating projects from within the DAO, taking them out of the DAO, speaking to R&D experts, and then getting to the point where you have an IP NFT. We have 35 uh, active contributors, and by active contributors, it's about people that spend five to 10 hours a, a week doing something for the DAO, whether you're doing a post, or evaluating science, or spending time with us doing some of our uh, China streamlining or digital tools, it requires a village to do this work. And that is the most powerful thing too, is that these people are driven by the mission. We come with across all channels, 5,000 members. We believe that we're actually the second biggest bio DAO after Vita DAO. And we spend a lot of time fostering those relationships and really trying to impart the word of decentralized science to the general public speaker and more importantly to women. Uh, with, and that has, is connected to the next metric, which is we've done a lot of work going to conferences, academic conferences. Um, anywhere where we actually we get a chance to speak, we will go there. Why? Because it's important that people realize this is really important, not just for women, but for society in general. And James had asked me to make this announcement. Our biggest and moment was this week. We actually had our token launch, so we're officially a DAO. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, to, I know that we have a lot of our token holders here, and we're so grateful because we actually obviously met our threshold and went over our threshold, and we're so proud because we did this in the bear market. So thank you so much for being part of this. We're so excited. There's gonna be a lot of happening the next month, and from now on, it's even more work, but we love that we're here. And I had a presentation at midnight last night with a group in the US, and I told them that no matter what anybody says, at this point, we've raised over half a million dollars for women's health from the Web3 community, and I think that is very powerful, because before that, that hadn't happened. Um, with that said, my presentation is about how to, uh, how to Barbie decide. 
I want to point out a figure that it's very crucial for us, which is we're extremely proud that of the 110 bids pledged, 87 were ticket sizes under $1,000. That shows that our community was interested in participating in this, that they were ready to put their hard-earned cash into this, and that to us is very powerful. Of course, we love our bidders that put a significant amount of money, but this shows that there's interest and that women themselves are ready to do this, regardless of if they're investors or they're just community members. I also want to point out that we exceeded expectations because I was told on the DL that the platform wasn't prepared to handle over 100 bids or even at that number, so yay to us. Um, so that's when I say welcome to the girl economy. And this is a term that you can look up on Twitter or on Google, where it's basically the articles that I mentioned from The Economist says that pretty much this summer was saved by Beyonce, Taylor Swift, and the Barbie movie. Women came out in mass to do the things that they like. I mean, I didn't even watch the Barbie movie yet, to be honest. I'm more of an Oppenheimer person. But it, it just shows the capital power of women. And I know that women are powerful because they make the luxury industry, they make the beauty industry, and they even make the healthcare industry. 80% of healthcare decisions are made by women at home. So the fact that we're not catering to them, it's mental. With that said, how do we get so many women to be involved in what we're doing or so many of our community members? We're dealing with a particular paradigm where most, most of you that are in uh, Web3 or researchers, you see it, it's mostly men in all of these spaces. Women make a small majority of the tech ecosystem. Uh, no, they don't make a majority, they make small numbers in these ecosystems. We spend a lot of time in education models, info sessions, office hours, in-person community events, the memes, everything that we could try to touch, we did touch. For us, what we believe is that we are onboarding the new wave of Wave 3 uses. And this is very important because if we want to make sure that decentralized science grows, we're going to have to go outside of the regular um, suspects or the people that we think are ideal newcomers. Women were not necessarily driven to Web3 by the NFTs or the casino that it became for a bit there. But a lot of them, they are, we onboarded a lot of scientists that have never even heard what about Web3 was. Why? Because of the mission. And our mission is very powerful because all women know how hard it is to have their health, meet, health needs met. We also partner with a lot of women in Web3. We have a lot of great support for some of the biggest ecosystem players like Shifi, Boys Club that everybody knows, they're the cool kids in town, BFF. We work very hard to work, collaborate with those communities because as Tyler said, everything is about collaboration. And for us it meant the world that leading up to our token launch, they actually published this in their newsletters, in their communities that they had grown during the bull markets. As I said, working in the bear market has its particular, um, you have to be very focused to make sure you get all the right people in at the right time. There was a lot of backward, uh, back work that we did. We have two public goods out there. One is the reproductive health, uh, two reproductive health reports that were made possible also by uh, another Web3 tool, the Gitcoin grants. So we're really pushing the narrative that Web3 Crypto is not just about a casino and a bunch of dudes wanting to make money. There are very powerful tools here that could make a difference for overlooked people or communities. And as I always go back to, we've tried to capitalize from everything that is available to us to push our mission forward, which is advancing women's health research. For those who are curious about our premise or what we're working hard to do and how we're doing it and how our planning is gonna go, we did publish just ahead of our, of our token launch or white paper. It's um, quite a long comprehensive paper tell, tell, talking about the issues in women's health, how we're approaching it, the decisions we made and what we're gonna work in the next little while. So one of the important things is to be as transparent as, as, and as open, and we're always available to anybody who has questions. And that's the other part that is very powerful because when we were starting this, I was told, why don't you do a fund? Why don't you do a foundation? Why does it have to be in Web3? Because I know foundations, no disrespect to my American friends, 
a lot of foundations in the US raise a lot of money and very little of it goes to science. And in Web3, you can see the contracts, you can see the wallets, you can see where the money is moving, which I find very fascinating because it really shows when you're making the impact. And it's going to show that I'm not paying myself like $100,000 to run Athena DAO, which I think is also crucial when you think of the context of when you do this. You want to do this for getting something ahead, not necessarily because of your own personal interests. And I think that's the other thing that is very powerful about Web3, that people, when they do this, they know that they're advancing something beyond themselves. And um, I mean, we talk a lot about personal brand, but the most powerful people that do have a personal brand is because they're doing something that goes beyond them. And that's one of the things that we always try to push, that everybody in the DAO, they have their own story to tell, and they're here for a different reason, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a woman that has PCOS, or whether you're just a man that has seen his wife suffer. You don't, it's, it, this, what brings people to the mission is different, but the, all, the thing is always getting science funded and making sure that we get somewhere in, into that category to make more people come back to Web3, more of the community aspect to grow and more contributors come into the ecosystem. This takes me to, as I say, it takes a village to do this. I come with an amazing team. Um, the, already the core team is incredible. You're gonna meet them here today. The Athenas and uh, Stefano is called Atheno. Um, they, you know, we have a range from experts in innovation, Ines, who's done a lot of work in onboarding women into the ecos technology ecosystem in Europe, Maria and Stefano, who are scientists themselves and understand all the pain points from Stefano being himself a funded scientist in academia to Maria having at the lab and venture capital and also now a full-time person in the DAO ecosystem. The other part, Ellen, um, Aaron is also here too, didn't have time to make the presentation and adjust, but our contributors are core to us growing. And the thing that's incredible about DAOs is the fact that you can take the expertise from various people at different times. They don't have to be your full-time, quote unquote, employees or consultants. They come in, one email, one chat makes a big difference in advancing anything that you want to push forward in the DAO. And you can with some of the most powerful um, brains in the, not the ecosystem, but in their own expertise. One of the things that you, we have to start thinking is not just the social capital, but the intellectual capital that brings, the, and the networks that are happening in, in this ecosystem. Um, I mean, just pointing out some of supporters in the space in between academia and Web3, and now obviously I have to update this uh, slide with all the groups in Web3, as I mentioned, all the, uh, the Shifais, the Boys Club, all these people that we're planning a lot of collaborations with to continue to onboard more women into the centralized science ecosystem. With that said, um, I know that in, techno in biotech, a lot of people talk about Bell Labs being the Bell Labs of this or the Bell Labs of that. And for us to make it, well, I don't know if OpenAI is of the moment anymore. This was like six months ago. But we say that we want to be the OpenAI for women's health. We're literally at the beginning of a very long journey. And I cannot say that we're gonna be the best at generating IP or that we're gonna be the best at having the most robust clinical data. We're gonna be the best at something and it's gonna take a bit of time. But the opportunities are so, women's health is such an open book that the fact that we're working in so many of these different categories simultaneously, but people that are driven by a mission is going to get us, I think, very far. As far as potentially being the first women's health pharma company that doesn't exist. So with that said, if you are curious about what the world will look like with better and more women's health research, you can join us. It's very early days, even though we've been around for a year now. Now that we launch our token, we're gonna to be doing so much more and we're still looking for, we're always looking for contributors, new, uh, new people to join our mission. And thank you so much again to DSI Berlin, to all our friends and family in DSI. A lot of you are here. We couldn't have done this without you and we can't wait to see what, as Ines says, what the next decade is going to bring. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, really appreciate you helping move forward women's health and bring uh, a spotlight to that extremely important research that, as you said, really goes underlooked and underfunded. Up next, we're gonna have Pooja. Uh, for those that don't know, Pooja is a lawyer, innovator, and technologist. She is a member of the Getting Plurality Research Group at the Harvard Safra Center for Ethics and co-authored with Glenn Weil and Vitalik on the concept of decentralized society. Her writing has been featured in the New York Times, Washington Post, Politico, and Wired. And Pooja will be talking about how to fund breakthrough innovations in science. Now, if you haven't, I highly recommend you check out her seminal paper on decentralized societies. Uh, I know it, it was really big in my understanding of how network states and individuals who have a shared common ethic in a certain subject can come together and create new cuts of society to help move specific aspects of their lives and of research forward. So I'm really excited for this talk. Let's give it up for Pooja. It's going to take us like a t few minutes just to get this fixed. Um, so hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait. So slideshow. Presenter view. Yeah. And hold on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So let me interrupt. Oh, so I move this to a split screen. Yeah. Change the settings. If you want it like this. Do it like this. Uh, Will it work? Uh, I guess. And how many people? I'm just finding where the bunch of people are. Mm -hmm. Hold on, let me try. This is. Yeah. If you need, um, is there another one? Yes, you could use my laptop. Then it would actually work. I mean, if you can. Do you want to have some the next one go, and then I'll go after? Or you can yeah, we can do. We can do it. Yes. Yes. Okay. So just a quick update, as we wait for some technical difficulties to get ironed out, we're gonna see if we can get the next presenter up on stage. Uh, that would be Juan Benet and Vincent. Could you just raise your hand if you're here in the audience? No, not yet, all right. Hang in there, we'll be right back with more.
Wait, well, let's see if he can actually do that. Good point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> let's see if he can actually do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then how do I see my... Wait, wait, no, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. This one there. there. Okay, but it's not there anymore. Now it's, uh -huh. You want to do a slideshow? You want to do a slideshow? Here, yeah, presenter view. Okay, now it works? Okay, perfect, perfect. Hold on one second. All right, let me go for it then. Okay, go ahead. All right, thanks. All right, we are all set to get right back to it. If you could please sit down and welcome Pooja to the stage. Yeah, thank you so much. Without further ado, here's Pooja. Right, thank you. Uh, I want to take a little show of hands here. How many people here are investors? Raise your hand. And how many are actual scientists? And how many are just entrepreneurs? Okay, great. So um, I'm talking about breakthrough innovations because if you're a scientist, your dream is obviously to win the Nobel Prize, the ultimate symbol of status with a breakthrough innovation. And if you're an investor, this is also how you become ungodly rich. So trying to target uh, as many audiences as possible. But actually, the other uh, more substantive and more important reason is there is a very interesting paper that was released earlier this year arguing that papers and patents are actually becoming less disruptive over time. And what the authors did is they looked at citations, noting that disruptive works had many citations exclusi exclusively to them, but not to their predecessors, whereas marginally improving patents or marginally improving papers also tend to cite to predecessors. And so the authors introduced this new metric for measuring disruptiveness called the CD index, and they noted this dramatic decline over the last 50 years. So the point of this talk is to uh, answer the question, how do we actually get back on track, and how can DSI help? So um, how many people here were actually from my talk here last year at DSI? Okay, so this is building on uh, some of those intuitions there. Um, so I introduced the spectrum of scientific funding. You know, on the one hand, we have extreme public funding, and on the other hand, we have, uh, you know, private funding. And both of these have their relative strengths and weaknesses. So public funding, for example, is vulnerable to politicization, to capture, uh, even to underfunding, but has a virtue of being more long-term with some notable successes like Internet, ARPANET, Manhattan Project, and the space race. Now, the other extreme of private funding has its own set of weaknesses. It's biased towards short-term returns, encourages closed science, and underprovisions public goods. And like Paul was talking earlier, uh, tends to ignore smaller market segments or you know, treatments for rare diseases. So while both of these extremes have the relative strengths and weaknesses, and frankly, I've spent more time in the private sector, I'm not bullish on either of these extremes reversing the trend of declining disruptiveness. And fundamentally, this is because both of these extremes don't scale beyond the funder's narrow knowledge and spe specifically doesn't harness the collective intelligence of scientists themselves. Scientists and inventors know more than funders, whether those funders be public or private, and if we don't figure out ways to resolve those asymmetries, we have problems. 
And so I want to take a little detour here because a lot of people in this audience are really excited about, for example, expanding markets and intellectual property through fractionalization and tokenization with IP NFTs and so on. My contention is actually expanding this funding base, whether it be from public or private sources, uh, without bridging these information asymmetries between scientists and their funders, can actually make breakthrough innovation harder. And there are two reasons why. And if you study economics, this must be familiar to you. First is this common problem called adverse selection. When buyers don't know the value of IP, they offer less. And when sellers believe buyers can't properly discern the value, they don't sell. So the result is scientists with truly groundbreaking intellectual property are deterred from selling, leaving the market saturated with average or subpar IP. Another problem is moral hazard. Now this happens when scientists or inventors file risky, possibly infringing, maybe unenforceable patents, knowing they can just pass the risk off to an unwitting buyer. And the 18th and 19th centuries actually saw a lot of this in what was called patent medicines, even though they weren't patented. The market was flooded with ineffective and harmful concoctions, so it actually became challenging to discern what were the genuine remedies. And this is a problem of adverse selection. Um, similarly, producers, knowing that consumers couldn't tell the difference, had no incentive to ensure their products were actually quality, safe, or effective. And this is a problem of moral hazard. So also, just like, you know, since, since we're talking about securitization and fractionalization, the same also happened in the 2007 financial crisis. Risky mortgages were bundled with less risky ones, so it was difficult for buyers to discern the actual value and risk. And of course, mortgage originators lacked incentives to vet borrowers because they could just pass the risk off to buyers. So again, adverse selection and moral hazard. The point is, mechanism design matters. And securitizing, fractionalizing, or tokenizing intellectual property doesn't magically solve away these information asymmetries and fundamentally can actually make funding and finding breakthrough innovations harder. So in my last talk, I introduced DSI as this third way between both of these extremes, these models of private funding and public funding. And I made the claim that DSI uh, has this potential to both harness a collective expertise of scientists who understand how to do science for scientists' sake, but also clock, uh, harness the collective intelligence of beneficiaries who can direct science towards outcomes that, that actually relie uh, relieve suffering. And I made this other claim that DSI also encourages breakthroughs. So what did I mean? Well, let's first consider some breakthroughs we're all familiar with within our own lifetime. So CRISPR gene editing. Was this just a breakthrough in genetics? Well, actually, no, it was a convergence of several fields, including bioinformatics and material science. Artificial intelligence, and particularly deep learning and neural networks. This was a synergy in computer science, math, neuroscience, and data science, and many subfields within. Or the Higgs boson, responsible for giving particles mass, proven 48, la 48 years later with the Hadron Collider. This also was a convergence and intersection of several disciplines, and building the Hadron Collider itself involved the collaboration of thousands of scientists. I think it's actually 10,000 scientists. So even if we go back be before our lifetimes and we go to the uh, classic example of a paradigm shift or a breakthrough innovation, Einstein's theories of relativity, what was he actually doing there? He was actually rethinking the intersection of these concepts with a very intuitive result famously summarized as matter and energy tell space-time how to curve, and curve space-time in turn tells matter and energy how to move. So these examples all illustrate how breakthroughs emerge at the intersection of many different fields, not just within one. And my contention is that if we encourage more intersections and more recombination, so fields that weren't talking before, like neuroscience and economics in the late 90s, combined to birth new fields like this one, neuroeconomics, this can actually lead to more breakthroughs. So the question is, how do we do this with mechanism design? So, and actually before that, the first question is, how do we even define these scientific fields? We can rely on someone else's categories, and here's, for example, Aristotle's from a few thousand years ago, or we can do something more sophisticated by looking at information flows. Here, in this, uh, in this representation by Carl Bergstrom, the modules, module size here represents a fraction of time that a random surfer spends following citations in a field, while arrows indicate uh, the flow of volume and information between fields. But there's still some arbitrary decision choices here. Here's another map of a scientific network or information network, and this is usage data because that's faster than citation data. And yet here's even another map whose complexity frankly behooves me. 
Now, all these attempts are attempts to represent scientific social graphs or scientific information flows. Some might be tempted to work off one of these representations and create economic incentives for very distant groups to talk to one another. To talk to one another. Or better yet, some here might even be tempted to create their own global scientific social graph. But I actually think this is NGMI and this is the wrong approach and this is for a few reasons. First, global systems are centralizing and compress us down to one representation. I just showed you three, all of which have different trade-offs. Second, and more fundamentally, global systems have no subsidiarity and science is actually an enterprise of subsidiarity comprised of local scientific communities rich with tacit knowledge and mutual authority between them and in a network of mutual appreciation having memberships to overlapping groups. Uh, Tyler earlier was talking about governance. Governance in science actually happens very locally within these communities. And we want to preserve this local scientific sovereignty, even down to co-sovereignty in how scientific communities express their own identity and confer credentials. Third, we don't actually want to nudge connections at a maximum distance on the social scientific graph, right? Because we want there to be some conversational ties where there's some shared vocabulary and shared beliefs to form the basis of meaningful communication. Nudging novel intersections is actually this very subtle balancing act between distance and familiarity. So my argument, which is actually very contrarian, I think, for this audience, is that universities are actually the right level of social resolution and the best starting experimental substrate for breakthroughs. Why? Well, first, universities are unique nested networks with different hierarchies, departments, and so on. And also there's this familiarity and proximity in physical distance which enables high bandwidth communication, in-person communication. And uh, an outcome of this is there's also massive amount of petty rivalry between departments within universities and between universities. And this is actually to our advantage here and I'll explain why. Um, and as I said before, universities are already receiving funding from all these other actors but in very inefficient ways. Um, and now, this is precisely all these reasons I just listed for, you know, universities being the starting substrate is all the reasons why, you know, a lot of people have been motivated to actually leave and join DSI. Um, so <laughs> I know this is like very controversial and, and contrarian, um, but, you know, there's one method of disrupting from the outside in, but there's also another massive opportunity from moving inside out, which is what I'm trying to explain. So let's talk about this mechanism in breakthrough innovation. And I'm gonna lay out 10 steps, simple steps. Step one, pick any research university. Step two, get a bag of money from one of these public or private resources. Public funding today with NIH and NSF is $40 billion alone. Private philanthropy is around the same amount. There's plenty of money. Step three, give every academic an account with non-transferable attributes inherent to their system. So every university has some system of departments and sub-departments, and everybody has a position, whether it's a chair, prof, or postdoc. Everybody's already signed up to that system of identity and credentialing, so adopt it. Step four, apportion Zelda hearts, because we all like games. The higher up the ladder, the more hearts you get, the lower, the fewer. Postdocs, if there are any in the room, please do not walk out yet, keep listening. This will change. Step five, anyone who wants some of this money inputs their proposals into a research forum. And since it's the same university, people can attach supporting articles without any copyright issues. There can be some Q&A and there can even be some deliberation. And I won't go into details around this, but there's really interesting ways to enhance deliberation with, with tools like Polis. Step six, everyone gives their hearts away across different proposals. The more you care, the more hearts you give. Step seven, and then here's where the pain comes in. Your hearts get square rooted. Why? Because we want to price influence. Where the next heart spent gives more influence, but just not as much as the first hearts. Now, what does this do? This actually makes hearts work a little bit more like money. So I know if there are physicists in the crowd here, I imagine them squirming at the thought of sociologists having the same number of hearts to give away and I'm sure that's true vice versa. Sociologists probably feel the same way about physicists. This takes us to step eight, correlation discounting, where the answer is it doesn't matter. 
because people from the same department voting on the same proposal get put under the same square root and get treated as the same entity. So to physicists and sociologists, a square root on both your houses. A couple results follow. First, different participation rates in departments don't matter. Just because a math department has 100% turnout doesn't mean they actually have more influence. Similarly, departments can't collude to extract more rewards. Now there's a lot more to say about collusion. This is something I think about daily and probably one of the hardest questions. And there's ways this mechanism can evolve, uh, which I won't discuss within this, these 20 minutes, but for now, it works. Now, another result is to the extent you diverge from everyone else in your department when you're giving away your hearts, you actually get more influence. So contrarians have more influence. And finally, another result is research which multiple perspectives or say departments find interesting gets elevated. So this correlation discount step is actually kind of like a prism that takes in all the preferences and hearts of scientists and then elevates more, let's say, the more colorful intersectional uh, views that are agreed on by multiple perspectives. Which takes us to step nine. We use these filters of both quadratic voting and correlation discounts to give an intersectionality or plurality score and then distribute funds proportional to those scores. Now the presumption here, the underlying presumption, is that consensus between very different or conversationally distant scientists better signals novel scientific intersections with a higher chance of breakthrough success. This is fundamentally anti-majoritarian and actually contrarian by design. But is that it to the mechanism? Well, recall, each academic has some set of non-transferable attributes given to them by their own institution. A person's position, for example, determines the number of hearts they can give away for quadratic voting. And their department determines their natural cluster to give a measure of conversational distance. The next step is to actually apportion hearts in the next round of funding based how well someone has actually predicted a breakthrough in the previous round. So this experiment is run over many rounds over time, iteratively and longitudinally, as breakthroughs take some time to be validated. And so certain events can trigger someone getting a lot more hearts, for example, predicting reproducible science, a high CD score paper, patents, prizes, and so on. So what have we actually done here? With these retroactive rewards, we've transformed a hierarchical system of status to one that rewards predictive ability. Postdocs, you should be very happy. With quadratic voting, we've gone from expressing binaries to expressing intensity and introducing a price mechanism so economists should be very happy. And with anti-correlation, we've gone from rigid department divisions driven by pettiness to fluid, permeable, overlapping departments eager to cooperate for scientific alpha. So physicists and sociologists, they can lay down their swords and become friends now. So with this combination of quadratic voting, deliberation, anti-correlation, and retroactive rewards, we transform these petty rivalries and zero-sum interdepartmental wars into actually collaborative knowledge sharing infinite sum games brimming with Zelda hearts that barrel us forward towards more breakthroughs. And instead of abandoning these very rich laboratories of skills and tacit knowledge, we discard their weakness, their petty rivalries, and improve upon their strengths and their wisdom while deepening the richness of scientific networks. Now all of these mechanisms together are important, but which one is really key? And I'm actually curious here, um, who thinks retroactive rewards are key here? Raise your hand. Who thinks uh, quadratic voting is the key mechanism? If you had to, okay, interesting. And what about anti-correlation? So it's pretty evenly split. Um, so I actually think anti-correlation is the key mechanism and novel mechanism here, and this is why. Back to this paper which motivated this talk, authors looked at citations, but they also looked at another factory, uh, factor word diversity and found the same result across papers and patents, a decline. And concurrent with this decline in word diversity, they also found declines in combinatorial novelty. Over time, the word scientists used in their paper titles were increasingly likely to have been used in their previous titles and their previous works. So the researcher's intuition was that the more disruptive papers and patents are, the more likely they are introduced new words, for example, words to create new paradigms. And in the end, their best plausible explanation for this decline in disruptiveness, as evidenced by the citations and declining word diversity, was actually something very simple, specialization, or narrower knowledge sets, which is good for a scientist's individual career, but not so great for broader scientific progress. So 
there's a lot of research on science of science done by James Evans at U Chicago and Carl Bergstrom, and their research actually also validates this hypothesis and supports my contentions. They've noted a team authored paper in science is six times more li likely to re receive over a thousand citations than a solo authored paper. They also hypothesize this is because teams are better able to come up with more novel combinations of ideas. Also, interestingly, expert evaluators and grants systematically give lower scores to truly novel or interdisciplinary research proposals, yet it's precisely these intersectional papers and proposals that are twice as likely to receive high citations. Similarly, my contention is a key to challenging our existing paradigms, challenging and redefining the boundaries of our scientific conversational communities. And this is exactly what anti-correlation mechanisms do. They elevate conversations across academic distance, but conversations which scientists themselves see promising, so harnessing their expertise. And this expands vocabularies, forces confrontations with different paradigms, increasing in the language of Thomas Kuhn anomalies and incommensurability. And it's precisely when we have to reconcile these different views and expand our knowledge base, we make these paradigm shifts. So I'll close with this one, just two more minutes. I'll close with this one, uh, uh, Re reflection on history. Before the 19th century, electricity and magnetism were thought of as entirely distinct forces acting in different ways, causing static charge and lightning on the one hand and moving needles on a compass on the other. Maxwell saw these phenomena and recognized them actually as different observable aspects of the same phenomena, where magnetism is just electricity in motion. And light also was an electro electromagnetic field, a combination of oscillating electric and magnetic fields that move through space. Fast forward, years later, thinking about light, Einstein noted this inconsistency between Maxwell's equations, which always predicted light to move at a constant speed, and the classical principle of relativity, which says laws of physics should look the same for all inertial observers. Reconciling and bridging these two postulates and not discarding them, he actually came up with special relativity and then later general relativity. So breakthroughs require challenging our conceptual boundaries, and to do that requires challenging principles we take for granted, finding ways to reconcile them with other principles, or discarding them for better principles and paradigms that have more predictive and explanatory power for the phenomena we observe. Intersectional science increases anomalies and incommensurability, and this is good because it leads to unintuitive, unpredictable, and fun outcomes like this. Thank you. That was an excellent talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. There we go. Um, up next, we're going to have uh, Vincent uh, and Juan Benet, an interview that was done. Uh, I'm going to have Vincent come up here and share a few words about the interview. Um, for those who don't know Juan, uh, Juan is the founder and CEO of Protocol Labs. And Vincent is the Chief Ecosystem Development Officer at Molecule. So without further ado, here is Vincent. Yeah, so um, I was excited to interview Juan. Unfortunately, he couldn't come in person. So uh, it's like was turned out to be quite a long conversation of two hours. But we'll just do like 20 minutes of like DSI highlights and then uh, put up the link if you want to see the whole interview. But uh, for context, basically, Juan kind of like created IPFS and Filecoin and Protocol Labs in, I think, 2013, really motivated actually by science and is insanely deeply involved in scientific efforts, like doing fast grants and longevity, like funding over 200 projects with impetus grants uh, with like 30 million donation and um, advancing brain computer interfaces advancing kind of like the state of the art in, in AI chips. Like he's quite uh, prolific um, in, engaged in, in the sciences quite broadly. Um, also coming up with new mechanisms within protocol labs, like for example, um, retroactive rewards and, and impact certificates with a project called HyperCerts and no, like trying out a lot of novel incentive mechanisms also w within protocol labs. So with further ado, just uh, kind of like the 20 minute highlights and the link at the end to the full conversation.
So today I have the uh, great honor of speaking with Juan Benet about decentralized science. Uh, Juan is the architect behind Protocol Labs, IPFS, Filecoin, and many other groundbreaking initiatives. And in my opinion, one of the most inspiring creators and intellectuals in technology and science, broadly <laughs> building and advancing some of the most important technologies and scientific efforts. I'm super excited to chat to you today. Uh, first off, thank you so much for the super kind intro. Um, I'm super excited to be here and uh, also very excited to work with you and uh, many other people in the in the community on a ton of these problems. So uh, very excited to talk about them. Amazing. I'm curious kind of like on this thread, like there's of course like a lot of also problems for like more like with the current ecosystem probably of like science, but also more broadly things like that I think the progress studies movement kind of like is uh, framing as just like holding back general economic, scientific, technological progress, and um, I think which go probably even beyond science, like as you mentioned, like engineering, kind of like technology quite broadly, right? Like, what do you think are some of the, the underlying reasons that like hold back uh, progress? Like, and like, how do you think we could potentially fix them, like with uh, decentralized science, but also more broadly? Yeah, so, so I think, um, I think there's a lot of different kinds of problems, um, but my my sense of the biggest problem around is that there is this massive bottleneck in science translation. So um, I used to think that the biggest problem was things like science funding. I used to kind of um, read a lot of papers and do a lot of science myself and, and so on, and I always thought like, oh, you know, there's just so much to discover and we need just a lot more funding um, in kind of discovering more. And, and it's actually incorrect. Um, it turns out that um, th that although we certainly need more more funding and more uh, studies and so on um, to kind of be able to discover more, um, the big problem is not there. It's actually a little bit downstream of that. It's in when you're trying to translate the concepts that you have now thought about and put into a paper and discovered, um, and how you translate those into something that can benefit some other process somewhere else and get connected to some other part of the economy. And the, the reason why that's the biggest problem is that what's preventing scientific discoveries from actually impacting the world is that they, at the end of the day, have to um, uh, translate in some way to some application, right? So, so um, learning something is super, learning something new for the species is amazing and fantastic and it's great to be able to discover more about the universe and like there's something extremely beautiful about and, and wonderful about being able to know more of that knowledge. Um, but what the great value comes from when the entire species is able to leverage that new knowledge um, to do something better and to do something greater than, than we could before. Um, you know, th things like discovering that there were really small microorganisms in our water is what led to germ theory, and germ theory was extremely useful and valuable and great to learn about because it enabled us to clean up all of our water, to know that it's important to wash our hands, to have this massive hy hy hygiene revolution um, that, that enabled just billions of people around the world to survive uh, what otherwise would have been um, really you know, unnecessary deaths uh, to, to kind of like lack of knowledge. And so that, um, so to me kind of like the big bottleneck is in how we take our science and our discoveries and we translate them into um, concrete projects and artifacts that could eventually be put into some other set of things like products or systems and, and so on. So this is kind of a, known as a science translation problem. And, and that I think is the biggest issue in the entire, in the entire system. Um, there's of course other kind of broader things that we could talk about, things like um, you know, problems in, in credit, problems in replication, problems in funding problems in kind of just the rate of innovation and discovery and so on. Uh, but in my sense, like a lot of those things are, uh, are downstream of this bigger problem that even though we are doing an enormous amount of science, most of it is just piling up and kind of being wasted. It's not actually translating into successes down, downstream. Um, and it also uh, uh, ends up drying funding because agencies and, and uh, philanthropists and many other uh, and technology companies and many other groups that would be funding um, early research or fundamental research um, end up not seeing the results and the impact and so aren't able to continue funding it. And so I think for, you know, embedded in the kind of 21st century where we are, you know, and specifically in 2023, um, we have a global macroeconomic system that requires these strong uh, feedback loops between some activity that you want to do and 
uh, harnessing value, uh, you know, creating and harnessing value to be able to feed it back into itself. And I think like that's, if we can figure out new, some new ways of funding the area, incentivizing and funding the area downstream of, science, of like raw scientific discovery, it's still science, it's still kind of like, it, researchers are required to do this kind of work. It's, it's, um, uh, it, it, it's extremely hard um, discovery work, um, but it's not as maybe like highly valued by the scientific community um, in terms of you know kind of the big breakthrough discoveries. Um, but it is what I think the m is the most important work to be done, uh, which is how do we take the, the core fundamental things that we've discovered and figure out how to use them in, in, in the whole world. Um. For the audience of decentralized builders and decentralized science, like what would be some of your like advice or like things you would like to see built or like some of maybe small prototypes that people can um, start hacking on that you would be excited to see um, also maybe integrating with some of the other ideas you mentioned, which I think is like one of the powers, of course, um, of decentralized science, kind of this modularity. So maybe you have some last words for uh, the DSI audience. Yeah, totally. So um, maybe I'll give um, two, two categories of it. Um, one, I'll maybe mention a bunch of like really interesting um, uh, things that people are doing right now and, and experimenting with. And then second, I'll, I'll like point to a set of like, um, kind of sources for inspiration. Um, so on the, on the first part, um, I think things like making credit attribution um, an on-chain primitive would be pretty valuable. This is one of the things that we sort of discovered through the source credit project a while back. Um, like just creating like credit attributions on-chain will be, will be pretty valuable. Um, I think the second is um, better funding mechanisms for for R and D will be very helpful, and these can come in many flavors. So one that we haven't touched on very much so far in the conversation, but one that I'm just so deeply excited about is hypercerts. Um, hypercerts are a an on-chain version of impact certificates, um, and also made by David, by the way. Um, uh, who is hypercerts? It, it, it gives you a, a, a tool chain. Um, you know, a lot of us working on the on the hypercerts project are super excited about like. The tools that you can build around around hypersense, they're, they're extremely composable. You can do things like proactive funding, you can do things like retroactive funding. Um, they just enable you to kind of um, split a credit distribution on chain, kind of like what I was describing before, but it gives you the ability to um, uh, think about all the claims in credit space and then make that a transferable asset. So it's not just the credit attribution on chain that you can like route m money to, it's also a transferable asset potentially. Um, and that means that you can start doing things like sending money back in time. Um, uh, I'll kind of like leave that as, a, as an interesting, uh, instead of explaining it here, I'll leave that as an interesting thing to talk about in the future or, um, or, or, or find it elsewhere. Um, I think things like, um, we sort of discovered a mechanism that's pretty interesting called, um, we currently call it impact evaluators, but this is name probably should change. Um, it's kind of a generalization of block rewards. Um, but if you can kind of wrap block rewards to a pool of, um, actors that is all kind of trying to maximize some KPI. Um, you can make some very simple on-chain structures to, to change a lot of things very quickly. Uh, so I think those kinds of things are like pretty exciting. Um, I think um, things like radical drips are pretty cool. So there's, there's another way of like doing like small composable value flows. Um, I think things like, um, I'm pretty excited about the thing I started to call like network capital or, or impact capital, where it's like you can, you're create, you can create investment funds in early R&D work or like other kinds of impact um, and and s make small groups, small funds that kind of mirror the, the venture capital structure. So venture capital has all kinds of funds at different scales, uh, you know, small seed funds to like individual angels to like larger VC funds to like fund of funds and pension funds and so on. If you can kind of like create that same kind of network oriented structure, but for um, impact, uh, capital, um, that could be extremely, extremely valuable. So, so this might mean like, um, one of the key things to solve there is how do you have a notion of carry and impact ROI? Um, you know, how do, how do you have a, a structure where uh, all the people working on impact funding end up benefiting from the, the work that they're doing? This is one of the classic incentive problems in grant making, like the fact that grant makers don't actually um, get some of the impact or, or, or make profit. It just means that grant making is just like fraught as, as, a, as a field. Um, and so I think if you can create that kind of structure, um, it could lead to a much better kind of like early scale R&D type of pipeline. Um, and I think hypercharts can, can be used as the, as the kind of like 
equivalent of um, equivalent way of like propagating. Hydrosis might give you the way of, of doing carry there. Um, I think there's a lot of other kind of uh, so th that's kind of a funding mechanisms wise. Uh, maybe I'll mention um, uh, you, you sh people should be experimenting with like open access tools. So being able to kind of make all the artifacts on in science easily linkable and ratable. So papers, figures, um, data, um, the individual scientists, and so on. Like they'll, they'll like there's a bunch of like centralized databases that have like done parts of this. Think of like Google Scholar or Mendeley and you know other things like that. Um, being able to like make this a, a, an internet native thing that's internet routable will be way way better. So you know being able to have like something closer to Wikipedia for for this sort of um, set of artifacts um, that will give us a lot of ability to then create a bunch of other tools around those artifacts, right? So think of kind of like making the social network of science in a sense. Um, I think that could be could be super super valuable. Um, I think also mechanisms for peer review. So funding, funding peer review at scale, um, I think is the way that we get rid of like the bad journals. So um, we don't yet have open access because there's these like extremely terrible um, leeches in the <laughs> scientific process that are kind of like holding back all the papers and just kind of um, the kind of like it used to be. They used to say that it, it was distribution costs, and we eliminated that with the internet. Um, it used to say they used to say it's kind of like formatting and so on, but we have <laughs> it's not really the case because scientists do all of that work themselves. Now the kind of like last argument is peer review, which is kind of <laughs> volunteer work um, uh, anyway. Um, I think replacing that, creating a better uh, peer review structure, um, would could be extremely extremely valuable, um, especially one that you can fund at scale. So if if we suddenly get peer review done through preprints instead of through journals, I think that could be like a like a phenomenal, um, phenomenal outcome. Um, I think there's probably some other um, things there around thinking about the scientific process and, and like the artifacts of science, so the objects that are made, how they're like found, and so on. Um, there's some interesting combinations with AI that I'll suggest. So um, I think just staying abreast of all the latest LM models, and yeah, it, staying abreast of all the changes and being able to start coupling them to environments for scientists to experiment, meaning like. Um, training models on like all of the insights in a particular field to then use it a, as, as a thinking tool that can help you develop new ideas. So being able to like ask the thing to um, suggest more more uh, possible innovations or suggest types of experiments to, to try, or where you can you know have an element that that is trained on like all the papers or something um, to then like start probing it for interesting hypotheses or probing it for interesting experiments to try, where um, there might be a way of like tapping into like the rest of the scientific um, community through this kind of tool that is you know, helping you think like the rest of the uh, scientists. Now, you have to worry about like tons of hallucinations, so humans will have to like keep weeding out all the bad ideas, but I think that can you know, greatly accelerate um, science. And I think maybe like, so now I'm kind of turning to inspiration wise, I, I, I you know, highly recommend people um, uh, try to get a, the, the broadest perspective they can. So one of the things that I found extremely valuable um, growing up again was kind of thinking about history and thinking about um, other, you know, think like biology and um, as astronomy, like like knowing that the the universe is so you know, 14 billion years old or or potentially more, um, is deeply um, world reframing. Um, knowing how life we think life happened and knowing how life is related and knowing how cells work and knowing how um, uh, how that entire system de has developed is also massively worldview reframing. Um, understanding like different periods in history and how different communities and different different um, uh, cultures and civilizations tried to do certain kinds of things is, is extremely eye-opening. Um, thinking through what were the bottlenecks of those times, trying to think through what was problematic in that area in, in that time. Why why did like the Roman Republic never get to industrializing? Like that's an interesting question. Why did China, in in its many possible dynasties of, of being able to like get to that scale, never did it? Why? Um, what were the blockers? Um, what were the sort of like the kind of um, insights that um, led to the development of like the scientific revolution, or or kind of like what were the social structures that had to change in order to get like broad publishing to happen, and and the kind of appearance of like 
stronger peer review no circles and so on. Like that, that's the kind of thing that if you study those kinds of developments in history, then you can zoom back into the world today and th start looking at the world today with that kind of lens and think about some possible future set um, that operates very differently. Um, and so it'll, it'll sort of, thinking about peer, peers in the past and understanding those problems will help you understand and see the problems today and see possible solutions that could be built. Now, before you go out and build and spend a lot of time building anything, think through the leverage points. Like, what are the kinds of things that are smaller amounts of efforts that could translate to massive scale impact? And sort of prioritize your energy that way. Go go for things that will have, you know, higher, much higher likelihood chance of success. You don't, you know, um, simpler plans, simpler things that would then kind of translate into in, in ripple through lots of networks and lots of people to then cause massive scale impact. Um, yeah, so that's, I don't know, the kind of stuff that I would throw uh, out. Uh, yeah. yeah, awesome advice. And I'm curious, like, maybe to end it off, if this specific almost, like, resource book or something in this direction that you would recommend, kind of, like, these are builders uh, to read. Yeah, so um, I, so I'll, make, I'll rattle off a few, and maybe I'll start with, like, broadly inspirational ones, and then um, maybe get more... Actually, I'll start with the more tactical one, ones and then get broadly inspirational. So I think getting a good understanding of the history of various labs, uh, I think is very valuable. So um, pick up the Idea Factory, it's the story of the labs. Uh, go look at, read that book, read that bibliography. Go look at um, all the Xerox Sparks ones, like um, Dealers of Lightning and How Xerox Home of the Future, or you know things like that. Go look into the books about like Intel and um, all the tech companies, all the Silicon Valley, you can pick up a bunch of books that talk about that kind of time period. Um, also, things like Turing's Cathedral, it's a great book because it tells the story of the beginning of computing. Um, it tells the story of the building of the Joniac, which was like the, the uh, computer in, the, in Princeton built by von Neumann and a number of other people, um, and many other uh, machines as well. Um, so it gives you a feel for like the interconnected history of the beginning of computing. Um, there's similar kinds of stories that are the kind of like the um, that are in the in the realm of like the Memex or the the DKR, which is like the Dynamic Knowledge Repository, which is um, Engelbart's uh, um, work to like um, all of the um, hypertext stuff that eventually led to the web and so on. Like, lots of really good ideas. Um, in there, and then kind of like more broadly inspiration, I, I would kind of like lean towards things like David Deutsch and the beginning of infinity, fabric of reality, phenomenal books. Um, check out his TED talks as well; they're extremely, extremely valuable. Um, and then, you know, my personal favorite and probably most influential other human, or most influential human, um, is Carl Sagan. Uh, I think Cosmos and was extremely formative for me, and uh, his books and just his. His voice and his message, um, I think, has been just tremendously, tremendously um, inspiring. And and with that, I think, like, uh, throw in a lot of interesting art as well. So, you know, another favorite of mine is Melody Sheep, uh, who uh, actually got his start, like, by auto-tuning um, Carl Sagan and a number of other folks, uh, and now makes uh, extremely inspiring, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal art. Amazing. Thank you so much for this uh, fascinating conversation and your insights um, and excited to kind of like dive in even more deeply in future conversations. Um, awesome. Thank, thank you very much. I enjoyed this uh, so much and, and thanks for a phenomenal uh, conversation. Vincent, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, that was a 20-minute clip from the DSI podcast. If you'd like to get the rest of it, please scan that QR code. We have two more talks before we're going off to lunch. I wanted to give just a quick heads up. Um, if you're going to have some conversations, we ask that you please uh, do so in the hallway and keep that door closed. That way we can have the space nice and intimate. And the second is we were asked if folks could not crowd around uh, the elevator specifically, uh, just so folks can come up and down as needed. Okay, up next we're gonna have uh, Mati G. 
Um, come up here, Mati is the managing partner of Z Prime Capital, and he'll be talking about DSI culture, the commercialization of research. Give a hand to Mati. <laughs> Excellent. I'm gonna launch it again because I was. Switch between the sides. Perfect. Um, we'll probably hold it. Cool. So um, I, ch I changed the subtitle a little bit. Originally it was commercialization, but I felt this is more punchy and uh, less coherent. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So let me take you on a on a rather chaotic <laughs> journey with this talk. Um, so I will, I will start off with definitions, then we take a little bit of a history detour into the enlightenment. Um, we explore how crypto enables new types of products, and then we double into commerce as well. Um, and, and then at last, um, we will be able to put it all together for you to understand how I think of these our culture. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I, I would like to break down the, the, the buzzword of of um, D psi to understand the meaning of it, separating the D and the and the psi, um, and I and I want to start with science because <laughs> many use science today as a or many there are some that use science as a as a religious invocation like science is settled on this and uh, uh, in my opinion that's 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 counterproductive um, and potentially dangerous and 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 potentially goes against what I I believe in and maybe others in the room too. So um, what, what is science? And um, I like to settle the definition for, for purpose of, of this presentation. And I'll be relying on, on, on David Deutsch's high level framing as a, as a science, as a quest for better explanations rather than set of ultimate truths. Um, you know, science has supercharged human explanatory power and, and gave rise to rapid expansion of, of knowledge and innovation. Um, and, 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 and I do believe that, that knowledge is infinite and that new knowledge that explains the world better, better replaces the old knowledge. So there are no ultimate truths. It's a quest. It's, it's ever evolving and nothing is settled. Um, so moving on to the D part of the D side. And um, I like to lovingly refer to the D part as, as degen rather than decentralized. Um, a de degen in the best sense possible. Um, so redefining degen as, as someone who gambles on the, on the outcome of scientific ex experiment. So it's gambling as tinkering and trying new things. You know, the knowledge is not ultimate truth that we said before. So, so gambling is an inseparable part of, of unlocking new knowledge. And um, I, I, you know, I have this picture in, in mind of this Victorian era independent scientist tinker like Michael Faraday who was, who was degening by not shying away from a risky experiment that, you know, oftentimes he was funding himself um, as, as, as these independent scientists did. And this was before the government took on a major role of becoming a sponsor of, of science or academia, if you will. 
So yeah, if, if we put it together, um, I like to frame DSI as experimental quest for, for better explanations. And you know, maybe science today, represented by academia, has, has gone too far from the original um, pioneering days of Michael Faraday, um, of the Enlightenment when it attracted more risk-taking characters um, who had passion for knowledge-seeking um, with some of their opinions very controversial. And you know, today science is pretty much governed by, by politics and rules, which uh, we could say in a way could constrain uh, the ability to find new knowledge. And um, um, it, it tries to foster too much obedience in a sense, uh, whereas when we look at the origins of the, of the, um, uh, of the OG science in the Enlightenment, it was, it was mostly about a desire to make it that as much as possible people are not ruled. Um, so in a sense it fostered disobedience, but a civil one, so, so not an anarchy. So let's have a look at this OG science. Um, and enlightenment was very critical for producing rapid innovation in a very concentrated period of time, and, and this happened largely in, in, in Great Britain, um, or maybe the Anglosphere, if you will. Um, and the question, why, why Britain exactly? Um, why were they so proficient in you know, producing that much knowledge and innovation in, in such a concentrated period of time, starting with Newton all the way to um, Industrial Revolution? And, and again, I'll be relying on, on, um, on David Deutsch's explanation. So, so he posits that British Enlightenment was, was a revolt against authority, but um, it was not a uh, utopian one. Um, it was it was very practical. It was look at this kind of evil monarch whose rule is justified by you know this ultimate truth, and replace it um, you know with 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 something more pr practical. So um, it was not replacing it with another ultimate truth. It was more of a practical approach that you know there's a problem and how do we fix it? And their method was basically slowly extending, sorry, slowly extending privileges. Um, that were not available for the majority, but only to a few of specific privileged class. So, in a sense, it was it was it was productization of ready-made set of of uh, civil liberties um, that were then extended, um, and people were adopting them. So it was almost liberalism as a service. Whereas, um, you know, we're in Berlin today. Um, in Germany, it was it was a bit different. <laughs> Um, or I mean, largely in continental Europe, it was it was a bit different. It was it was um, their revolutions were mostly nested in sort of utopian tradition, um, and it was about abolishing the tyrant. And um, so basically, they tried to replace one ultimate truth with another. So we're gonna set up these, uh, we we're gonna write up these fundamental new rules that we're gonna enforce. We're gonna get these institutions to uh, watch over them and. Um, yeah, then it becomes very, very inflexible, um, and it's and it's mostly rooted in power and obedience, um, rather than you know sort of controlled disobedience that we've seen in um, the Great Britain. So, yeah, I I, I wanted to compare the, the two. So, um, Brits never took part in in abolishing, at least <laughs> domestically. Um, and, and they were producing um, rapid change without any sudden revolution or extremism. So in the 1920s and 1930s, when um, totalitarianism took over Europe, um, it never really became popular in, in, in the UK or in, in Great Britain. Um, it didn't have a popularity in the British political culture. Um, but in Europe, in continental Europe, it was since it was based on abolitionism that is rooted in power, um, here they were prone to making people obedient at, at all costs, and um, yeah, that's why totalitarian regimes were pretty popular over here. Um, yes, but obedience is not great in producing knowledge and innovation, and it seems that controlled disobedience seems to be very productive in terms of knowledge generation. So science, in my opinion, should never be subject to, to obedience. I mean, anything should go if it obeys the rule of you know, physics and, and, and mathematics. Um, so when I talk disobedience, I want you to think about, I want you to think about like 
you know, not a child that is testing the limits of the world around it and not like something criminal. Um, so yeah, um, how does um, how does this sort of relate to um, DSI? So potentially there could be a similar problem that we're facing to the Great Britain um, during the Enlightenment. So there's a problem of certain people and institution holding certain privileges and how do we fix this problem? How do we extend privileges held by credentialed few to more people? Um, so the question is, can we allow more people to deploy markets? Can we allow them to commercial research, commercialize research, fractionalize IP, um, making it you know, more open and not as dependent on public funding and potential political biases? So in general, can it be less dependent on power. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're leveraging blockchain um, or permissionless systems, which, which in a sense is also like a ready-made set of privileges that can be extended. Um, so, you know, that's very much related to social scalability, so you can scale um, um, either via power, so institutions or via technology and markets. And maybe we could start relying a bit more on technological um, social scalability rather than, um, you know, relying on, on, on too much obedience. And yeah, so we're, you know, in DSI, uh, people say, you know, they leverage crypto and, you know, what is crypto and how can we even further leverage crypto? Um, so, you know, from today's perspective, it, it, it looks like an unlikely couple, right? Um, so, um, what on earth even is crypto and web free? Um, because, you know, it's, it's pretty difficult to explain. And I, I, um, I, I want to talk about products of crypto. Um, I, I lately read a um, article called Volatility as a Service um, that posits that crypto products um, and culture is, is relying on volatility to be relevant and to, to become and stay relevant. And the most important takeaway is that volatility is, is crypto's feature and, and, and not a bug. So um, we, you know, and I always, and you know, we always try to like define what <laughs> web free means. There are different attempts and different formulas and different definitions. But according to this, I would frame it as, you know, web free as a state of mind of an internet user that, that comes for the volatility, uh, but, but stays for the, for the network, um, so rather than Web3 being a, um, a you know a place or a web page, um, it's it's a state of mind of an internet user, and and speculation is a powerful wedge, but but science is a serious thing, right? So so um, it should deliver serious results. So 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 what's the product of crypto? Uh, what's the utility beyond you know going up and down? <coughs> and yeah, in my opinion, culture is the product, and this is. Pretty complicated, <laughs> bear with me. Um, so we talked about disobedience, right? Extending rights. Uh, we talked about speculation a little bit and now we're <laughs> going into commerce. Um, so, I mean, what am I talking about? Um, so this might sound a bit hand wavy, but um, you know, I, I read this article called Life After Lifestyle or, or an essay. And, and it discusses how commerce has changed. Like, you know, after 2008, after the financial crisis, you know, millennials, they rejected aspirations and every, everyone became a barista. And now suddenly, you know, like with, with Gen Z, everyone wants a private jet and, and everything. So whereas like before it was, it was about rejecting aspiration, now it's about very obvious aspiration. So um, even sugar water is about aspiration. So social media rapidly changed the culture. Um, and um, it's, you know, the, the aspiration culture that we see, you know, TikToks and, and, and influencers, um, it, it has been about like products and brands sort of inserting themselves into the cultural relevance through these influencers and memes. And basically the thesis of this, of this um, live after lifestyle is that um, we're entering a period where um, sort of bottom up brand culture um, will take place. Um, so we're gonna enter a year of co-creation where sort of like brands are part of the culture. So culture is a product and everything else is, is auxiliary. So the, the actual products are, are auxiliary. So you're not gonna have people selling stuff 
uh, top down, but it's going to be more bottom up emerging products. And um, when you when you think about um, you know ETH buying you know like Ethereum and 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 buying ETH, um, you're very much buying sort of it, like ETH is selling block space, which is very much a Veblen good because you've got plenty of block space going around, but people want want ETH, right? They want they they bet on the future of conspicuous consumption of Web3 happening on on Ethereum, and maybe buying ETH is not as different as um, you know buying uh, Nikes. Um, so um, in the last ten years um, or so, social media. Um, have like inserted this this aspiration layer between the you know the consumer or the observer and um, product and and change the culture and now you know crypto web free will transform by by layering on attribution um, so the former was represented by influencer and now the hallmark of the new consumer era hopefully uh, will be tokenized culture um, and um, you know culture and its products owned by these online tribes. And you know, like we can see that memes are already traded, um, and you know they're a product that you can buy. So, so buying into these tokens fundamentally is not different from buying a product from a brand, because you know, products, products of conspicuous consumptions are 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 always a promise or expectations of something, right? It's like, you know, feeling, you know, you're selling feeling of something or looking like something. Um, so, are tokens and memes that different? Um, so, in a sense, tokens could redefine what a product could be and enable consumers, us, to directly purchase culture as a product. So, yeah, tokens do not only redefine what, 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 what a uh, product could be. Um, so, it, it, b besides a meme and, you know, culture that you can buy directly, they also represent a product vision, right? So, there's a there's a narrative that aims at, del at delivering something. So ETH is selling block space, Herdao is selling a dream, you know, there, there, there's always a vision. Um, so tokens are also a novel form of, of online organization um, uh, that enable rapid global capital formation. Um, they enable co-creation with attribution, so you get social recognition and then you can route financial value to the origination point of ideas. Um, they align incentives. So they create they create a sort of cohesive microeconomic unit, and they also serve as a as a as a governance proxy. So all of this could potentially transition us from from UGC, as in user generated content, to 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 UGP, user generated products. Uh, but it all starts with culture. And now, finally, at last, we can, you know. I believe that this side could take part in the in the UGP user generated product side of things, um, and it's time to wrap it all up, sort of in this unserious meme. Um, you know, as I talk about the culture, the DSI culture, um, it's it's maybe good to finally explain uh, what what I expect or what I hope the DSI culture would become. So you know, like the question for knowledge can be messy, and it's messy. And, and as I said at the beginning today, I, I feel science is often referred to as a um, religious invocation. Well, science is this, right? Um, and, and my hope is that, that DSI um, can potentially, uh, f you know, sort of help science re rediscover its, its, its rebellious spirit and gets closer to people with, um, uh, whose encounter with science today is mostly like someone with authority citing a paper, so, you know, Science doesn't have to always be only, you know, this thing, this distant authority that tells me that I'm wrong or that I don't know anything. Um, it doesn't have to be distant. So, in crypto or probably in IT in general, the frontier is is relatively close, right? So you, you know, you don't need to have. You can drop out of college and 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 influence society by, you know, starting Microsoft or Apple or Ethereum. Uniswap, right? Um, the frontier is very close. Um, but, you know, in biotech, for example, you need to, you know, at least get a PhD to have some basic level credentials. Um, perhaps a sign that the frontier is not that 
close and it's pretty far away and maybe when you get it, you arrive at the frontier, you, you realize that, that not much is going on. So I do hope that, that, that DSI could kind of help bring in um, more people into research, um, you know, find novel ways how to find research and for, you know, sort of PLEP to participate in the research. Um, so yeah, I would say that um, DSI culture, in my opinion, should be um, fostering disobedient yet civil uh, quest for infinite knowledge. Um, yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you so much for that one. We have our last speaker before we go off to lunch. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nicholas to the stage. Uh, Nicholas is a physician trained scientist, a founder of LabDAO, which is an online community of life scientists collaborating to increase the accessibility of life science tools, both in the dry and wet lab. Let's give a round of applause to Nicholas. Let's get the slide set up and we're good to go. Hello, everyone. Okay, show of hands. How many in this room are w would say that they would primarily work in Web3? All right, that's about a bit more than half. How many would say that they're primarily working in research? Okay, there are a couple. Okay. Where are all the scientists today? Like, where are all the researchers today? I think we're, we're still at this early stage in DSI where when we look at the audience, we have way more people that are interested in Web3 that come here and not enough scientists that come here. And I think the answer why that is the case uh, is, is visible when we look at our technology stack and the token stack that we've been working on. So when we look at DSI today, we basically have two different token primitives. Uh, we have governance tokens on the one hand side. You know, those are your Vita tokens, hair tokens, but also Vita Fast, so IPT tokens, tokens that are designed for communities to come together and govern something, a resource. Now, what is that resource? Oftentimes, they're some kind of legal token, like an IP NFT, a, f a, f a right to future intellectual property, a right to future commercialization rights. Oftentimes, the people that own the governance tokens, they come together, they fund the research to do, like, issue the legal agreements, negotiate with the universities. But the questions you can ask is, where does the science happen in this stack? Where is the researcher pipetting? Where is the data scientist generating a plot, identifying a new small molecule that has a desirable property? I think we need to close the loop to also give scientists a cultural product that they can produce in this, right? The people that are good at building communities, fostering communities, their product are governance tokens. They can meme a scientific area into existence. People that are really good at picking projects and negotiating terms, they have legal tokens. They, can, they have their primitive. But what's missing is a scientific record or just a record. You want to, as a scientist, you want to have your own cultural product. You want to drop your record. You want to analyze a new data set. You want to discover something new. You want to run an experiment, and you want the world to see that. And communities with governance tokens to form around that, people that are good at picking projects to come in and want to purchase it. So we need to complete this stack. We need to build tokens that are science, that represent research output. And that's what we built. So a year ago, we identified this gap where we said, okay, there are communities that fund science and there are token primitives that are interested in representing intellectual property rights, but there's this sort of middle gap of, you know, where's the science actually done here? And this is our answer. So records give the holder an exclusive ownership right over the scientific data, data ownership rights, and there's data analysis right built in. So everybody can go and play with the data that, that was contributed and everybody can reproduce how the data was, was created. There's a fully open source Python package that can work today, and you have the latest BioML tools at your fingertips, running on a distributed compute and storage network that you can also contribute to and not to distant future. It is a product built, a protocol built for the inpatient inventors like you. You can actually run it. If you had to try it at lap.xyz, you can run a Colab notebook where you're setting up, kicking off a job. How does it all work? 
So the stack that we're building up is at the top layer, we have a token. So this is similar to an IP NFT or a governance token like Vita. This NFT gives you permissions to distribute the work and ownership rights to the scientific data. And then, however, this token can do a bit more. It's not only pointing to data that's stored on IPFS or distributed to IPFS. You can actually run computation over this, over this data yourself. Now, why is this way better than the way that we currently store academic data is because there's not one server that we trust that the data is safe. You, we use a peer-to-peer -peer file storage system, IPFS, so every data has a unique identifier, it's immutable, it's robust. You have access to a community-maintained set of tools. It's like a hugging face for computational biology where you see small molecule docking tools, a variety of those, protein folding tools, and even more tools coming. We can go into those in just a moment. And then at the top layer, you have tokens. So tokens that represent the ownership and that when you look closer into them, they give you the full computational graph. So you see the source data that was used, the tool that was run, the function, and the output data that was contributed and is owned by the scientist that holds that token. The ownership license can be completely remixed. Right now, they have CBE exclusive licenses. So if you own that token, you own the rights to the data uh, fully exclusively, and if you sell it, you know, the person you sold it to owns all the rights to the data. Now, what's coming soon is we're going to bundle these things into the IP claim stack so you actually can go the whole loop. Now, what can records do? We're currently running a set of pilots. This is a company based out of California. We're designing protein binder candidates for oncology drug targets. This is in, in pets as a public pilot, but we're also having some, some really human cl clinical relevant pilots on here. This is another company, Fish and Pharma. We're developing um, LSTARC inhibitors of a drug target is associated inflammatory disease. Um, this is a small molecule drug uh, discovery project. So here, we use hardware accelerated docking algorithms to dock you know, 10 million or more small molecules within a week to actually get um, to allosteric binders here. And then this is actually an example from a DAO you know, VitaDAO. So we helped the Koralchuk project, um, and shout out to Tyler and Benji here at the Molecule team that helped with all of this. We, we helped the Koralchuk team uh, analyze their screen re results. So here we can see a lands landscape of different small molecules and, that were active, and we can see certain clusters here of molecules that have properties that are very desirable, and we can help identify different uh, chemical types and direct the future development of these therapeutics. And then, last but not least, we're also super happy to work with Protocol Labs, um, and this is a collaboration where we onboard the complete ESM atlas, so those are about 700 million proteins uh, that were sort of at the potential, at the risk of being taken offline completely as F Facebook shut down the AI research team. Now this data is on Filecoin, and a uh, huge shout out to Wings to help do all of that with us. Now, what can you do today? We launched about 30 days ago on Testnet. We have about 200 records that have been minted in the last couple of days. We have new t t tools coming out. So this is a protein binder. So if you have, for example, a drug target that is interesting to you, implied in aging, implied in hair loss, and you, you want to design a potential binder that can address that surface target, we have the tools to help you. You have a bunch of demos that you can run, and you can mint your own tokens. So head to docs.lab.xyz slash tutorials to give it a try. And also, just stick around for tomorrow. We have a workshop at 1045. Stop by, bring your laptop. Let's mint some tokens. Let's do some science together. Thank you. Your online community can do a lot. Let's do it. All right, now it's lunchtime. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Yeah, let's get a round of applause going. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, we will be having lunch downstairs where everyone first entered. Uh, and we'll kick things back off at 2 o'clock. So please come back here at 1.55. Thank you. See you soon. Yeah. <laughs> Life is coming back. Yeah, it depends on the time of the year. It's yeah. like when it's winter in Berlin, you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you're surprised, aren't you? Yeah, it depends more. Definitely. Nice to see each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey. Yeah. But never in person. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. Congratulations.
announcement uh, regarding BioXYZ. So we've actually picked uh, two DAOs that are gonna join the upcoming cohort of BioXYZ, that is Cerebrum DAO and Synapse DAO. And I was hoping uh, founders and members of that DAO could stand up and give us a nice little wave so we all know who they are. There we go in the back. Yes, round of applause, thank you so much. Uh, you'll be hearing from them at the end uh, during a moderated panel talk, so stick around to find out how they are helping to build the future of um, biomedicine, and I won't spoil what exactly it is they do. I'll let them announce that themselves. Up next, we're going to have Chris. Uh, Chris is a co-initiator co at SciDAO, and he has a wonderful talk about IP and psychedelics. Chris. All right, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone, yeah, for, for joining this talk after lunch. I'll try and keep it exciting. Um, yeah, so my name's Chris Burns. I'm an IP lawyer. I have the privilege of getting to work with most of the bio DAOs here. Um, I'm an IP advisor at Molecule and a part of the, an IP advisor for the bio XYZ cohorts of folks. Outside of my Web3 practice, I actually am pretty active as a lawyer in the psychedelic space, which is what makes SciDAO so exciting to me. Um, and really excited to talk today in particular about the vision that we have for SciDAO. We're gonna be launching the token this fall. Um, now that we've released the IPNFT and IPT protocol uh, through Molecule, there's a lot of design space here for all types of really cool forms of tokenized commoning and some means for doing um, open science that I'll explain and, and hopefully pique some interest with uh, some new models and, and maybe some new sort of means for using tokenization and these tokenization protocols in an interesting way. Um, so first for, you know, I'll, I'm gonna walk quickly through the psychedelics market. Um, for those who haven't been paying that much attention to the psychedelics market, it's a fascinating space. And as a market, it's very unique. And what that really means is there's a really interesting use case, I think, for decentralized science um, as, we, as we sort of you know, in integrate DSI into all, all things biotech markets or, or pharma markets. Um, I'll walk briefly through a, a little image of our side out vision, talk about our Lighthouse project, and then get into some of these tokenization schematics, um, one on an open science platform that we'll be launching, and then another on SciDAO Commons, which is something I'm especially excited about. So psychedelics really promise to massively disrupt the market. When we talk about the market here, we're oftentimes largely talking about mental health treatment, um, which just costs the economy, I mean, trillions of dollars a year. Across the, the Europe and the US, we're seeing uh, a sort of loosening of the regulatory frameworks that allow psychedelics to be going through what's considered to be a psychedelic renaissance, a new influx of funding and research um, really for the advent of psychedelic science and, and a better understanding of how psychedelics can really help to treat mental health problems that, um, that are either treatment-resistant depression, PTSD, um, things that are, are really kind of jamming up um, much of the economy. And so in 2022, we've seen $526 million of funding go into psychedelics. The estimated market size by 2026 for global treatment of, of mental health um, is around 240 billion. You know, so obviously massive market potential if we can really get some breakthroughs here. Um, Psychedelic Science was the largest conference this past year in Denver, over 10,000 attendees. That sort of was this huge hallmark in the psychedelic space for saying, okay, we, you know, we've made it, this is getting, this is getting serious. Um, so while this is largely happening in the US, it's, it's expanding through Europe as well. And much like we've seen with cannabis and kind of the path cannabis took, psychedelics seem to be sort of following this, this path of loosening up uh, decriminalization on a state-by-state -state basis, seeing where we can finally get with federal law or sort of national level law 
um, in the EU. But I think it's gonna be easier than cannabis as well because there's, there's just a lot more uh, really important use cases that I think, I think are a little easier for you know, the public to kind of swallow from a public health perspective. Um, oftentimes psychedelic assisted therapy is not, you know, it's not something you're doing every day. Um, these are more often, more oftentimes kind of one to three or, or a, a short set of treatments that you do with a psychotherapist. Um, so there's some really serious signs here, along with a lot of really fun culture, of course. Um, so on the IP side of things, which is where uh, Sidal really intends to, to kind of make its mark and make its splash, um, the psychedelic market is just full of controversy. I know this is a super noisy slide. Uh, it's just, it doesn't even catch all of the headlines that have been coming out from magazines, newspapers, journals um, over the past year, over the past couple of years. There's a huge concern around the monopolization of psychedelics um, and oftentimes the way in which IP is extracted from indigenous communities and people who've been stewarding this knowledge for decades, centuries, millennia in some instances, but if we just pick up from the academic research on psychedelics that was happening in the 50s and 60s, and which was criminalized in the early 70s, um, we, we see there also being a big concern over, well, how much, how much IP is actually out there to grab? And while there is certainly some, and, and I, you know, in my other sort of outside my Web3 practice as a patent lawyer, I'm oftentimes working closely with clients helping to draft some of those patents on occasion. Um, but what we see with this is, you know, typically when you apply for a patent, you get in front of a patent examiner, of course, they have, you know, maybe 10 hours or so to look at an average application at, in, in the first instance. And they're looking largely through what is called patent prior art, right? All these other patents that have come through the office historically. And yes, their research will also scrape into, you know, trying to dig up academic articles or other knowledge that's been published that's outside of patents, but they're a little less effective at doing so there. So in the psychedelic space, because of prohibition, we don't have you know four decades now of patent prior art, even though there has continued to be evolution of science, oftentimes in underground markets. Um, and similarly, the, the whole framework for intellectual property, we've had some great talks already today talking about its European roots. It's very Eurocentric in how knowledge is imagined to be produced. The lone inventor in the garage, this type of thing. These are rooted in epistemological assumptions around what knowledge production looks like, what we need to incentivize it. And these assumptions are, are not part of many indigenous people's communities and, and how they approach sacred knowledge and psychedelic medicine, um, plant medicine more generally. So we also have this big gap that's quite acute in the IP system with psychedelics that see a big rupture, a cultural rupture around what knowledge should be protected in the first place. Um, so existing issues, as I kind of touched on these, low quality patents and risk of patent trolls, these are issues that we've been hearing in the psychedelic space for years. Um, constantly a concern amongst the top researchers, be them in labs or startups. There's this high concern, oh great, we're gonna get a bunch of low quality patents. There's been some patents that have already issued that have some very kind of I don't know, specious claims around whether or not those are actually valid. Once a patent issues though, you're inside the IP economy, which is very expensive to navigate. Um, but with this, comes a concern over the risk of patent trolls. And just by show of hands, who here has heard of a patent troll or is familiar with patent trolls? Okay, most everyone, a really quick summary is patent trolls have largely plagued the big tech market to date, but they're in life sciences have been largely spared, but that's really changing. Digital therapeutics, anyone wanting to use AI or software um, inside biotech is, 
you know, the, the trolls are coming. I, I hate to say it. I, I worked for too long in the big tech market clearing patent troll risk to be able to say otherwise. And with this, a lot of psychedelics companies are concerned. What happens is entities buy up patents, oftentimes from other companies who are going bankrupt or just need to divest some assets, and they sell them to groups of people like me, you know, former patent litigators or patent litigators, you just need like four or five together, a little gaggle of problematic IP lawyers who take these things and then sue a whole market. Oh, wow, yeah, I don't know if this patent's valid, really. I don't know if, I don't think anyone actually infringes, but I'm gonna sue everyone. And because it costs at least half a million dollars to settle, north of a million dollars if you're actually gonna fight out a, a patent dispute, then the patent trolls come and are like, look, give me a break. Are you actually gonna spend all this money fighting this or for a hundred grand or for 80 grand? I'll give you a license right now, you'll never see me again. So oftentimes when that type of an offer makes its way up to a CFO and they're kind of looking at just the cost benefit of engaging in the dispute, patent trolls make out quite well. So this is one big concern. Also, as I mentioned, biopiracy from indigenous peoples, this just, inside psychedelic culture as well, this just doesn't sit right, you know, it's, it's terrible. I mean, in the, this started in the 80s, really. Um, I think it was University of Maryland who had gotten a patent on the ayahuasca vine, which has been <laughs> used forever. It, ultimately, the patent got canceled, but after you know, a bunch of lawyers made a bunch of money and it was very alienating for communities who've been using ayahuasca to all of a sudden see this thing patented and actually risk themselves being excluded from using it because of the wonders of the patent system. Um, there's also a lack of technology and incentive to efficiently administer an IP commons and this is true, there's been great, uh, George Contreras wrote this great piece about why the open COVID pledge, which was this kind of IP commons, an effort to have people say, let's, what better crisis do we need to sort of collectively solve than COVID when the you know, whole global economy was shut down, and yet it, kind of, you know, it, it largely did fail. Pharma companies weren't participating, it was big tech largely participating for all types of its own interests and with this a lot of the um, psychedelic companies have been following this and they've been saying tactogen maps a few of these other big ones if you're familiar with these players are, and paul stamets has expressed some interest in ip commenting saying we want this we want something where we can use our IP in a different way. We just feel like we don't have alternatives. And then when we do see the alternatives, we feel like we're losing control over our IP. And that's a huge other problem that gets scary, right? It's risky to participate in a new exercise if all of a sudden you're losing control of what may be your most valuable asset. Along with this, there's a concern around a misalignment of community commercial interests and investor commercial interests. I mean, investors, of course, just want profit maximization inside the psychedelic space. That typically means running over the people who've been stewarding this knowledge, people who kind of operate outside the mainstream of capitalism in a lot of ways. Um, and so thinking about how can we build meaningful reciprocity initiatives with indigenous peoples, something that goes beyond your typical corporate social responsibility pledges, which have largely been kind of panned in this space as well as just being greenwashing or things where people make these good pledges and then when push come to shove, they don't do anything about it. They get brand value, but it, all of a sudden they're on the ropes needing to make money and they're not gonna do it. It's expensive, right? At, to actually bear the costs of participating in a more ethical IP community, it, it, it's expensive. It, there's added costs there. And then on top of this, the IP justice system is cost prohibitive. Along the lines of what I described with patent trolls, it's no different when it's an operating company on operating company dispute. Just by show of hands, how many people here have been party to a patent litigation? One, two, yeah, only a couple. Um, and I obviously won't want to jump into it too much, but the, the, the short story is it's extremely expensive. And most people who end up in them, be them asserting or defending, 
just come to realize like I either want out of this problem altogether, in which case they buy IP risk management products, and these have really been booming over the past 15 years, or they just decide I want in on this racket, and how can I get my IP over to a troll or an enforcement entity so I can get a little cut. Um, so what's Sidow's vision? So we've been hearing all of this, what does the market need, and we want to become the kind of interconnective tissue, the mycelial network for those who are especially interested in fungus, which is popular, of course, in psychedelics with psychedelic mushrooms, um, where we can take intellectual property that exists among the community and begin to network it and actually have intellectual property become this vehicle for interconnecting a whole ecosystem that ideally, if we do it right, can solve for these existing issues I was just describing. Mycelial networks are be even sort of beyond an analogy here. They're important because they operate under principles of mutual aid, um, of kind of local expertise, a mushroom, a fruiting body, a mushroom inside the forest has its little local ecology. And then that thing through a mycelial network is connected like a mile away to a tree and another mushroom. And these things exchange intelligence, exchange resources, all to help build a symbiotic, more healthy ecosystem. And that seems to be hitting the nail on the head for what we've been hearing from the psychedelic companies and, and kind of what they really want. Um, and so with this, using our IP tokenization protocols, we want IP NFTs, of course we know what these are. This is kind of the core hard IP that, that this type of a network would be built around. IPTs to co-govern and manage the development of little nodes of, of IP spores as they germinate, if you will, Haifa, networked into Hi-Fi. And then the mycelial network, which really becomes a network of all of this. And, and across token governance as well, we want Psy to be governing the, the broad meta network resources, the, mycel the mycelium, so to speak. IPTs, of course, governing those who have a, a direct and clearer interest and, and kind of buy-in to the development of specific IP, and then IP NFTs as means for people to participate. And what do these solutions ultimately provide. Well, I'll show you in a minute how we're scheming out ways to do permissionless participation in this network, obviously something really important to Web3 culture, a platform for open science, superior IP validation. As I mentioned, low quality patents are a real problem and just as some basic stats for all patents, 50% of them that get litigated through on the merits are then found invalid. So anytime you want to assert a patent, you're also kind of rolling the dice. Uh-oh, if I assert this against someone with a lot of money, they might invalidate the whole thing. Um, freedom to operate, these ideas of saying, look, we want to preserve a commercial market, but we don't want to be jammed up just doing our R&D. This is really, again, what decentralized science is about. Cost-effective IP mediation and conflict transformation. This allows us to create an alternative platform to resolve disputes if we're gonna say, well, the IP justice system as it exists is a problem. And then, of course, just community co-governance. And something really cool happened um, as we've been getting our initial Lighthouse project off the ground. We, were, we, we had an LOI, we have an LOI with Robin Carhart Harris who is one of the biggest names, one of the most prominent psychedelics researchers out there. Um, he's largely responsible for kicking off the psychedelic renaissance when he was at Imperial College of London and doing one of the first surveys that actually administered psilocybin in a clinical setting since the prohibitionist era. And since then, I mean, you know, you're trying, psychedelic science, for instance, he's talking, it's overflow room with, you know, I mean, close to a thousand people wanting to hear him speak. We've been excited to have his interest and something cool here happened, where at first we were thinking, all right, we're gonna do our kind of typical model. We're gonna fund an MDMA-related research where he's gonna do fMRI imaging. He was excited, great, you know, give me a few hundred grand to get this underway, it, was, it is a cool project. And then we got to talking with him a bit more about these solutions that we actually wanna bake into Sidow 
by really creating this tokenized IP network, by supporting new platforms for tokenized open science. And Robin stopped and said, you know what? We can do this MDMA project down the road, but this is huge. This is solving for all these issues that I was describing have been out there, at least now validated now by Robin rather than Chris Burns, the IP lawyer. Um, and he said, look, I want, I want to help support this. I want to help support this, and I want to do it with a couple of people I've been working with closely, you know, one of whom is a really big name, Unlimited Science, uh, Unlimited Sciences. They've de they designed the large data survey that Johns Hopkins used for an initial study, best in class kind of uh, scientific survey design. Balaj Shigeti, who's been a very active part of early SciDAO work, and who also has been recognized as one of the leading, he's, he recently he finished his PhD, um, was at Imperial, he's on his way to UCSF, uh, and he wrote this amazing paper, very well received, on a self-blinded microdose study that really caught some attention and that has helped position him as one of the leading thought leaders, a, a young researcher, leading thought leader on open science, and then Hannes Kettner, who's also part of Robin's lab um, and has worked closely with, with Matt at, at Unlimited Sciences and, and Balaj. So we have this team of folks with just amazing pedigree wanting to build something new and really wanting SciDAO to be the platform for this. And, and so we're in the process of creating a new LOI where, where we'll be launching this. So how does this work? You know, what would tokenized open science actually look like? And I see I'm about out of time. Um, one minute, can I just wrap up? Okay, so I'll get, I'll get through this. So what we're doing here and where we're innovating a lot with SciDAO is taking IP NFTs and putting different things in them than what a sponsor research agreement might be. And these protocols that we've built, Jesse and I and, and some of the legal folks at Molecule, are really legal primitives that can be, they're very flexible and I really hope people who are interested in this come chat with me. Um, but what you can do with a survey is put a psychedelic science survey, minted it in, into an IP NFT, have that include your terms and conditions of the study, tokenize that so survey participants are legally accepting the terms and condition of a study, incentivize them with psi, those who've done large-scale surveys in citizen science probably know 80% of your initial participants drop off. Using tokenization to incentivize completion through the end unlocks things. And then all of a sudden we allow the DAO to be co-governing the IP that's created out of citizen science and, and different research projects. Let me wrap up. I have went too slow. Um, apologies. But we're doing really awesome stuff, and please uh, come chat with me some more if you want to learn about new ways to use tokenized IP. Thank you for the psychedelic talk, Chris. Appreciate it, especially after lunch. Uh, now we're going to have an interesting panel discussion uh, moderated by Zen Shu. Uh, for those who don't know, Zen is an entrepreneur and MIT faculty member focused on pioneering early stage medicinal technology and healthcare startups. He also directs the MIT Healthcare Ventures course and serves as a faculty advisor for Hacking Medicine at MIT. All right. We're going to bring up our own chairs. Hey, we're going we're gonna to bring some chairs. Uh, please, in the back, come on up. We're going to make this a very interactive session. Uh, lots of questions about uh, this moment in investing um, and, uh, and this moment in investing in DSI specifically. Uh, I love the earlier talk, Chris. I I'm an investor in, in four psychedelic companies, um, and it is the most exciting time for that. Come on up. Come on up. You can throw tomatoes at the VCs. All right. Okay. All right, so we have a fantastic investor panel, all right, from across, uh, hey, heads up. We're going to start now, thank you. Um, we got a fantastic panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, um, but we're going to keep it fairly short uh, and interactive so that we can answer more questions from you all. Um, you know, I'm an investor and an entrepreneur, and uh, uh, thanks to Chris, 
uh, from his MIT days, I was pulled into Molecule as, uh, as one of the early investors. So that's why I'm here. I get to learn from all of you and see what's brewing, and I can't wait to hear uh, from the panel. And Frederica, please take it away. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Frederica Ernst. I am one of the founders of Gnosis. We have built lots of um, Ethereum infrastructure over the years, such as the Gnosis Safe, Gnosis Chain, CowSwap, and so on. In my previous life, I was an academic scientist, so um, I was a physicist, so I know all about uh, the pains of academia, and this is also what drew me to this uh, DSI, uh, to this DSI arena. And maybe, uh, m maybe each of you can kind of tell us what you're hearing and, and what, what you're thinking, uh, what you're excited about within DSI. What have you invested in, or what are you looking at? So I'm, I'm super excited about um, projects that um, promise to eliminate inefficiencies that we kind of see in academic science. So kind of things like publishing is broken, um, kind of uh, academic, basically uh, getting tenure. It's, it's also a somewhat broken process. Um, then uh, kind of the way that uh, uh, the, the way that um, data sets are often not published and so on. So I think there's lots of things. So in principle, academic researchers, they're not in it for the money, right? So they are principled and they are really well-intentioned. And I feel like the structure in which they operate, um, it, it often doesn't align with what is actually in humanity's best interest. And I see tremendous potential for DSI to kind of correct that to a certain extent. Absolutely. At, at MIT, we have a, a favorite saying, which is impact equals invention times commercialization. Here in DSI, we've got both of those, right? And you need both of those, but with a priority on commercializing, on getting real solutions uh, in, in, into, the, uh, into the ecosystem. James, you're up. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I'm James Brody. I'm a geneticist by training. I spent 10 years in drug development uh, after university. It was very interesting. About halfway through that journey, I found Bitcoin. And um, I kind of left all of pharma to, to actually, my dream was to do social medicine development. Um, the, the tech stack wasn't ready back then in about 20, uh, late 2017. So I set up a fund. I run a fund called ID Theory. It's a crypto asset fund. Um, but we do invest a lot in, in DSI, in DAOs, and some other things. I think, um, oh, and one other thing, I'm also on the board at Molecule, so I was, I was privileged to, um, you know, invest pre-seed in, in Paul and the team. So it's been a real journey watching this all come about. Um, to your, your point, I think my, my broad takeaway from, from drug development, and I was running a discovery program, was... Uh, the, the patient advo advocacy groups have this huge kind of amount of power, um, probably the most powerful groups in pharma, more powerful than regulators, more powerful than the pharma companies. And I always saw these groups as proto-DAOs, very well capitalized, highly knowledgeable, often more knowledgeable than the physicians treating themselves and their children. And uh, <clears throat> they just, they lacked a kind of coordination framework. So blockchains come along and, it, and it's perfect. And I'm, I'm really excited about you know, these patient av advocacy groups kind of turning themselves into bio DAOs and pushing forward the development of medicines that can really kind of uh, make real impact. Not I'm, I'm glad you mentioned you know, rare disease and patient communities. I mean, they have the highest moral authority, right? That's why I invested in Molecule. It's not for anything that we've seen so far. It's for the parents who have kids with rare disease, these small communities that just want to accelerate a cure. And there is no, no, no substitute for that kind of energy and passion. And it's an inevitability for those things to be popping up on, uh, on, on multiple of the DAOs. Um, and I'm excited to watch for it. Uh, Elad. Hey, uh, whoa. Um, so I'm Elad originally Israeli, as you can hear from the accent, uh, based in Zagreb. I uh, founded, I'm originally a computer scientist in my previous life, but I uh, moved uh, to, through machine learning career to investing. I founded Lunar Ventures, which is uh, actually, so we think that the problem with the startup, the biggest difficulty of the startup scene and innovation are the investors. 
Maybe raise your hand if you think investors are the biggest hurdle and problem. <laughs> One of the biggest. So we really believe investors are really underserving uh, startups and projects, and we're trying to do a little bit better every day to, to fix that. So we uh, realized that you need scientists and engineers and technical people to invest in science and engineering. So we started Lunar Ventures, which is a pre-seed and seed uh, fund, investing in computer science and other sciences built by scientists and engineers, for scientists and engineers, and I hope that there's like 50 more funds like this that get started, and uh, in Europe especially, where the problem is the largest and put us out of business. So. Um, that's Luna. We were also early, uh, the, you know, the, led the early round of, um, of Molecule. And uh, we are particularly excited. We're not actually very big on decentralized, um, uh, on decentralized investment because of stupid, you know, our investors also need to do better but, uh, because of all kinds of restrictions. But we invest a lot in tooling, actually. We think that a lot of the problem of DAO governance, investment DAOs, and so on, is that the tooling, the decision-making tooling is not good enough. And I, I'm not talking about the voting, on-chain voting and stuff like this, which also is very important. I'm talking about literal productivity tooling. So we've made one investment in the space called Samudai, and uh, we hope to do uh, a lot more. And I think uh, focusing on tooling is going to make the whole space much more efficient. Picks and shovels. Last but not least, my good friend Chris Leiter, uh, who, who uh, brought me and Bob Nelson into, uh, into uh, for those of you that don't know, Bob Nelson is the founder of uh, the largest biotech venture fund in the world. Uh, he just seeded about a year ago $2 billion into a longevity startup uh, Altos. called Altos Labs, um, one of the biggest thinkers, and he followed us into, into Molecule with, uh, with, with five words. Uh, that's cool. I'm that. in. Yeah. I remember that. I remember that. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks for moderating. Uh, I'm Chris Leiter. I'm the founder and general partner at Atria Ventures. We're a San Francisco based uh, venture fund investing at pre seed and seed with exceptional founders building at the nexus of technology and biology. So if you're building, I'd love to talk to you. Um, a couple of different things that I like about you know, what I'm seeing here. First is, oh, also founding member of BeakerDAO. With, with my good friend James. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing at Beaker Dell, uh, please come see James or I and a few other people around here. Um, so I think the one or two things that, that get me really excited, I think you know, in the farm and life sciences space, open source has been from the very beginning. If you think if you're a computational biologist or a scientist, most of the software, most of the tooling is open source you've, you've been using for the last couple of years. So how do we kind of continue that tradition inside DSI? And, People like Nicholas at LabDAO building some infrastructure for that's really interesting. So how do, how do we con continue that? The second thing that I get really excited about, and Mike Barron is probably somewhere here in the room from Pfizer Ventures and his talk is later. Um, how do we think about um, red pilling pharma more about decentralized science, right? Because we, we, we do have to think about commercialization as Zen said, and how do we bring and mature these assets and these DAOs into really truly decentralized drug development, manufacturing, distribution, commercialization, and as Zen said, bring them to the key patient communities that need, uh, need us and need, need this community and this decentralized ecosystem to exist. So that is a long way of saying like, you know, how do we, how do we get more pharma uh, and biotechs involved in what we're doing? Yeah, yeah. Um, what I like to say in our, in our healthcare ventures classes is, Early stage venture is all about data, right? It's, it's generating cheap, fast data that is directionally correct so that you can make further bets. And so when you're looking at early stage, you know, um, new DAOs or new, uh, new groups that are passionate about doing something, what kinds of data are you looking for? How are you thinking about, you know, clinical trials, risk and timelines and things like that? Any, uh, any sense of that? No, no, not everyone should, uh, should feel obligated to answer. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think there's a, a very similar way how I evaluate decentralized science, um, DAOs or assets, to how I evaluate, you know, I don't think there's any difference of me evaluating a Web2 startup versus a Web3 startup, which is in, in, in what I look at and what we look at at Atria Ventures is very much a, a path to commercialization. Like the technology has to have a partnering, licensing, or partnership uh, ability with a larger scale player um, down the road. So what does that mean in decentralized science? Um, what are the assets that are being, uh, you know, in licensed or organically uh, driven by the DAO? 
um, are those matching or are they in disease areas that have a patient population that is somewhat large? Now, there's exceptions to rare disease and I'll come back to that. Um, and do we then have uh, the right partners or the right capabilities that we can have in the Dow or down the road in the Dow to make sure that those assets as they develop are also being aware of other investors, other pharma that can ultimately um, you know, bring these assets and IP to trials, to commercialization. Because I think the one big thing that we, we really need to just level set here is like, you know, th right now we do not have any assets, you know, in the very big phase three clinical trials. These are incredibly expensive. And so the amount of capital that we need to attract into this ecosystem is at least 50X of what we are today. Um, now, I think everyone around this panel knows that that capital exists. And it is part of our job here to make sure that we're enabling that to happen. So just to kind of summarize, how do the, the DAOs, how do they think about the commercialization? How do they think about the partnering? How do they think about, you know, the disease areas that they're attacking is something I, I look at. James. Yeah, one of the areas I'd like to see more data, well, there's no data really in any of these bio DAOs, is, uh, is human data. I think, you know, if you're talking about potential out licensing, and pharma partners, they're going to be very interested in human data. Uh, I always remember my old chairman used to tell me I, I was running preclinical programs, and uh, he, he said to me, none of, none of that stuff actually really matters. Uh, we just need to get this into humans. Now, we were developing medicines from cannabis at the time, and we had all of this empirical evidence you know, that cannabis was very safe. And I think the, the hurdle to get into humans was probably a bit lower. Uh, than it is for like you know new new chemical entities. However, there are many clinicians out there and physicians who are mavericks who have patient populations that are not being well well served by current uh, standard of care, who I, I think would be really open to engaging with DAOs. And you know, um, Chris has, has talked about kind of phase phase three data. Obviously, that's really important, right, to get approval of your medicine, but. I, I think equally important is uh, uncontrolled, you know, just data in humans to show that you've actually got something. And just back to the point about my chairman, he's, he said, if we give these compounds to a physician, they will know within six patients if they have a medicine. And, you know, that is a signal which you can then go on to develop. We all hear about the translational gap of, you know, moving from animals into patients. It's a very real thing. I think DSI is positioned perfectly to bridge that gap. But I, I would really like to see some DAOs working on networks with physicians, engaging them, and, you know, not because you can't do this, right, incentivizing them to, to start trials, but at least having them get comfortable that they can form relationships with these DAOs and initiate investigator-initiated trials. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, I, th I think the, the advantage of DAOs is it takes away the overhead of starting a company and getting a team and fundraising when really you want to just jump to let's look at the data, let's do the experiment, what are the right experiments, who can do them. And so you, uh, you postpone and punt on all that stuff about company formation which is totally artificial and a huge distraction for an investigator rather than just focus on does it have promise, what's the early signal. Uh, let's have uh, folks stand up and start assembling over here, and, and we'll get through as many questions as, uh, as possible. Um, questions? 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 No questions. Really? Come yes, on, there please. we go. Come on up, and come on down if you have questions. Yeah, if you would launch a DAO in the disease area, area which one would you pick? I know what you say, but maybe someone else. <laughs> Okay, obesity, Ozempic, whatever, something like that. I mean, it's insane right now. Um, you know, Novo Nordisk is now more, exp you know, worth more than the GDP of Denmark, uh, where they're based. Um, but there is a huge patient need and access, ac patient market access point with that, which uh, I have a few ideas around on, on, on how the DAO could solve some of that. So yeah, but please. Thank you. All right, next question. And I'm taking, I'm taking. Uh, rare disease and we're just let's create a rare DAO, right let's just create a rare, rare DAO. yeah hi there uh, i think that one of the most 
challenging parts of dealing with science and DAOs pretty much is the barrier and the friction between people that has tech knowledge and people that doesn't. So how you guys see in the future the relation between DAOs, digital assets, and everything related to that with like the common population? Oh, that's one I'd love to answer. So I think this is one of the tasks that we currently ha have as Web3 builders, kind of making things that are easy to use for regular people, okay? So basically, um, partaking in the DAO shouldn't be harder than kind of joining a Facebook group or similar. And I think kind of that's something that we can achieve and we're well on the way of achieving with um, things like account abstraction, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, abstracting away gas and so on. So I think we're well on the way of that. But yeah, absolutely, currently, uh, the technological barrier of joining a DAO and participating in a DAO is really large, as you can also see um, in voter turnout and kind of voter fatigue and, in, and so on. So yeah, absolutely, 100% with you. Uh, so yes, we'll build the tools. Chris. I, I just want to add one uh, other element. Not only joining, but like if you're an early stage DAO setting up in, in, the, in, the, in the DCI space, maybe a lot of them are, a lot of folks are either patients or, uh, or, or deep technical talent. Um, bringing in a maybe fairly well known or, or just a PI, a, a principal investigator or a researcher in that disease area from the very, very beginning can go a long, long way to getting that community going. And also, by the way, gives us as investors a little bit more confidence in terms of putting money behind it. And they can be the first funded. And first funded. And, they can, and, and by the way, that will also be deal flow coming from the PI, their labs, or their connections, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's very important for these DAOs to have a, you know, a credible kind of uh, core, core researcher. It gives credibility to the DAO. I think, you know, to, to your point, not on the... Um, uh, like usability of these things, but really AI is going to level the playing field in terms of like knowledge and dissemination of that knowledge. And uh, what I love about this movement is actually you don't need a PhD to go in and make like a meaningful difference in, in one of these DAOs. They're meritocracies. You just need to be a hard worker and you need to, you know, be highly motivated and you need to be like a doer. You don't, you need, you need to, you need to be, um, ready to, to make choices and not be instructed or marshaled around by other people. Uh, can I answer the previous question, actually? Yeah. So, so a DAO that I haven't seen proposed and I think would be really amazing is um, uh, that for undiagnosed psychiatric conditions, so I'm thinking ADHD, autism spectrum, and so on. There's like, I'm seeing a lot of ADHD software, for example, pro you know, productivity software, let's not call it, for, for uh, helping people cope with ADHD. I'm sure there's a parallel thing to autism. You don't have to have only psychiatry, only drugs. And a lot of these solutions are very helpful, but they need, and there's like lots of people who are underdiagnosed, self-diagnosed, and so on, who I think would benefit a lot from both using products developed for such DAOs and so on. I, I haven't seen this, but it's kind of shocking to me that no one is, no one is going at it. Talk to me if you want to. I would co-found that with you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, panel. Uh, my question is, can DAOs and pseudo-anonymous participation encourage more cutting edge research without staining the real life reputation of the participants? That's a tough question. How, what do you mean staining? Like without impacting uh, the person reputation. So uh, we look a lot at privacy tech, cryptography, zero knowledge proofs, decentralized identity and so on. And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I, I think also you can control for a lot of the risks associated with, well, we don't know who the person is by having some sort of soft uh, verification um, or authentication and so on uh, systems that already exist in, in context of zero knowledge based KYC systems and so on. There's a lot of uh, effort inside of the Web3 KYC space that is kind of would, I think would be easy to adapt to solve problems like this. And, and that's a really great idea actually. Uh, going back to the technological limitations question for onboarding qualified uh, researchers to specific DAOs, I was wondering, uh, mainly for the investors here, the projects that you guys are investing in, um, obviously they need to build an audience of uh, a, a group of contributors, better to say, 
of people that actually can make the DAO work as it should work. What are some recommendations that you give to uh, the projects that you invest in to build this core uh, group of researchers outside of potentially uh, first reaching out to them one-on-one -on -one and kind of scaling this into having more people on, on board to the DAO that are actually qualified and not just degens trying to trade tokens? And uh, m make your answers, please, concise, because I think we're going to end pretty soon, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, these DAOs need to have a, a flow of uh, potential IP NFTs. So I think, you know, business development, going and talking to tech transfer offices, uh, raising awareness that there is capital within these entities, they're ready, ready to sponsor work done, uh, I, I think is probably the most important thing. Get, getting the researchers aligned, know that they can have access to capital and therefore they can generate research for the DAO. I was also wondering something very similar to what the guy in the show said uh, about uh, psychiatric disorders. In general, psychology, I was thinking, is a big part of like, things like obesity because you cannot only find a medicine, it also has something to do with your behavior and you have to actually just like, change the way that you eat. And here, I was wondering from this perspective, like, if you have an IP NFT, it's like, difficult to uh, maybe see straightforward what would be the uh, IP here in this psychological space, but the good thing is you can actually verify very quickly and you can probably get therapy with humans more easily done than, uh, like I have not heard of animal testing cases for that. <laughs> I don't know. So what would you do, like, yeah, basically the question is like, do you think that a psychology DAO would be viable and how would that IP look like and uh, would you invest in something like that? I think the IP here is a data set, human data set. You can incentivize people every day to uh, fill out questionnaires or whatever, and you can build that data set within the DAO, and that has immense value. And uh, we just had the president of Stanford have to step down on reproducibility issues with yeah. uh, some of this stuff, right? But uh, psychiatry and psychology suffer from the same uh, crap and noise. Yeah, I'll just add one, this is a super important point to what James said earlier about how can we do uncontrolled studies. Psychology doing, what, what's, this, what's the global standard in pharma? Well, double blind phase three clinical trials, right? In psychology, it's very, very challenging to do that for a number of different reasons, especially from you know, Chris's presentation on, on side down psychedelics, that's gonna be a really big challenge. So could a DAO be formed around a psychological disease or could a DAO be formed around producing really good human data around a range of psychological diseases instead of like one, that might be an interesting play because it's so hard to run trials or, or at least get some uncontrolled human data in the space. Yeah, th these conditions, these psychological conditions, they're not due to some single, I mean some are some genetic stuff, but they're really uh, complex chronic diseases. They probably have very similar underlying causes, but they present differently in every single different person. So we need this data set to really understand how to treat these things. We need to know what non-pharmacological interventions can do for these people, behavioral treatments. Um, yeah. I forgot what I was gonna say, I had another point, but. Well, and that I'll, leads what, us to our last wait, wait, question. Wait, two, two seconds, so two, two companies to take a look at here, which I invested in both actually, called Holmusk, H-O-L-M-U-S-K, another company called Osmind, O-S-M-I-N-D. These are two, like, Web2 normal companies, but they're trying to find the longitudinal, build a longitudinal data set inside the neuropsych space. Um, the last thing I'll say on this is this is a massive investment space from Big Pharma is going into neuropsych, so, um, you know, that, that from an investor point of view is really interesting. Sorry. We're, we're one minute over, but I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative because we started we five started minutes late. late. So one last question. Who gets the last question? Who, who, who didn't? Okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm seeing that most of this side is focused around biotech, health, medical. What are other branches of science or places where we could make the most difference? Uh, I think we're going to hear from uh, Moon Dow a bit later or tomorrow, right? Yeah, so space uh, would be very interesting. Um, Com computational chemistry, please. New materials and computational chemistry is like the unsung hero of the next five to ten years, I think. Um, together with going to space and together with like, uh, like there's going to be a huge evolution that's similar to what we saw with computational biology or tech bio and so on. So absolutely that. AI. 
And then just my, my last point to the previous thing. I think these DAOs need to engage with regulators as early as possible, right? To understand what types of data set they're going to be comfortable with to do new types of, of studies in the future. All right. All right. Thank you all for the interest, and uh, we'll be at the back of the room. Please thank the panel. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much to our panel. I know I learned a lot about how these investors are thinking about the current state of the art in DSI, DAOs that they'd want to invest in. And so if you are a builder and you're interested in talking to someone who could write a check, make sure you reach out to our astute panel. All right. Up next, we're going to have the co-founders of HairDAO, Andrew Baxt and Andrew Verbenen. They're going to come up and talk about the hairy network states, how a group of DSI DGENs can solve the world's most pervasive disease. While their names might be the same, they are two very different people, but they are unified, not just in their name, in their desire to solve hair loss as a space. And we're going to get to hear all about their strategy and how they're using uh, DAOs and tokenomics to achieve results that traditional biopharma has not been able to. Nice. All right, give it up for Andrew and Andrew. Yeah. Cool. This thing on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, so we're the Andrews. Um, we're the co-founders of HairDAO. Um, yeah, just getting into it. So in high school, I was actually called Patches by Andrew, among other people. I've kind of always had thin hair, probably slowly losing it since I was 16. Um, People bald at different rates, so I'm 27 now. If I grow along, I can kind of cover it up. But uh, yeah, it really sucks. Like people really make fun of you. Um, but at the same time, like far from being alone, uh, like over two billion people today have hair loss right now. Um, over four billion people that are alive today will have hair loss at some point in their lifetimes, um, which is yeah, kind of cool. So me and Andrew went to high school together, and uh, he was also balding kind of early on. <laughs> But yeah, uh, no one in the traditional world like, was here to help us. Um, and that's like the unfortunate part about being a hair loss patient uh, that you find out pretty quickly, is that really no one's doing anything about it. Uh, there are two FDA approved drugs, uh, Rogaine or Minoxidil and then Finasteride. Um, but like Finasteride has terrible side effects if, that you would have to put up with. And Rogaine only works for like 20% of people. Um, so yeah, really like the two options that exist are basically not even options. But um, in spite of like, the lack of progress by traditional science, uh, there's been this huge bottom-up movement uh, that I think Maddie from Z Prime talked a lot uh, really well about earlier. Um, basically that uh, people on the internet have come together and said, well, if uh, traditional farmers are going to do anything, then we're going to have to do it ourselves. Yeah, so I think what's really been sort of possible to happen because this space really is just so empty um, is that I think it's really fertile grounds for us to build the new system, build it up better, because there's not actually as much existing infrastructure and hair loss that we need to tear down first. 
So I think what our main goal is with a lot of the things we're doing, there's just so many middlemen throughout the whole sort of early stage R&D space, particularly when it's done with universities. So you have universities at the NIH, uh, sorry, you have bureaucrats at the NIH and you have bureaucrats at the universities and they really just slow down uh, the rate of innovation a lot. You know, they obviously have a purpose, but they're, they're probably sort of overcorrected in that regard. And so much of what we're building, what we're doing is actually to sort of decrease all these barriers between ultimately the researcher and the patient. And our sort of thought process is if, is if we can get the researchers and patients working as closely together, in some cases where the researchers actually are also the patients, that'll actually yield the best outcomes and it'll actually, you know, get out of sort of tinkering in a lab to, to real innovation that benefits everybody who suffers from hair loss. So to start, we, we have sort of what we refer to as our FDA. I think what's so cool about hair loss is you have this really big biohacker community that's emerged. Um, largely because it's, it's way less risky to test, you know, a topical cream on your head for hair loss than it might be for some, you know, sort of other indication. And I think what that really allows us to tap into is, you know, actually we have data um, on whether a certain treatment is going to work or not work before ever putting it through clinical trials. And so in that way, we're actually able to de-risk a lot of the work we're doing and we're able to leverage this existing data set that uh, traditional science would really just ignore. Now, as sort of an extension of this, and I know uh, Paul talked about it a bit earlier, but I, I think it's pretty cool and, you know, it's pretty awesome, worth, worth talking about further. Uh, the very first uh, study that we ran was with Ralph Paus at the, you know, at his private research lab, uh, Cutanean, actually here in Germany. Um, and what we found in our study where we tested topical T3, T4 thyroid hormones on human scalp skin organ cultures was that we actually prolonged the antigen uh, phase of the hair follicle, which is like the growth phase. Um, so that's really positive data, uh, and it leads us to believe that we could have a treatment on our hands that is just as good, if not better, than minoxidil. That said, uh, you know, preclinical in vitro work, uh, nothing is as good as in vivo. And so Bax and I were actually in North Carolina the other day because uh, we were meeting with our compounding pharmacist, and we are going to be running an observational study with a hair transplant clinic in Miami within the next month. Uh, we're confident, and this is like the first time in DSI uh, that, a, that a real product uh, is actually making its way into the real world uh, to patients. And as a sign of confidence, Bax and I will both be rubbing it on our own scalps, so we, we wouldn't uh, preach what we didn't do. Um, and so yeah, we, we should have good actual in vivo data on whether or not this treatment works, what the side effect profile is like. Uh, within the next six months. And we're able to do that because T4 is widely prescribed orally to treat an underactive thyroid hormone. So there's a lot of safety data out there and it can be prescribed off-label. Now, in terms of our NI, in, you know, our NIH or our version of it, uh, it, quite frankly, there's about, you know, there's about $5 million worth of uh, money spent globally on early stage R&D to treat androgenetic alopecia. That's done by, you know, researchers, quite frankly, whose specialty might be something like arthritis. So the capital is just allocated terribly. Um, and what, you know, the opportunity, we, we just completed, we were lucky enough to complete our $3.3 .3 million fundraise. Um, and so what we're able to do with that, you know, nearly doubling the, the sort of global early stage R&D spend on hair loss. Uh, so what we're able to do with that is actually have people who are patients, who know what they would want to see on the market, and also who are dedicated in spending their full time actually researching hair loss, allocating that capital. On top of that, we have haircuts, which is uh, we're trying to disintermediate the journals um, because quite frankly, I think that the research being done in our Discord server, if you can organize it and format it, is actually uh, more innovative than a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in sort of the more traditional journals like Nature. Um, uh, so, so why sort of paywall that? Now to do all this, obviously community is required and uh, we've just been blown away by not just the, you know, amount of people coming in to our server. I, I think, you know, I've seen other servers, quite frankly, with, we always talk about like, you know, you're either serve, you know, feeding people candy or serving them spinach. And I think we're serving people spinach, but what we've found is they come into our Discord server and their engagement is off the charts. Um, I think we extrapolate the messages that we're doing and we could be doing a million messages per year. 
Um, and so I think that just shows the people that we have in this community are diehards. They're grinding to solve hair loss because nobody else will uh, every single day. And that brings me to the next slide, which is, uh, you know, kind of interesting because they're this and shout out to Z Prime because I, I love this this chart they made. Um, but it is interesting because we do definitely have almost this dichotomy of community. We have people who really care about hair loss and then we have sort of the crypto people. Um, and right now the overlap of people who do both, both hair loss research or care about hair loss and also care about crypto uh, is incredibly small. So what Bax is gonna talk about next uh, is how we continue to make that sort of middle circle, if you will, bigger. Um, and I, I think just worth touching on is, is there's a lot of sort of circular flows of capital in crypto. Uh, and the way, if you actually really want to uh, grow crypto globally, what you need to do is pull people who otherwise wouldn't care about crypto in by doing things like this, which is, I care about hair loss, I don't care about crypto, but if you're gonna sell me uh, a new treatment using crypto, then I'm gonna get involved in crypto. 100%, so like, we're always thinking about community growth, uh, like how do we keep growing the community? People always talk about crypto and AI, crypto and AI. Uh, but I think what's important to know is they're just tools, like they're not the product, at least for us. So we have the hair token, hair GPT, patient portal, like what James was talking about to collect patient data, computation biology, we do all those things, but those are not the product for us, those are just tools. Um, again, like always just trying to grow the community. But what should be really cool is we're actually turning uh, hair loss research into a video game. So completely gamifying the process where uh, trying to create something like as addicting as Instagram or Twitter, um, what we're seeing with our core members, but for everybody. Um, but instead of not getting paid, like on Instagram, you get paid uh, in hair tokens. Well, at first in HP, which will then convert into hair tokens. Um, and instead of just posting pictures, you'll be solving a disease, which is kind of cool. I'll just comment. I think what's super cool is that the hair points are actually determined by your peers. It's not like a top-down yeah. thing. It's, it's the community determines who's getting the points. It's like a knowledge graph. Um, Elliot from MTX is hopefully somewhere in the audience uh, helping us build that. Yeah, so we have V1 up, which was the preview you just saw. We have V2 coming up soon. Um, should launch October 1st. Um, this is an example of a diagram that Andrew made with one of our uh, non-researchers. Um, but yeah, really trying to identify new targets. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let the product speak for itself, hopefully in a month. Uh, yeah, but so with all this digital research, right, you need to translate it into real studies. Um, like Andrew was saying before, I think a huge edge that we have is we basically get clinic, phase two clinical trial data for free. So that's like $8 million that we get for free. If you don't believe me, hop into our Discord, you'll see it. <laughs> um, but like we want to keep bringing new treatments, right, for our community to keep trying. The way to do that uh, is by doing all this digital work together with the community. So leveraging those AI tools we were talking about before, leveraging like each person's mind, which may be an AI itself, you've heard that before, whatever. Um, and yeah, actually, actually creating more, more treatments. Yeah, so we want you to join the Hair Force. If you're not affected by it today, you probably will be tomorrow, or your brother, or maybe your sister will be. So come help us out. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Andrew and Andrew. Uh, as you heard, if you know someone who is there we go. Someone that's suffering from hair loss or someone who would love to be given the gift of hair, tell them to join the hair.discord and it's basically as good as having your hair back. Up next, we have Benji. Uh, Benji is a trained bioengineer with experience in biotech, investment banking, VC, academic, and industry research. And he's the director of product at Molecule. He'll be telling us about how to move fast and stake things. Give it up for Benji. Yeah.
Should be by default now. If, like if you go to arrangement. Arrangement and uh, this one is the, the other one and that. Okay. I think the extension isn't working. Uh, it's not. Uh, all right. Uh, let's do that. Okay. Uh, extending isn't working. Only mirror breaks. Okay. Oh wait, no. It's it's the cable. It's broken. It's the cable that's broken, I think. The cable that all of you before it. Cool. Oh, yeah, sure. Amazing. Cool, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Benji. Um, I work in product at Molecule. Um, it was about a year ago, I was at a different job. I was working for a biotech venture fund, and I was debating whether to jump in this space. And you know, looking back at the past year, it's been absolutely incredible to join the Molecule team and, dump, and jump into what is this incredible movement. I'm so glad I did, and excited to talk to you guys about what we've been up to for the past year. Um, so this talk is going to be like, jump around quite a bit, so expected to cover a bunch of different varied topics, and I apologize for that in advance. But the goal is to make it as linear as possible in terms of the claims that are made. So each of these points here are meant to build off of the next. Um, ultimately, getting to point number six, which is that DSI can create scientific value without jeopardizing IP. That's like the main thesis, and all of these previous um, claims are meant to build off one another to bolster that claim. So number one is that access to medicines is a uh, compelling value proposition. So um, the first time I ever came into contact with the DSI space was when Chris Leiter, who you just heard from, um, was at a, a friendly venture fund, and he sent me Molecule's deck, and the first thing I did was go to their website, and this is what I read, the future of medicine belongs to everyone. And it hit me in the face, and it was like very much love at first sight because you know, I, I hadn't been in venture long. I'd been there for maybe two months. But it was enough time to realize how access to medicines and being able to like own a piece of a medicine, how difficult that process is. You know, when I, when I joined venture, this is what I was expecting. I was expecting to sit on a panel with you know, the other people in my fund, and we were just going to get so many opportunities thrown at us that that was going to be how all of our time was spent but that is not how our time was spent. I actually took a video of exactly what we spent day to day, and here it is. Here's what it looks like. Basically, talking to absolutely anyone you can who may know somebody who knows somebody who has access to a funding opportunity in biotech. Um, most of biotech also happens in stealth, so there is an incentive to keep everything super close to your chest. You don't even know that these companies are being started, let alone have the opportunity to fund them yourself. So this idea of having access to compelling value propositions was, was you know, I, I'm the target market. So yeah, kind of like I said, it really favors these master networkers, not the master capital allocators or scientists. It really is those who work at you know, big brand name venture funds who um, 
are really able to get access to the best investment opportunities in biotech. And that, that kind of bothered me. It really did. Um, because this is really what you want people spending their time doing, which is analyzing data, analyzing you know, papers, patents, business models, commercial feasibility, rather than networking. Like that is the best use of human capital toward biotech capital allocation. It's not looking for opportunities, right? And so ideally, this is what even early stage biotech funding would look like. Of course, you have the hedge funds and the DE Shaws of the world that are doing, you know, quantitative analysis on biotech um, investment opportunities, but that's because these companies are public and they release a lot of data. Ideally, you would still have this even at the earliest stages of um, you know, scientific research funding at the, at the basic research level. And so I think, I think this is kind of like the, the main point here, which is that increased access to biotech funding will maximize the brain power um, that is predicting value relative to searching for prediction substrates. And that's ideally kind of the shift that we want. We want these opportunities to be so abundant that everyone is just focusing on how to diligence them rather than sourcing. So number two is IP tokens create broader access to medicines. So I assume most of the people here are familiar with Molecule's tech stack um, and the IP NFT. If not, I can briefly go over that. But basically the idea is to bridge legal world rights for intellectual property um, on chain via NFTs. And so these IP tokens are basically the next iteration of that, where rather than have it be a single non-fungible token held by a single entity, you can now democratize um, ownership of that. And so before I go into all of this, would like to give a huge shout out to the Molecule legal team who came up with everything I'm about to talk about. Jesse and Chris are right here. They're absolute geniuses. And what, what they designed uh, in this token primitive is called an IP pool. And so didn't make sense to me, but I'm here to kind of like be the bridge between the layman and the, and the legal team. But an IP pool is basically an entity that holds IP. Actually, wait, I wrote down the definition. I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> I guess I still don't know. Um, it is a fancy way of saying a bunch of people who do research and development together and contribute IP to an entity and collectively govern how that IP is used and who can use it. So it can take multiple forms. It can take a, you know, Bell Labs, for example, IP pool. Any corporation, IP pool. Basically, everyone within this entity is incentivized to collaborate with each other because they all collectively share whatever IP and rights come out of it and whom that, those rights can be licensed to. So we designed these IP tokens um, as ERC-20 tokens that are fungible governance tokens. And so the question is, if, if our goal is to uh, democratize access to medicines. Why don't we just democratize ownership directly? And it's because if you give ownership and title of IP to a bunch of people, it devolves into chaos because anyone can do licenses without, you know, telling the other owners. So what we realize in the cleanest way of doing this is actually by democratizing the governance of those singular IP rights. Um, and that's done via this IP pool. So another value proposition of these IPTs is that the community can take part in the research itself and its governance. So it's still to be determined whether this is an effective way of de-risking biotech IP, but we do think this is a compelling value proposition. If you want to have a say in how the research gets developed, which CRO is used, which personnel are hired or fired, it's important that the community feels engaged with the projects themselves, and this is their mechanism to do so. And third, and probably most importantly, is the ability to decide who the IP can be licensed to and on what terms um, and how royalties can be distributed. So we got a ton of legal advice when we were developing these primitives and found out that actually hard coding royalties of IP into the token might be uh, a legal risk. And so um, because of that, what we did is rather than hard code it in, we gave the governance right to govern how those royalties are distributed. So essentially, those rights carry with the token without the token itself carrying those, those uh, royalty rights. And you can read between the lines of why that's important. So this IPNFT um, uh, was originally funded by Vita Dow. It funds Victor Korolchuk, who is, um, who's researching uh, autophagy inhibitors at uh, the University of Newcastle. And they needed more funding for, to, to continue their awesome research. And so we used this primitive um, as a beachhead uh, with this project. And so, yeah, a, a few months ago now, uh, 
basically we took the IPNFT, we tokenized it into um, I think a, a million tokens, and we sold a portion of those to the VitaDAO community. And what we basically de-risk here is that there actually is appetite and demand for these governance tokens uh, to, to basically govern these individual projects. And so we had a crowd sale, it was oversubscribed by 1,700%. One of the really cool outcomes of this was we got the University of Newcastle involved. They developed a wallet and we sent them tokens, a university tech transfer office, really cool. Um, and, the, and the researcher also. So this, this researcher who's um, you know, not a Web3 native person by any means, he's an academically trained scientist, has already voted on a few snapshot um, governance proposals. So you know, we can onboard scientists into Web3. It just takes a little bit of work and a little bit of an incentive. And, and people will do it, and Dr. Korolchuk is super excited about the community that's being created around his project. So point number three is with IPNF, or IPTs, excuse me, we can incentivize scientific contributions. That's an important point to, to, to de-risking the fact that we can create value with DSI. Um, so you heard from Nicholas. Nicholas, uh, he actually mentioned this exact project. Um, we contracted LabDAO to do an analysis on the data that had been generated by the Korolchuk project, um, and we paid them with IP tokens as compensation. Um, and so, yeah, just very briefly, like, it can be done. This was the, the first example of it. Um, but it is an important point that if we can create tokens out of thin air and we can incentivize people to do productive science with them, then we've won, right? But it is really about bringing in more and more of these scientists into this ecosystem and convincing them that these tokens are valuable. But we've done it once, and, and we'll do it again. So the question is here is how do we decentralize that process? You know, we did it with LabDAO, but it was basically like Nicholas and on our studio uh, analyzing the data. He signed NDA. But is there a world in which we can potentially decentralize this process and, and leverage the hive mind that exists from having multiple scientists work on a project? And so, like, the only way I can think about how, how to explain this is mathematically. So what is the expected value of research? Um, as you, you know, mess with the number of researchers, increase it up or down. And so I came up with the super basic calculation of just how I think about it. But it's basically the expected value is the revenue associated with a project, you know, finding a drug and its market size and, you know, the number of patients and how many doses. Like, that's kind of a fixed number, whether you find a drug for a certain disease or not. Um, but what's not fixed is the number of researchers, which is NR, the, the probability of success for a specific researcher, um, and then the cost um, of that researcher. So the question here is, can we reduce the cost uh, that we pay researchers and increase the number so that we can increase the expected value? Because if we can increase the number, um, then what we can do is increase the probability that this revenue will be realized. Um, but yeah, I mean, this basically what, what you need to have happen is ensure that the revenue times the number of researchers times the probability that the researcher is successful um, is greater than um, the cost. And um, an important piece of the cost of increasing the number of researchers is the, the risk that the data gets leaked. So um, the more people you have uh, that are seeing the data, the, the greater the chance that the IP gets leaked. So another kind of hidden cost there, especially in biotech where, where IP is everything. Number four is that there's an illiquid market for computational biology. So right here, this is a graph of the cost of living in different countries and the PhD stipend in that uh, respective country. So the yellow lines are the, the, um, the cost of living and the red line is the uh, stipend. So what you can see, especially on the right, is that the, the stipend that you get as a PhD researcher is lower than the cost of living. You're basically starving, right? You have to be supported by somebody because you, off of your stipend, you, you can't afford to live in those countries. And so what you have is a bunch of people who are highly educated, extreme experts at a specific domain, and they can't even, they can't even live paycheck to paycheck. And another important thing is when you sign a contract to be a PhD student, oftentimes uh, you can't do contract work. So you can't you know, consult for certain companies. You have to get that approved by the, you know, the um, department, and you know, I'm sure that gets caught up in bureaucracy quite a bit. But what you can do is participate in bounties. So this is potentially an opportunity for us. I think one important data point here is that with the trading fees that have come from Vita Fast, we can pay for a graduate student from January to March based off of current stipends that people receive. It's just interesting. Like The speculation alone can pay for months of PhD student time. So um, 
Another important piece here, so, so that, that was meant to address the, um, the uh, supply side. Now let's look at the demand side. Um, so important here that basically like, this is how things currently operate. You have a few data scientists, they're in the walled garden of this biotech company, and there's all these potential data scientists that could extract all this potential value from the data inside, but they're never given access. So basically like what, what traditional biotech has decided is to protect their IP in the name of the, the cost of uh, leakage basically. So it's, yeah, basically the, the supply is high and the, and the demand is low um, in, in biotech. And here's hence why it's an illiquid market. So the best part, wait, this, this slide's out of place, I apologize. Um, so another important piece here is that decentralized communities can already solve very complex biological challenges. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Kaggle. Kaggle is like a decentralized data science platform. People can just show up and get access to data and do really cool analysis on important data science problems that people are trying to solve. And uh, one of those problems was recursion. Recursion is a very famous AI and drug discovery biotech company, and they put out a data set, and you, know, you can basically read their reviews. They're so impressed by the community. So the important piece here is that the data that's, um, that's shared is non-confidential, right? Because, of course, you can't release the confidential data and, and trust you know, thousands of data scientists. But the important part is with just the data set, they were able to attract all of these really cool computational biologists who were able to extract a ton of value from the project. But the question is if this is so great, like there's so much money in pharma, like why aren't other people doing this already? And that gets to the next most important uh, claim here, which is that drug discovery data can be shared safely to low trust individuals. And this is an opportunity being massively missed by the existing pharma community. So, most, most of biotech and pharma treat data leakage risk um, as basically completely binary, right? Either I get NDAs with absolutely everybody and then I share them the, the sensitive data or, um, yeah, th that's it. That's actually the only option. <laughs> like, they, they don't get access or they get access to the sensitive data and they sign NDA and if there's anything wrong, I have legal recourse. I think what we're promoting here with DSI is that you can share non-confidential data with as many data scientists as possible, so long as you preserve the IP, and so long as you re, um, preserve some of the information from the sensitive data itself. So, um, yeah, our, our whole thesis here is that there is kind of like this local maximum that biotech and pharma are in, um, and that they can achieve a global maximum if they are willing to share the data with more people. I'm not saying open source the data. I'll get into a little bit more of what I mean um, more specifically. Um, so, we have a challenge with the current, like, VitaFast, like, uh, Victor Korolchuk's project right now, which is to be able to predict the outcomes of the actual assays that are being run. So, our goal is to optimize and find the best chemical structure that induces autophagy. That's the ultimate goal, right? And we have these different assays that we're using to test to see, to predict, basically, in a human, which will be the best chemical matter that's safe and effective to, to increase autophagy. Um, and we've already generated a ton of data, and so the goal is to train models to be able to predict data on, on compounds that we didn't test. And so what you would run um, in like a, you know, any, any drug discovery project is called QSAR, which is Quantitative Structure Activity Relationship. And so what this basically is, is it's looking at certain parts of the compound and saying, oh, these are helpful, these help induce autophagy, and looking at the blue parts of the compound and saying, actually, those don't really help, we wanna get rid of those. So to be able to make those associations is super important. And so the question is, how, how are you able to do this without the compound's identity? And the answer is in fingerprinting. So you are able to preserve certain pieces of information about a compound without giving away the IP, which is the compound structure. Right? So this is the important piece here, is that you can actually democratize and make certain data sets go viral because it's, you're not giving away any of the IP. You're preserving information about it. And I'm sorry, I know this is kind of like a, a complex piece here, but it is, it's arguably like the most important piece of this entire talk, which is that none of the lawyers are data scientists at pharma companies. So they don't get this point. But as soon as somebody does and takes advantage of this, then they can have the entire world's army of data scientists mining their data because there's no risk. There's no risk of going from one of these fingerprints back to the drug. And so if, 
if you can democratize that data and, and let anyone come and perform analysis on it, then you basically get low risk computational biology on all of the drug discovery data that you're generating. And this is so unbelievably powerful. Um, and all of the tools are there. It honestly is just going to require someone to do it. And so here we are trying to do it. And so, um, yeah, point number six, DSI can create uh, scientific value without jeopardizing our IP. And so what you're getting here is a sneak peek of Vita Fast Development Proposal 3, Fast and Spurious. And so here are the rules. It's going to be a hackathon. Um, we are going to release all of the experimental data created from the Korolchuk project, but we're not gonna release the compound identities themselves, obviously, that is the IP. So we're going to release the fingerprints. Um, so there's def multiple fingerprinting methods. Some of them are spatial, some of them are semantic. We don't really care. We will create all of the fingerprints that are useful um, and predictive of the actual uh, like assay data itself. And so, yeah, the goal of this is to help us select which compounds to advance down the pipeline. I mean, that ultimately is the decision making you have to make in biotech is which compounds do we advance. And we want as many people and hive mind trying to help us make that decision. So we're gonna create a purse of 5K in USDC and 10K in V to fast. The way we're gonna decide who to compensate is by training a meta model, which is like a model of models. So we're gonna take all of the input models, we're gonna take a meta model, and then we're gonna see how much information does each of the submissions add to the final model itself. And what that'll do is, allow us to not have to dox everyone and require them to KYC because you don't want like to, ha to be at the whim of like Sybil uh, attacks here. You want just anyone to be able to submit as many as, as they want and anyone who adds information to the final prediction, we can, we can compensate. So we're gonna leave submissions open for all of October. Definitely stay tuned for more updates on this, but really freaking excited about this. Um, and this will kind of give us a list of researchers who we can then bring into more of an inner circle and give access to the full data set to. Um, and, and definitely to stay um, as invested in, in advancing the project as possible. But yeah, anyone is eligible, and yeah, with that, if you'd like to join the, the Discord, that's the QR code, and um, yeah, that then Uniswap? that's a Uniswap link to buy the token. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was amazing, and I'm uh, super excited to see what the results of that test will be. Uh, before you run off stage real quick, how can we uh, stay tuned to find out what happens in October with your results? Um, join the Discord. Join the Discord, let's go. All right, uh, up next we have Michael Baran. Uh, Michael is a partner at Pfizer Ventures. He leads equity investments at Pfizer and he manages stakes in numerous biotechs. Hello, Michael, please take the stage. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope I'm uh, not disappointing here. I got a lot of uh, feedback on my picture there that it, uh, it might have been taken a long time ago. And I think that's a nice way of saying I look old, but um, I don't know, I still think I look good, so. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm Mike Barron, uh, I'm from Pfizer. I think we're the uh, first pharma company to make an investment in DSI. I'm proud of that. Yep. We try to say that uh, you know, Pfizer is innovative in what we do in R&D, and I think uh, there's nothing more innovative than this. Um, I think Tyler coined this as a movement this morning. DSI is a movement. It certainly is. And um, that brings me to this room. You know, uh, The other thing I was surprised about that Paul said this morning was uh, it's been one year, right? The first DSI Berlin conference was one year ago. I thought it was, this was the third one, you know? And, and last year's event was actually the one that, um, it, it made a big difference in kind of uh, my view of DSI and what was going on. There's clearly like an energy in this room. And I said, we have to be a part of this. So it's an honor to be on the stage. And I think the reason it feels like year three instead of year two is that just so much has happened, right? Like last year when the conference happened, I wasn't here, but I downloaded it off of YouTube. I watched it on a plane. and. Um, you know, there was no pharma company invested in DSI. You know, we invested probably two or three months after uh, this conference. Uh, we just heard Herdaus putting a compound into clinical trials. I mean, that's amazing. Who would have ever thought that? Um, and there's a handful of DAOs now that are making solid progress. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about Vita DAO today. That's the one that uh, we're involved in, of course. So the title of my talk is um, R&D 2030. So we're supposed to be forward-looking here. 
and uh, decentralized pools of innovation uh, as novel sources of therapeutic substrate. And we'll do this in two parts. So the first part, we're going to talk about um, why, why we need DSI. I think everybody knows why we need DSI. We've said it many times throughout the day, right? It's challenging to fund early stage research. Uh, but I'm going to tell you why that actually is from the pharma side of the table, uh, why it's hard for us to fund early stage research. So we put a little bit of detail behind that. And then I'll, I'll give some updates on VitaDAO and, and how it's going and, and, and how we see it there. Okay, so why DSI? I'll start with this phrase here, and anyone that's an entrepreneur has heard this. Uh, you give your pitch, and they say, sorry, you're too early. So what, what does this really mean, you're too early? Does it really mean you're too early and generate some more data and come back and we'll fund you? Or is it a nice way of kind of just saying not interested? I think the answer is really both. I, I do this myself, I'm guilty. But um, let me tell you what, what we mean here when we say too early and what's really driving that. So I, I love this slide, I've showed it before in the past. Uh, this is from Fierce Biotech about a year ago, but the situation is the same, th the same today. Uh, pharma has a big revenue problem going out into the end of the decade, into 2030, and that being there's a number of drugs that are coming off patent. And so if you look at this chart here, you know, the names are some of the biggest drugs. These are the crown jewels of pharma, right, the biggest sellers. Uh, the red dots are uh, when they're coming off patent between 2030 on the left, on the left, 20, uh, sorry, 2020 on the left, 2030 on the right. Uh, and then you have the sales, right? And, you know, on the bottom here, you just see $200 billion in revenue coming off patent. That, those revenues not only have to be uh, replaced, we need to add to that. We, pharma, we're publicly traded companies. So it's not enough to just, you know, repl re replace these revenues. We need to show growth in earnings per share. Otherwise, the street doesn't like that and your stock price gets hammered. And so, just to put a little bit more numbers behind this from Pfizer, uh, we have about, I think, 17 to 19 billion coming off patent between now and 2030. And uh, we've promised 6% growth per year. If you take our internal portfolio, um, we think that that would just barely offset the, the uh, loss of exclusivities. So where does the growth come from? It's gotta come from somewhere. The answer is we need to do more partnering uh, and we need to kind of buy assets from biotech. And of course, those assets need to generate revenue by 2030. So here's my first hint. If you're gonna be in position to generate revenues by 2030, you have to be in the clinic today, maybe even past phase one. So, you know, if you're looking at a very early academic opportunity, seed stage biotech, it's just gonna be harder to prioritize that kind of investment. Okay, so the second, the second thing I wanna make the point about is, um, Benji actually just made a comment that he said something like, uh, you know, pharma's got unlimited money, deep pockets. Uh, it's true, but I think it's not, the money for early stage R&D or external partnership, it's not what you might think. And, and let me walk you through that right here uh, with this bar chart on the left. So this is a uh, Mike Barron special. I made this myself. Uh, well, you could probably tell I made the chart myself, but I, I did the data analysis myself. Uh, so I took the R&D budget of the top 10 pharma companies, and I just took the average R&D budget, and it's, it comes out to 10 billion per year. Uh, that's the red bar there. So the next bar, the blue bar, is um, how much is spent on research, right? So I said R&D budget, R, research, D, development, development basically clinical trials. And when you look at it on average, 80% of the R&D budget, 80%, huge piece of it, right? Just goes to running clinical trials. So your 10 billion automatically comes down to 2 billion. Still a lot of money, right? But 2 billion for research. Now, almost every pharma company that has an R&D division uh, does internal R&D. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of infrastructure involved, right? You gotta pay people, you gotta have um, physical locations. Um, probably for every scientist, there's like five non-scientists supporting that person um, in a pharma organization. So um, I conservatively said here, let's say 5% of the research budget is used for external R&D partnering. Uh, that brings you down to $100 million. So now you're a long way from $10 billion, but $100 million is still a lot of money, right? Um, and the last thing to keep in mind is that of that $100 million, you know, when you do a, a deal, in the early stage, or any stage actually, of biotech, they're usually milestone-based. So there's an up, upfront payment, excuse me, 
and then, and then it, as success milestones are, are met, you know, there's additional payments. So you have to budget for those in the out years. So you come into like this year and you have to you know, account for all of the uh, previous year's research collaborations and, and deals that were done that might have milestones that hit the budget this year. So we, we typically, we just think about it uh, that we need to save 50% of the budget to pay for milestones. So now you're down to 50 million. That's a huge attrition, $10 billion, unlimited money, 50 million to do deals. Um, and I can tell you, I probably look at uh, maybe in some weeks, 100, 100 different opportunities a week. And I'm just one person at Pfizer. So what are the odds of your one earlier stage opportunity uh, being one that gets traction? And if you look at the right side here, we'll put some numbers behind, behind this. So the average upfront on a, um, we'll say, candidate or clinical phase one stage um, asset is about somewhere in the five to $20 million range. So you do two of those and you're an average pharma company, you know, that you eat up most of the budget, right? Uh, now you do one of them, you can probably do a, a, a few more platform deals or academic collaborations, but you're gonna net out somewhere around, you know, one or two biotech deals for an asset and maybe 10 to 20, uh, five to 20, I wrote here, depending on the company. Uh, but, you know, that's not that many, right? So, yes, there's a lot of money. A lot of it goes to development. And at the end of the day, not as much as you might think for early stage research. And if you take into account my first slide, which showed how much revenue is coming off and how much pressure there is to replace that revenue, you know, the prioritization is going to skew towards uh, the later stage opportunities. And that's the problem that we have here. And that's why Valley of Death Stage Science uh, doesn't get as much um, investment as it should. So, are there alternative financing models for early stage science? Of course there are, right? I didn't even get to DSI yet. But these are pretty um, established models here, right? So you can make equity investment. That's what I do all day, Pfizer Ventures. Gave a shout out to some of my German uh, corporate venture groups being in Germany here, M Ventures and Leaps. Um, accelerators, not a, not a new concept, right? We have one called CTI, Centers for Therapeutic Innovation. There's others. Uh, consortiums have been around forever, right? But these, these are not new. These are just kind of new logos and new names to established concepts. So if you think like that, then you still have this big problem that I've been talking about for five minutes now. So that's where DSI comes in. And um, we all love this, this uh, view here from Ultra Rare Bio. Um, I think when I learned about VitaDAO, there was like three or four dots you could put on a slide like this. I think next year we probably need a, a second slide, uh, and that just goes to show uh, the momentum here in the space. So I don't need to spend too much time on this with this audience here, but some of the pros and cons as I see it for uh, DSI. So the left is the pros, the right is the cons. Obviously, alternative capital source here. This is uh, another pool of money coming in to fund early stage uh, research, exactly what we need. Uh, I think the network effects are something that can't be understated. I can speak uh, from my experience at VitaDAO. Uh, we just, we do great when it comes to uh, sourcing deals and having people chip in to do diligence on deals. That is just, uh, I'm actually surprised at the quality and the depth of people that, have, uh, part that participate in VitaDAO and enable uh, us to do deals. Uh, and then transparency we've spoke about, right? Everything's on the blockchain, uh, you can see it. Now on the right side are some of the cons and we're still working through all of these. So obviously legal regulatory hurdles, the rules are being written and they're not being written in the same way across all different countries. So luckily we have Jesse and Chris over here to help navigate. Um, liquidity is also a challenge. You know, um, you, some of you may have seen VitaDAO had a large stakeholder sell about a week or two ago. Um, you can quickly see your token price uh, diminish if a large stakeholder uh, decides to sell at, at this point in the game, right? Uh, and, then, and then the biggest thing, as I see as a risk, is track record, right? To, in order to attract new investors, they're going to say, well, you know, how have you done, right? And if you don't have any wins to point to, it's a little bit of a tougher sell. But I, I think we'll get there with that one. Okay, so last few slides here. Um, how's it going with VitaDAO and, and how do I see it? Um, so on the left here, you have the VitaDAO token price. Uh, again, everything's public, so I think you, if you did a little bit of Googling, you could figure out uh, where, we, where we came in and what we paid. I'll just tell you it's on the left side there, all right? So around a dollar, plus or minus a few cents. 
So we're happy, right? You can see the liquidity event I, I mentioned on the right, where the price kind of dropped a few weeks ago, but we're already rebounding. I mean, you know, Pfizer's not really in this to make money. We can't lose money, otherwise that, would, that wouldn't be a good look. Um, but I think, you know, we're, 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 we have a nice return already about a year in. Uh, where, where most of our interest is and, and why we got involved with VitaDAO is on the strategic impact side. And by that, I mean, uh, how does our participation in VitaDAO help potentially impact the Pfizer R&D drug discovery pipeline? And at this point, it's really uh, that we get access to deal flow that we might not have seen, right? And, I, and as I mentioned, we, we, if, all of you are welcome to join. It's open to everyone. Our Friday, we meet and we have our deal flow calls. Uh, you can come look at the companies that are pitching to us. Um, but more importantly are the ones that actually get financed. And hopefully then those companies are, or, or academics are generating data that we can look at uh, using the business development lens for a collaboration or, or more than that at some point in the future. So on the right, I just, I just list a few that are in areas that Pfizer is very interested in. Um, and so you see some areas like RNA stability, nanoparticles, cardiovascular disease. Um, so we'll see where these companies go. It's exciting to, to, to follow. Um, now, as far as DSI, I, I, I'm pretty sure VitaDAO, it's definitely, I think it's the first uh, DSI DAO that was spun out, probably the biggest in terms of market cap. Um, and on the left are some figures that you've probably seen on the website. So we've been doing deals and, and we have nice access to capital. But on the right is what I want to talk about a little bit more. Um, so there's actually two tokens now and a third, it won't be a token, but a third fund on the way in the, in the fall. So, you know, Benji just took us through the IPT concept. We've heard about IPT, IP NFTs as well. Um, this is kind of how I view how that integrates into, into VitaDAO. So on the left there on the bottom, you have the Vita token, right? And I call this a passive token because while you can be active in bringing deals to the DAO and helping diligence them and vote on what we're actually gonna fund, once the money goes out the door, you know, we're not really guiding those companies so much. Um, it's, it's more a passive investment. Right uh, now, the first IPT, which we call Vita Fast, that's the Victor Korlichuk project, uh, is is uh, active now as of a month ago, and I call this um, I also call this an active uh, token, right? Because it allows you to actively participate in the project that you know Vita Dow funded earlier. So that's pretty interesting. I mean, nothing like this exists in the world of financing or early stage science, right? Um, you have a novel concept here with the accelerator called Vita Dao itself, or Dao, and now you can actually, if you want, you can participate in the actual projects. I mean, that, that is pretty cool. I, I, I'm super excited to see how this plays out. And on top of that, this Vita Fast token is tradable, right, on a, on a you know, decentralized exchange. So it's also a first in that for the first time ever, you, you have price discovery playing out for you know, early stage academic IP that for the most part has been illiquid for years. Um, and just a quick comment how I, how I see that, that potentially going. There, there could be three ways this goes, right? One is, you, so what, what's the, and by, by that specifically, I mean, what is that token worth, right? So it was priced at the amount of money that went into the project, which was I think $300,000 divided by a million tokens issued, 30 cents a token. And then it's, you know, price discovery, right? So, but what's the price, right? I think different people are gonna value this in different ways. If you are a experienced, you know, biotech investor, you're gonna say, well, you know, that work is eight to 10 years from becoming a product and generating revenues. You need to discount that for the cost of failure. There's probably a 1% chance it gets to market and actually generates a dollar. So I think it's worth zero, right? <laughs> You could be uh, on the complete opposite end of that and say, this is pretty cool, this is a new thing, let's just buy it up, right? Uh, send it up with <laughs> nothing other than hype, really. That, that's real though, right? Um, but I think the third, and the, which is the middle option, is what I see actually like, more likely to play out, is that you know, if that project just gets to Series A and they're able to uh, pull together a traditional venture capital syndicate, say then someone like myself, I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna look at that, I'm gonna say, what is that? Like, let's just buy that out, get it off the books. We don't want it. Uh, it's gonna hurt us going down the road because people don't understand it. Um, 
But that's a good thing for the token holders, right? You get a great IRR, you cash out early, and um, hopefully that's a win for everyone. And then the, the, the work goes on and continues forward. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I have a few minutes left here. So this is my last slide, actually. Just to look forward with VitaDAO and what's coming up between now and the end of the year. Uh, so I think we've already mentioned that we have a, a journal called the Longevist that's been launched, so you can check that out. Uh, for token holders, there'll, there'll be a number of announcements around token benefit programs, and these will be things like kind of like frequent flyer miles where uh, you qualify for discounts on travel, at hotels, or access to curated events. I think that's, that's pretty interesting. I think all these side DAOs should think about something like this. Um, could drive you know, ownership. It's just a nice benefit to participate. Uh, I mentioned we'll have this token-gated venture fund also in the fall, um, likely in the fall. That will be a, a third option there, and that, that's, that'll be like a traditional venture fund for accredited, accredited investors. And then more IP NFTs on the way. There's two I list here that are kind of in the pipeline, one around aging and one around Alzheimer's. Uh, and then uh, we have a few new company spin-outs, and I think these might be the first uh, biotech new company spin-outs coming out of DSI. So that's a milestone and uh, an achievement. And I list the two there, one's in oncology and one's with uh, tRNAs. Um, and then, so just to wrap up, the last thing I'll say, there will be no Q&A, <laughs> but the, la the last thing I'll just say is from, from the panel, uh, I thought one interesting thing that I, that I took away from the panel was, in terms of um, future audiences for DSI or, or, or future stakeholders, there were three that kind of were mentioned that I think we should all know and uh, consider to bring into your own DSI DAOs. So the first was uh, patient advocacy groups, right? And we've seen this transition over the last decade probably where patient advocacy, they would originally invest in just pure academic science, but then you know, the, the, the people that were funding that, they didn't really see an outcome. And it shifted to they, they prefer to invest in drug discovery so that they could hopefully get medicines into their, their loved ones' hands. And so you know, here they, there's an opportunity to tap into that crowd. So that, that would be um, audience number one. And then um, audience number two is more pharma, right? We're working on that. Um, and then uh, the third audience, which I thought was interesting, was uh, if we can get closer to uh, um, investigators that run clinical studies at academic medical centers. And so maybe, and maybe it'll be Vita Dow, I might push for this, you'll see the first chief medical officer hired at a uh, D side Dow in uh, 2024. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. For sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. It's great to hear from the outside perspective of someone in traditional pharma to see what they think of you know, the innovative space like DSI. Uh, I have the faith and I believe that we'll continue to see more players from the traditional biotech and sciences space emerge onto the scene as DSI continues to prove itself as a force in the space. Up next, we have a panel. Uh, this panel is going to be between Ines Wande and Dr. Federique. Uh, Ines will be moderating. For those that don't know, Ines is the founding operational lead at Athena Dow, and she will be in, uh, interviewing our two panelists. So we'll just get some chairs up here and get that panel underway. All right, yeah. People that I'm talking. <laughs> so hello everyone. Super excited to be here um, and to be talk about operations. So we have talked about science uh, today, DAOs, bio DAOs, IP, but not necessarily operations. So we'll have the chance to talk about what actually means operations. I mean, like more traditionally, but in uh, in Web3 and in a DAO. So I think I have. I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, James do, did a good job in, um, introducing you. So one day, I'm curious to, see, to from your perspective, like what actually means operations um, for you? And I'm talking about more in general. And the reason I'm asking is because I think a lot of the times, I'm sure that the three of us have three different uh, definitions of what ops mean in an in a organization. So I'm curious to, see, to hear yours and then we'll go from there. 
Sure. I think often operations is viewed as like a siloed department that might have HR, or legal, or finance within it, but I like to view it more as a force that's integrated throughout an organization. So if an organization is a human body, I consider operations to be like the circulatory system. So it's what makes sure, make, it kind of delivers the blood and that force to, thank you, to everyone and make sure that all the different departments are working well together, different working groups, et cetera, are working well together. Um, and the reason I like that definition is because it applies to any type of organization. Um, because in general, people are people, whether it's a DAO, whether it's traditional operations, there's always um, this common idea of like, how do you encourage the right behavior and operations does that. Federico, in your, in your, in, in your opinion, like what, how do you see operations? Uh, yeah. This was way more poetic than I could have put it. So I was, I was going to say, for me, operations is kind of um, the creation on, and maintenance of the framework to actually um, allow the organization to kind of build things and shape things. Well, that's an interesting point because like all, all organizations need to live under like some kind of framework. It's like, it's not an open canvas, right? You come in and there are a set of values, goals, and then they're like a little bit more structure. So then operations make sure that that works. In your, in your perspective, web two, web three operations, what are the main differences? Um, yeah, how do you compare both? Um, I think kind of if when you move from web two to web three and kind of you have a traditional web three company, um, I think um, the way that operations work are minimally different. Um, but obviously kind of if, if, you, if you're kind of asking about um, like DAOs, operation, yeah, operations kind of work very differently. Sometimes they don't work. Um, so I think kind of if, if you kind of look at DAOs, you have to differentiate between different kinds of DAOs, right? So kind of there are the patient interest group DAOs that we talked about earlier, um, where people have um, are kind of aligned on um, a topic and kind of what they want to see happen and kind of have interest or stake in that. And then there's um, DAOs that um, strive to replace traditional companies or um, you know, protocols or products, um, and those, um, I think what, for, I, I want to see them work in due course, but I think currently the way that they work is suboptimal. Um, be, some barely work, to be honest. So, yeah, so I think kind of, uh, it, it kind of, you kind of have to differentiate a lot between different use cases here. And let's go into DAO specifically. Um, you mentioned like um, DAOs and you also mentioned protocols. Like what do you think that is not making them work as optimal as they should be? I, I think kind of we have a lot of experience in kind of how to make groups um, that are co-located or that kind of know their names and kind of have, um, have, um, uh, have strong relations between the individual people how to make those work as a team. I think making a much more fluid set of people where kind of you can transition in and out um, easily without, uh, without any barriers, making that work where you have, have pseudonym, uh, pseudonymity, you don't, you don't necessarily know who is who, um, kind of people can create a second profile and so on. I think kind of getting that to work is a lot harder um, on one hand because kind of the ways of kind of attacking that system in a way um, are much more plentiful, um, but also on the other hand, because we don't have as mu much experience with um, these kinds of setups. Yeah, it's, a, it's like coordination, it's like decision making, it's like timelines, everything at the same time, very different from what we had before. One day you had experience in Web2, consulting, and now uh, with, uh, with Molecule. It's, not, it's like Web3, but not necessarily at DAO, right? But I think you are also like uh, learning and also implementing a lot of the DAO mindset into, into Molecule. But I'm curious to see like, do you agree with this vision? And what's, what do you think is like working well and not, not so well? I agree to an extent. I mean, maybe my slightly contrarian take is that 
I think one of the reasons that DAOs can fail in operations is because in trying to be disruptive, they might have thrown out, we might be throwing out too much of the traditional ops that actually works. I mean, we have decades or centuries of information telling us things about human behavior um, and how to incentivize people. And I think simply because we've created a new structure that's more autonomous doesn't mean we need to get rid of some of like the best practices that still work. So when I think of a DAO, um, especially in its very early stages, it's very similar to an early stage startup. You still need that core team. Um, I think Tyler talked about this earlier. Um, and it's really important that we still consider some of the things that are necessary just in general business. Um, so that would be my take. Yeah, but then kind of I, my, my contrary and contrary, contrary <laughs> take would be that um, basically in, in a situation where you have a small group of closely knit founders um, who without kind of token dynamics and so on yet um, that, are, that isn't really open, that's a DAO in name only. So basically kind of having, to me, a DAO is something that is truly open to kind of anyone. Um, and I think kind of building structures that work for that, I don't think it's been achieved yet. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I, guess, I think what I would add is that decentralization is a spectrum. Um, there are many companies now, or many DAOs now, that started simply as companies, whether it's Uniswap Labs or whatever. So they have some startup behind them, even though there's also a DAO where you can propose things in their governance structure, et cetera. So I think it's, the solution is probably something in between, something to kind of blend the two. Um, even if you're starting a DAO, it might not be the same as closely knit founders in a startup, but there probably are going to be some founding stewards, stewards, some people that have the ability to dedicate the amount of time that they would to, as they would to any other business. Because if it's just completely treated as a side project and just completely treated as like a, a hobby or something, it's going to be really hard to ma uh, maintain that momentum. But if you have some core people, it allows for the fluidity within the rest of your organization. I, I would agree to that. And I think one of the most fundamental misunderstandings about DAOs um, is that people think that all DAO members are the same. And I mean, so basically they are the same when they enter, but kind of you can make yourself much more indispensable than the average DAO member. And you should have a lot more say than the average DAO member. And kind of um, this notion that there shouldn't be a hierarchy in a DAO, to me that's nonsense. I don't think that's, I don't think that's gonna work. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, it's not gonna be as hierarchical as like a corporation, but you decentralize decision making it comes at a cost. So if you allow every single decision in a DAO to be made by consensus, especially if it's a really large DAO, it's gonna be hard to do anything and you're gonna move really slowly in an area where you're trying to be disruptive. So the DAO does kind of need to empower certain people to have a greater say. And that can be through voting, but you're voting to say, okay, we enable and empower these people to make decisions, for example. I think one part of the op ops uh, work has to do with contextualizing, decision making, contextualizing, uh, contextualizing the work that we are doing. And I remember like when we, for example, when we started the Tina DAO, a lot of people were coming to us just like, ah, let me know what to do. But like we, we were still building that context, right? And it was hard for us to just give work to everyone that would come to us. But sometimes that's the expectation, right? While in a startup, there's like the recruitment process. A lot of people think, look at the DAO as like some, a, a place that they can jump in and jump out or whatever you want. And for, uh, for you as ops to actually plan a little bit the work that we are doing, it becomes hard. And I think that goes back to what you were saying about fluidity, right? So how can we create systems that are very fluid, that work no matter like a little bit like who, who is in it, but, but still each of us can actually bring our individual contributions. And I think that's a challenge that I agree, like we, we haven't figured out, I think we are, I wouldn't say like far away, but I, think, but I think there are signs of other organizations that have done it, right? So when I look at, for example, Automatic, the founders, like the creators of WordPress, they are, a, 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 I think it's like almost 2,000 people organization, completely remotely, where no meetings, right? So where people just like, there's like a lot of, but that's not a doubt. Right? No, 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 so, no. So I mean, but, basically yeah. to me, kind of 2,000 people that are known but work remotely, that's kind of, that's 
you know, m very much on the company end yeah. of the scale. What I, I was saying, like, like there are learnings from that structure that we can implement. But I, again, we are, I think, as, as DAOs, I think we are still far away from actually having that fluidity and flexibility and agility that we were saying to actually get things done. I think I, I would still go back to traditional operations on this, where I generally believe that operations and structure, they're just the right amount needed allows a lot more freedom, whether it's creative thinking, strategic thinking. If you nail down the basics and you're doing that efficiently, it gives you more room to do other things. And I think, think similarly in a DAO that if you have the right processes and structure in place, which still needs to be figured out, but for that core team, even if they change, um, it's almost like the standard business continuity problem that you would have in any organization where you don't want to have a single point of failure, et cetera. So if you build systems with that in mind, keeping in mind that anyone could leave at any time, and that's, this is what a lot of asynchronous organizations have to do, um, I think that would be a path forward for DAOs to help solve this problem. Do you have like specific like things that you, f you believe that DAOs could do? Uh, because I think a lot of people are here are either they are DAO contributors, they are thinking about building maybe a bio DAO. Like what is like the specific things that you believe that from day one they should care about? I would say first and foremost, make sure that you start the DAO with partners that are fully committed. Um, as much as you can ensure that and make sure that they have the time. Um, similarly, you would not want to start a startup with someone who just took on a new job that's 60 hours a week and then has all other commitments and con consults and all of that. Um, DAOs take time, and the other thing is they take time, and they, you often don't get rewarded in, in money, at least immediately. <laughs> so I think it's really important to have a strong founding team, and the way to get that is that they're really passionate about the cause, and I think we've seen that at least in the bio DAOs. Um, so it's a lot of sweat equity, and I think just like with any organization, starting with that really strong team is probably the key to like the, th the first thing to do on day one. Do you have also any suggestions, advice? Uh, it's super difficult because there are so many different things that kind of you could, in principle, give advice about, right? So basically, one, one of the things I think that are always good advice, whether for um, uh, organizations um, that are traditional or organizations that are transitioning into kind of a DAO setup or organizations um, that started as DAOs, um, I think transparency is key for many things. So kind of get into the habit of being transparent um, about things and, you know, consistency also usually helps. Um, but then, yeah, so basically the, the thing that kind of sets individual DAOs apart from one another, I think, is culture. And um, I'm with Wendy on, and, and that, and that I think kind of the founding team really has a really large mark to make here. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing I would add is the incentive structure. That's probably the main difference between like traditional ops and, and DAO ops and just companies and DAOs. The incentives are very different. Um, there's a potential for diffusion of responsibility and accountability when you don't have people basically legally obligated by contract to show up at a certain place for a certain number of hours. Um, so I think aligning incentives also in a way that uh, works with the DAO's goals is really important. Um, and it could be through tokens, it could be through bounty programs, it, it really depends on, on what the DAO is focused on. I think like something that, I think, I think like DAOs of course like offer like a, a different incentive structure, but I think for, for example BioDAO specifically, I think it's important that you attract people that are also mission aligned, right? And I think like, I think that incentives, culture and mission are, are three things that I, I believe they need to be actually very close together. And I feel like, like a lot of the times, I think like last year, for example, it was very easy for a DAO to just like get hundreds of people coming in, but they're just like, ah, oh, there's like looking for bounties, looking for this, but not necessarily even caring about what actually the work that we are trying to do. Um, and I think that was where culture also makes a big difference, right? So, but like, how do you think about culture b building in DAOs? Uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear from both of you, like culture in DAOs and how can be built, because like, in, in traditional startups, usually the culture comes from the, uh, from the founders, right? I think this goes for DAOs too. So basically, I think for DAOs, the culture comes from the founding team and kind of how you interact with the larger DAO, um, how much you tell about the rationale behind certain decisions, how much you kind of involve people. I think, yeah, I think it's no different 
um, than uh, in traditional organizations. I think something that sometimes doesn't happen in DAOs is kind of um, policing culture to a certain extent, so calling out people for kind of rubbish behavior. Um, obviously, in traditional organizations, this happens. I, I think in DAOs, it kind of needs to happen more. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think I would also add that regardless of the organization, culture evolves. It might start one way, but it's going to change. Um, and the founding team, but also the, all the community members have a say in whether or not that change is for the better or for the worst. So I think part of it is almost like how people are onboarded into the DAO, who who you initially kind of invite to your community. Um, if you're approaching DGENs versus scientists uh, versus, I don't know, maybe patient communities, et cetera. Um, I think who you uh, market to and who you, uh, who you essentially attract to the DAO um, makes a big difference in culture. So if you start early with that onboarding part, um, you can really help guide the culture. I think one of the challenges that we have as DAOs is the fact, like, it's true that you can market it to different communities, right? And then we onboard these different communities. But then in the end, you actually have a big group of people. They might be mission aligned, incentive aligned, but they also have very specific needs. Like, uh, if you are a researcher, if you are like someone, for in our case, like someone with a specific uh, women's health uh, condition, or if you are uh, like a funder, or if you are a Web3 enthusiast that wants to understand like if this site can work. So I think like people also come to us with different backgrounds, different uh, different needs, and I think like ops and also like of course the the working groups have a, a, a important role to make sure that there's like a value a value proposition a value for each one of the uh, for, uh, for each one of the different stakeholders right and i think that's actually sometimes a challenge i think that's not true <laughs> i think some people so i think sometimes kind of um making sure that your scope is narrow and stays narrow is um, important for success because if you try to do too many things as, at once, so kind of speak to uh, the, the, the people, yeah, the people with specific conditions and the founders and so on. Try to incorporate them all. Kind of the thing that often gets left behind is the initial vision and mission, and then kind of it kind of it's a collective of people who sit in a Discord. No, I think that there's a big difference between having a strong community and having people on the Discord, right? So, but I also think that, at least from what we are seeing, is that you don't really control who is coming in. You basically what you want is like to onboard and give a, an experience. We have been actually very focused on like who is the, the the initial group that we are trying to onboard and 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 add value to. But I think as we grow, we'll be able to will attract other people that comes with different profiles. And I think like. It's true that we cannot uh, f um, forget the mission, but I think it's also true that um, we'll have to create value for each one of them. And I think that it, it might be, not be immediately, it might be something that we do in the long, uh, long term, but I think that's something that will be requested from us. I think one thing to consider is also scaling, and that's what affects culture, but also other aspects. I think DAOs have to plan for scaling much sooner than a startup would, um, because when you go from, I don't know, maybe start with 20 people, then 1,000, then 10,000, um, and that there's that culture change, but it also just affects other aspects of operations. So I think addressing all the aspects of scaling would include this cultural component. But in DAOs with 20,000 members, how many of them are actually active members? Just a few. <laughs> yeah, there you go, and I think in that sense, it doesn't really change, right? Yeah, well, I think there are different ways to encourage activity, but it matters like which few are active. And it's not always the largest token holders, for instance, who are the most active, but there, you can encourage delegation, you can do different things to try and get people to be more active, but it is true that like the lar in really large DAOs, everyone does not participate. Yeah, so I think things we absolutely need to build for DAOs, kind of DAO tooling that we have to have, uh, kind of some sort of reputation uh, modules, um, so that kind of whatever, so basically your history with this DAO should have some sort of impact on how your vote is weighted. Um, and then secondly, um, I think the thing that we kind of need is uh, ZK technology for kind of attestations and kind of making sure that things are heard and are heard even from people 
whom they wouldn't necessarily be heard from otherwise. So kind of in a way of kind of in a way obfuscating the identity, but then obviously the re reputation comes in again, right? So basically if you have someone who has a really large reputation and wants to make some sort of um, outrageous proposal that they don't want to do under their, in their assumed name, um, they can do this um, in that fashion. I think kind of those two primitives, they will, will really kind of bring DAO uh, governance and DAO operations forward. Uh, I wanted to go back to, I think we, we also mentioned about transparency, right? And I think that's one of the big differences between Web2 ops or more traditional ops and, uh, and, uh, and ours ops. I think companies over the years have become more transparency internally and externally, but I would like to also to see like in terms of like in your, in, uh, in your experience, like how, like you mentioned like the, the uh, sharing the rationale behind the decisions is a way to be transparent, right? But I think a lot of the times, uh, like, and we have seen it recently where people are suspicious of everything, right? And they want to, to have information, but like how to make sure that as a DAO and uh, specific on operations, you are able to provide that information um, and, and yeah, and, and, and how to make sure that you build operations uh, around transparency. Um, I think transparency is almost inherent to DAOs and Web3 and crypto and, and blockchain. I mean, the whole idea to me is that you don't have to trust people because of the transparency. There's almost this like trade-off, which is a bit different than traditional operations where the two can almost be synonymous. Um, in DAOs, because you're working with people you don't necessarily trust, you have to create that transparency. Well, it's not just about voting, it's about being able to see where the DAO funds are going, et cetera. So, I mean, there's there are lots of different ways, but it's almost as if I would say a DAO needs to be transparent across the board, with the exception of places, of situations where they a vote or elect certain people and empower them to make decisions, maybe that entire decision-making pro process doesn't need to be open to the DAO, but at least like the conclusion and the reason should be shared. So it's almost like transparency is like the, the number one tenant to me with the culture of a DAO when you're starting it, and it's part of the Web3 ethos. I know that I said you need transparency early, and I stand by that, but I think there is such a thing as too much transparency, and there's also transparency trolls who kind of um, take up precious bandwidth of the DAO by kind of asking for much more information than they could possibly need. And I think kind of, you know, putting putting a stop to that um, and kind of saying, okay, look, uh, the, the DAO has decided this way, and. Uh, that's good enough, I think that's fine. So I think kind of putting a limit to that and kind of not letting yourself as a DAO, as you know, a in principle open organization be abused by random people who kind of come by, I think this is uh, very important. Yeah, I think that's, that's true. And, and when a DAO is electing people to certain roles within the DAO, um, part of, I think that is perhaps more based on trust and you elect them because you trust them to make the right decisions. And in that case, you don't require as much transparency but um, it can take time to get to that point, but I, I completely agree with what you said. Final question before opening up to the audience. Um, I think like looking ahead, you mentioned like what kind of tools that we need to, to build, but looking ahead, like what we like to see in terms of tooling, uh, in terms of like ways of looking at ops inside uh, in web, uh, of Web3, but DAO specifically, like what are, you think are the main trends or how do you envision the future of, DAO, of ops in uh, DAOs? Do you want to go first? Because I think I already... Uh... Sure. Um, I mean, the future of ops, like, there's definitely going to be tooling. And this isn't just for DAOs. This is for crypto companies. Um, it's still really difficult for a crypto company to find a bank, to find a tool that integrates fiat transactions with crypto transactions, et cetera. And I think DAOs are going to be going through this same process. Um, for instance, with hiring, maybe it's bounties through D-Work. Maybe it's, and hiring might not be the, the right word to use for DAOs, but you are bringing people onto the team. So I definitely think they're tools that, you know, span, you know, HR, um, legal, uh, finance, et cetera, that would definitely improve DAO operations. But I think a lot of it is communication. Right now, like, many people consider Discord to be synonymous with a DAO. Um, I think that's going to have to change a bit. Like, it's really, th those are communities, but 
Um, a social media platform does not equal a DAO community. <laughs> like, the community is much broader. So I would love to see tooling that fully integrates um, all of these aspects beyond just um, you know, a place to chat and different, <laughs> different servers and channels, et cetera. I remember this morning Paul mentioned that building a DAO and building a bio DAO is super hard and I think has also in part is the fact that we are missing the tooling, right? And I, the tools that you were mentioned for legal, finance, are things that we are struggling every day. Everyone that is building something think this struggle. Fortunately, like we are seeing that those happening, right? So, and I think that's really great, but I, th I think if you want to really increase the number of bio DAOs in the future, I think they need better tooling, but also kind of like a blueprint for how to at least get things started out of the ground because for startups we know ver they're very well, right? But for DAOs and bio DAOs, that's not the case and then go from there. You want to Ed? Yeah, so I think the tools that we desperately also, I mean, so the reputation tool that I talked about, then generally kind of uh, anonym anonymize <laughs> tools for making stuff anonymous. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, I think um, also better kind of DAO reporting tools. So I think um, even if, I mean, even if in principle everything is on chain, um, kind of taking apart DAO financials super hard. <laughs> so kind of, yeah, that would be super. Yes, yeah, that's true. Cool. Now, open up to, to the audience. Any questions? Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'll bring you a mic. Yeah. I got you. So I guess to prime this question, um, a lot of people talk about tooling, but um, very few people acknowledge or are cognizant of um, the people-related issues inside a DAO. And so I'm very interested in the touch points between operations and HR or what comes to contributor dynamics. And what are some guiding principles you use in, in your operations and um, your favorite thinker around the topic. Um, please share anything that, that you use to get started with these kinds of problems. Well, I think you, you definitely highlighted a key point. For me with operations, it goes in order of priority, people, process, and tools. Usually it's about the behavior you want people to engage in and how you encourage it. You create a process in order to deliver on that, and tools are there to enable. So it's really important to not start with the tools, as you said. And I think when working with contributors, um, this is probably the biggest difference between DAOs and startups or companies where you have people kind of moving in and out and contributing in different ways. Um, I think one important thing is to accept that there is a transient nature to it versus a corporation or startup. Um, I think the other thing is to make sure incentives are aligned. Um, and I think one key aspect, whenever you can, pay people. <laughs> it makes a big difference in terms of um, getting quality output um, and making it delivery based. So I really love bounty programs or sometimes grant programs depending on, on what it is, but where you see the quality of the work and then you pay the person, that builds their reputation and it builds the relationship because if they are compensated adequately, whether in tokens or tokens for the DAO or other tokens, or perhaps even fiat, depending on, on what the situation is, um, I think that makes a big difference. And then the other aspect is treating people with respect, which I know is, should be incredibly obvious, but sometimes you see in Web3, because of the transient nature, um, there sometimes isn't that desire to build any relationship. And in my view, again, starting with people, building that relationship, treating contributors with respect, valuing what they add is a great way to attract uh, top contributors and have them come back. That's great. Do you want to add to? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome answer. Go ahead. Let me rephrase. Uh, continue on this topic of people relationship. Uh, one of the greatest challenges of all startups is to find and retain talent. So when you're speaking about contributors and also transient contributors, what do you think that's going to be the game changer to give those people the trust to be like keep it contributing and not being like stolen for any big pharma corp? I think that's culture and conviction. So basically, if if you look at um, well, first of all, 
the pool of potential contributors to a DAO um, is much larger than for most companies because most companies don't consider hiring in many jurisdictions and and so on. So basically, first you know, first of the bat, kind of it's a much larger pool, um, and then. So basically, if, if you make the people believe in what you're building, um, they won't be easily lured away. And if they are, this is probably also a good thing for them, but also for you, right? Because you enabled them to kind of, they contributed and uh, kind of they, they get an awesome job elsewhere. You're happy for them, right? You're, you're, it's, I think this is kind of part of the culture of you know, building a startup, and we have that in traditional startups too, right? So basically, you, you have just raised funding and you're kind of employing uh, 10 people. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Google comes knocking and one of them leaves. It, it's what happens and it's fine. <laughs> and I think I would also add to that, um, the financial incentives, again, are still really important. Culture and commitment is great, but you can't pay your rent in culture, right? <laughs> so I would, I think when people have that, that conviction to the mission, especially if they're paid in the DAO tokens, it encourages them to work harder and to deliver value to the DAO, which increases the, the price of the DAO tokens, which they hold. So it becomes this kind of cycle that, that encourages um, top contributors to keep contributing. I think time for a final question. No question. No. Okay. We'll end it here. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank for you. joining me. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everyone. So we have three more panels or three more talks for the rest of the day. Uh, it'll be two individual talks and then a panel to round us out. And that'll happen after we take a short break. So I'd ask that everyone please come back here at 445 for us to finish the last three, two talks and a panel for the day. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, and then, of course, scientists spend also like way too much time applying for it. I think then on the more like replication side of things, uh, the big problem is that like a lot of science is not reproducible, and we don't know which science is not reproducible. Um, and there's often no negative uh, data results like reported. And of course, like a lot of things, like I think the best example was Alzheimer's recently is built on very shaky foundations where, it, for example, it turned out that the foundational assumption was wrong and like basically faked science. And I think that's a huge problem um, because basically there was like tens of billions wasted on Alzheimer's research that we shouldn't have done if there wouldn't have been this like faked research that it basically relied on. Then I think like also around competition, there's like a lot of perverse incentives and the life of a young academic is incredibly stressful but also severely kind of underpaid and like with, without really ownership in, in the scientific outcomes and kind of like, a, like publish or perish culture. And I think an interesting statistic for example is that like the, um, there's less than 2% of the NIH funding goes to under 35 year olds which I think shows part of also the problem. Um, and then on the communication side, I think, of course, a lot of science is uh, paywalled. It's not accessible to the majority of humans, even though they paid with it, with their tax dollars for the research, I think, which is also a huge problem. Um, and thus, it's really out of reach with human population, but also very hard to access, even if you have a paper. It's like really not made for like broad consumption, let's say. Um, so I, I think dissemination, peer review, and access are quite wrong. Um, and I think a lot of these problems stem from um, centralization and could be solved by decentralization. Um, so I'll go into some of the side-by-side um, -side comparisons, but I think um, comparing kind of like threats against these and then like with ex example of biodows more specifically, in a biodow model and, and the DSA model, the distribution kind of, of funds is more determined by the public and community using mechanisms such as DAOs, in the case of BioDAOs, or credit donations and other experiments and mechanisms to try to improve on uh, what's broken currently with funding and to add an alternative to it. Um, and of course, what I think is actually one of the biggest pluses, especially in BioDAOs, it's made quite transparently. Like in, in VitaDAO, you can go to the forum, see the research proposals being discussed, people vote on them, they ask questions. So um, it's much more transparent than like all of this being hidden behind committees and, um, and very intransparent decision making. And then of course, like, I think on the collaboration side, uh, it's much more collaborative by nature, especially with peers and, um, that collaborate all over the globe. And on the laboratory and infrastructure side with tools like LabDAO and others, it's possible to share the laboratory infrastructure and services uh, much more easily and on the publishing side, I think also we have new models for publishing um, that at the core use Web3 primitives like decentralized storage or identity and other aspects um, to kind of rethink publishing and some of the problems in publishing. And connected to that, of course, is also peer review, kind of getting uh, earning tokens and reputation for peer reviewing work. And then last but not least, connected to funding is the IP that basically in this new model, uh, the scientist can own the IP, the collective advancing the research owns the IP, um, and, and also can license it on more transparent terms. And I think the biggest one is ultimately how I view DSA as, like, as almost applied meta science. And for those of you that don't know meta science, it's kind of like the science of science, like using the scientific method to study what's broken with science and trying to fix it with novel experiments. And I think Decentralized science is kind of like a playground to try out different experiments on all these different aspects, like from funding, collaboration, uh, to publishing and other aspects. And I think, of course, I think DSI doesn't have uh, perfectly figured out all the right uh, solutions for these problems, but it's like a potential to experiment with novel mechanisms to land on potentially better mechanisms. And um, I think what I want to go into is basically the examples of some of the DAOs, like VitaDAO or HerDAO, that fix some of these problems concretely today and how they do it. Um, and I want to open this with this question of like, what if science is decentralized through BioDAOs and how this looks in practice? Um, so, like broadly, I think the why of BioDAOs is really to enable a collective um, to, uh, through a, um, 
decentralized decision making to advance and increase innovation. And of course, in Vitao's case, for example, in longevity, and make it really accessible to everyone. And um, I think what, what it constitutes is really like a, a online native, truly global organization that can, like across borders and with way lower barriers to entry, um, advance science and really allow for like distributed governance and resource allocation and research prioritization with, for example, road mapping. And then by really enabling scientists and communities to form, raise funding, run experiments, prioritize the research, share data and distribute insights in a more open way. Um, and I think really to, to underline some of the key aspects, I think what makes them so important is um, that at the core they're really focused on uh, constitu being constituted out of patients and enthusiasts um, that follow a specific mission. Like for example, in Vitadao's case, uh, everyone in the community uh, will suffer from age-related diseases and thus kind of like, it's, it's both like a patient and I would say also enthusiast because they're willing to spend their time or money in this community. And I think as another aspect, I think the benefit um, is that it's truly uh, like networked science, a bit like Michael Nielsen uh, lays out as like a more um, novel form of like scientific collaboration where it's possible to basically have the advantages of a network instead of like siloed individuals doing science in a very like open internet first uh, research organization. And I think I touch on this for the future. Like I think it's actually quite important structurally that it's internet first and internet native. I think like our current research ecosystem is physical first and very much not digital native. Um, and I think thus like we'll face problems with like a transition into the like future age, which will, will I think look, look much more autonomous and potentially also involve of course AI in many aspects. Um, and I think that will be very hard as a transition for the more physical old uh, uh, Tratsai world. Um, yeah, so like I described this before that kind of like I see these are almost like as an applied meta science playground trying out new experiments to really uh, come up with potential better solutions. And I want to go into some of the examples in, in Vita Dao's case where there's I think like a range of experiments even beyond IP that I think showcase uh, some of the things that like a traditional science organization or funding body is usually not uh, doing. So at a glance, like you might know kind of like some of these stats already from, and um, Paolo will speak also afterwards more about VitaDAO. So I don't want to touch on it too much, but I think the interesting one is almost on these verticals because I think a lot of people think that VitaDAO is like just funding science, but, um, and just through IP NFTs, but I think there's a lot more to it that actually I think strengthens the network and actually even increases the likelihood that like the IP it funds the spin-outs it creates are um, valuable. So of course on the funding side, which is the heart of it, uh, it's funding translational research, but it also, for example, uh, we did like experiments on like retroactive public goods funding, uh, on, on public goods funding with, through quadratic uh, donations with Vitalik and, and Gitcoin, for example. Um, but there's also now increasing amount, for example, of experiments on the publishing and peer review side with the um, overlay journal called Longevist and a peer review um, kind of program called Longevity Review, which actually attracted most of the leading uh, scientists in, in longevity. Um, and already I think has put out like the second journal. And then there's experiments, for example, even on physical um, manifestations like um, a network state with, for example, this experiment called Cesalo, but then also now uh, more experiments like this coming up. One is called uh, Vitalia in, in Prospera, and there's actually a lot of ongoing conversations with kind of a lot of the network states basically helping them um, with advice on their health program and on the long longevity side to almost like enable the broader Vitadao community to access different longevity native um, pop-up cities or longer term cities, which I think is actually quite crucial to people. It's like this community of scientists at the frontier, of also enthusiasts at the frontier uh, trying out new things. And then there's a range of, I think, also other uh, experiments, like from prizes to fellowships to hackathons and a bunch of other experiments. Like there's a longevity AI effort. Um, and I think 
what it just shows is that it's almost like the range of initiatives touching on almost every scientific vertical. And I'll also briefly touch on HERDA, which some of you uh, probably already heard from, that like they, I think, um, are an interesting example to even expand on some of these experiments and, and do also different experiments. So I think if you look at BioDAOs as kind of like a new scientific innovation model, like it's of course very focused to the therapeutic area and to um, like the, the efforts need to make sense within that area. So I think in that case, for longevity and for hair now, of course, it looks different because it's hair loss. Um, but I think what's interesting is almost like the range of these experiments and getting quite quick feedback loops and iterating on these experiments in real time and trying to fix the different problems uh, that we have currently in science on multiple fronts, not just on, for example, the funding of science, but also on a lot of other aspects. So I don't want to dwell on this too long because Paolo will speak about BetaDAO, but these are just examples of the journal and the peer review page, which for example is like happening completely in the open, incentivized by tokens, completely open access and freely accessible. So if you remember kind of the problems I touched on for publishing, I think this is a good shot in the direction of solving it. And for example, um, it's using also native DSI publishing tools like uh, DSI Labs so it's kind of like eating our own dog food uh, with some of the DSI uh, publishing solutions. And this was the example of the longevity network state and some of the other experiments. And that's like one and a half or two years in. I think there's of course just like the start of like a bunch of other experiments that I think will be quite interesting. And I think really the power is that all of this strengthens the network, like ultimately through the quadratic donation round, we funded over 50 research projects and even funded some like impetus grants that in turn funded 100 research projects. So there's really like, I think a surface area that is quite huge in terms of like people uh, it affects and also the impact it potentially creates. Also on, for example, the fellowship uh, side um, and other aspects. Um, and in Herder's example, I think what's quite interesting because you can do so much stuff directly with hair loss. Um, I think there's a lot of like citizen science, for example, in um, hair loss of people just trying out things and sharing what works and what doesn't, um, which connects to their patient portal. I think they, they do really interesting things around um, getting people really involved on like gamification incentives, like they mentioned with the uh, Ready Hair Player one, where they incentivize people sharing targets, where basically people get a reputation score for really helping drive and advance research, which I think is really interesting. Um, and then really it's like a direct to consumer community where like the community wants to access the treatments they develop. Um, and then I think ultimately also important, I think uh, they have immaculate vibes and memes, which I think like science lacks, like it's often very dry and serious. And I think um, Hedda is a great example of making it very like light and fun. Um, and, and those are just some of the examples, like on, on their um, research portal and also, of course, really um, already having like a pretty advanced research project with the like, um, most uh, highest cited, like most popular scientist in the world on handles, I think really shows that this actually also translates into actual scientific progress and discoveries. And then uh, I just want to briefly touch on more like the future outlook because I think to an extent, of course, there's still quite early and, and experimental, and I think lots of things are still to figure out and, and improve. But I think fundamentally, when I think about like w w uh, where could science end up in like five, 10, 20 years, I think really like traditional science is like massively underprepared for it. And I think really will struggle to stay relevant like in 10, 20 years. And I think uh, you need internet native scientific organizations and like as many smart people as possible uh, including computer scientists, including people that like are impossible to recruit into academic organizations to stay relevant and contribute to scientific advancements. And I think we see this with things like DeepMind, for example, driving really huge scientific uh, progress, uh, while like the academic community didn't really uh, crack like protein folding as well as like a team of like five people there did. And I think one uh, connected to that is really that I think we'll switch to increasingly AI-driven closed-loop R&D, which basically means 
uh, a system where artificial um, intelligence agents propose an experiment, potentially run the experiment, evaluate the experiment, and the, um, learn from the experiment to devise a new experiment or to figure out like a solution to a disease. And I think the interesting thing is like a DAO, I think fundamentally is perfectly set out to be a playground for that because ultimately you could have like an AI agent sourcing um, research, evaluating it, um, funding it, even execute, like pro devising experiments for a contract research organization or cloud lab, executing it. Um, and I think what we could see in the near future is, for example, you could imagine um, like in a, in a community to have different uh, agents that propose experiments or run experiments and get paid for it and compete. And ultimately, I think that really um, enables like a, a very like AI native driven um, R&D organization where, where still humans are in the loop and it's still understandable how the decision making is made and you can still, you could delegate to an AI to vote on your behalf and I think that will increasingly lose, uh, look like quite possible. Like we already have the first like GPT generated like research evaluations uh, with actually quite valuable questions asked to the researcher where they respond back to it and, and I think those things start to make sense and I think especially in like 10 years it will look quite obvious that it will be like the superior way to do a lot of different functions that are currently done by humans. Um, then I think it fundamentally DESA is really upgrading almost like the scientific method and, and stack and really like with this frame of like applied meta science is much more actively iterating and working on science versus just like within science and within a broken science system it's trying to actively improve like the scientific method and, and kind of like tool stack. And I think one benefit is it's truly global and enables truly autonomous and decentralized R&D, which I think will also become increasingly important. Um, it, I think which is quite important almost like from a, a mission because I think right now you have like less than 0.1% of humans being involved in the scientific uh, process. Like, like they're neither involved in funding it nor in, in contributing to it. And I think the potential is that like a much bigger surface area of humans could get involved in, in science. And then I think fundamentally in the also example like VitaDAO and HairDAO, uh, patients and researcher communities can get involved to govern their cures and also access to medications and contribute in, in different uh, ways with like very different touch points. I think the vision is a bit also like that it becomes as easy to do science as it is to log into a website. Like fundamentally, um, I think there's a lot of ways where uh, like a lot of people could get involved in science. Um, another, I think, important aspect is making sure that actually it becomes uh, profitable to an extent still to, be, to, to become like a scientist that really contributes to innovations, which I think is currently right now decoupled. Like there are sometimes scientists that um, lead, that, like do the research that lead to billion dollar drugs and they are completely disintermediated and make no money in this process, which I think is fundamentally uh, broken if you compare it with startups, for example, where of course the founding team is uh, more fairly compensated. Um, I think it's also a vision where like science decouples to an extent from like legacy institutions that are, have like broken incentives and, and a lot of uh, problems as I pointed out earlier. Um, and to close off maybe like as a call to action more, of course many of you are already in, involved but I think important is kind of like to, to actually get involved and try to also improve these communities uh, or get funded as a researcher or fund research that you're excited about. Um, and then there's I think a lot of touch points from referring research um, to, to other aspects that I think a lot of people can get involved in. And that's about it. So uh, you can scan kind of this QR code which is a link tree with like a bunch of touch points. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. So two more talks before the end of the day. I wanna let you all know that we're gonna take a group photo before we wrap up for the day. So make sure that you stay to the end to be immortalized in the picture. Up next, we have Paolo. Paolo is a core contributor of VitaDAO. And after two years of operations and 20 projects funded, 
he'll be talking about Viridao's coming to age. Thank you for the organizer for inviting me. It's a fantastic event. I'm very happy to be in sunny Berlin. Today I'm going to talk about Vita Dao and uh, about the achievement since uh, two years uh, from its foundation in uh, June 2021. And I'll probably cover some of the topics that have been already anticipated by my colleagues, including uh, Vincent. So a couple of words about my background. I am with uh, Vitadao, but also with Elspan Capital, which is uh, a venture capital focusing on longevity biotech. Capital Cell, crowd equity organization in Barcelona. BIP, which is uh, strategy consulting. And I was formerly affiliated with Ariane Group, making rockets. I left the company basically a year ago in order to focus on longevity. And I've been active in longevity for uh, quite a while, actually. Uh, I've uh, done some citizen science as a volunteer with Pedro de Magalhães lab on the genomics of aging, with Colin Ewald lab on the extracellular metrics proteomics. And I've also been involved uh, with the uh, long gap, which is a fantastic event, uh, essentially an hackathon uh, where anybody can take part and contribute in solving uh, the problems of aging. I'm still affiliated to the Longevity Biotech Fellowship. If anyone here is interested seriously in longevity, I strongly encourage to join. I studied at the University of Pisa, Polytechnic Milano, basically an engineering background with a PhD in bioengineering. So I'm not going to spend lots of time on this slide because I guess I preach to the core. Uh, this is uh, pretty well known, it's expanding. But I'm going to give you my point of view on why it's important why this is important? Well, I guess, uh, as Vincent uh, hinted, uh, this is a way to get anybody doing some work on science, contributing to solving some of the biggest problems around. And that means people from any background and from anywhere without constraint. And that also brings fresh ideas to the field, helping uh, tackle some challenges that have been stagnant for years. And I guess, a big example, a famous one, is uh, the first flight that took place in 1903, and that was made possible by two people who were not engineers from big company, they were two bicycle mechanics. I think that this eye is important uh, even more for aging, because aging is such a universal issue, frailty, aging-related diseases. Everybody, unfortunately, will have to face them at some point, and so I think it's important that everyone has the right to take action against it. Also, the research into aging, and in particular the companies that are popping up like mushrooms and VCs as well, they're going to uh, generate enormous amount of wealth. And I think that everybody should have right to a piece of the pie. And even more importantly, because uh, Longevity medicine will be transformative in the way we, we age and basically improve the quality of life. Everybody should access to it. And while VitaDAO is not uh, tackling all of these points, uh, uh, it's a first step, uh, it's a first step uh, at uh, addressing some of them. So VitaDAO, uh, it's been mentioned several times today. Uh, here in a nutshell, uh, what we have done so far. 20 projects funded, about 4 million bit more actually. Um, we now have uh, still uh, quite a bunch of projects under review and we have 2,400 token holders and 9,000 contributors. So we have gone a long way since June 2021 and it's growing. The specificity of VitaDAO as a funding entity is that we come in very early. We come in uh, earlier than venture capital we come in a bit later than uh, typical uh, public research and we're essentially a bridge. So we take uh, promising translational science that has a commercial potential and convert it into uh, valuable IP, intellectual property that can at some point become a company 
And then that company is funded by all the players which are downstream in the, in the value chain. That includes venture capital, corporate venture capital, such as Pfizer Venture. Mike uh, Baran presented uh, like uh, one hour ago. So eventually what uh, starts with us can make it all the way to IPO or to any other kind of exit. We want uh, to fund uh, research uh, that can lead uh, to longevity therapeutics uh, and we want to do it massively. So for us it's important to put our resources uh, on projects that are uh, relevant scientifically, but at the same time we want to do so sustainably. In other words, not to have to rely on token holders and uh, strategic partners to fund us, but to be able to generate the funds to fund even more research uh, thanks to returns. We want to make sure that what we fund at some point can generate a return, a good return. And this is why when we receive application or referrals, we apply six criteria that ensure that these two goals, these two uh, objectives are uh, basically satisfied. Here you have uh, our uh, deal flow final process at a glance. The yellow part is what I just talked about. It's essentially a screening phase. If a referral, basically if an application makes it to that stage, then we work with the founder to prepare a proposal. That proposal is then voted by our community, at least people who have a certain uh, trust level, and then it's reviewed by our community of senior reviewers. We have uh, 50 of them and the community is increasing. They come from uh, VC, from pharma, from biotech, and of course from academia. So we have a, a very thorough due diligence process that then enables token holder to make a decision because once this process is completed, so phase two is completed, we publish on chain the proposal enriched with the, the outcome of the review. So token holders can vote according to how many tokens they have. And once an application is successful, it's voted, token holders have said yes, then it becomes a project. We now have about 20 projects, as I said before. We have spin-outs, startups. About half and half. Spin-outs, uh, they're not all technically spin-outs yet, because some of them still are in the lab and need uh, to generate valuable IP, which can then be minted into uh, IP NFT and then eventually make into company. One of them uh, has already been uh, incorporated, that's Matrix Bio, and I will come back to it uh, a little bit later. Startups uh, are mostly early stage, but we have a couple of ones which are quite close to clinical trials. And together with my colleagues at the Longevity Working Group, uh, in particular uh, Maria Marinova, who will present tomorrow, and Eleanor Davis, uh, who is the deal flow steward, we have put together a dashboard of uh, different metrics to characterize our portfolio and guide uh, us in our uh, future choices. So at the most basic level, uh, we are analyzing uh, what is the split between uh, uh, spin-outs and uh, startups, and it's basically even, which means that it's kind of a compromise between uh, high risk and reward and a bit more, uh, I would say, safer bets. We also look at uh, what type of project we fund. Mainly it's therapeutics, like the overwhelming majority is therapeutics, but we are also looking at diagnostics or digital health. And uh, it's usually very early stage, as I said before, so basically in the discovery phase. Now, for those of you who do not come from the longevity space, uh, uh, when you age uh, in your body, a wide range uh, of uh, mechanism occur uh, particular damage that can be classified according to classes so 12 hallmarks of aging at least this is the consensus in today's scientific community it's going probably to change to evolve and uh, you want to address each one of them and the way you do it is uh, with the uh, strategies which correspond to the hallmarks of longevity on the right hand side so these charts show that we have, with our current portfolio, which is still relatively small, a good coverage of the different uh, mechanisms and of the different strategies to tackle aging. Some of them are overrepresented, some of them need perhaps more uh, attention, 
And this is a way to orient our sourcing efforts for the future. Most of our ventures come from the United States, no surprise. Many of them come from Northern Europe. Um, we probably need to do some work to attract uh, interesting ventures from other parts of the world, including Southern Europe and Asia or anywhere else good science is made. Now, the go-to-market disease class uh, requires a bit of explanation because uh, the typical playbook uh, of longevity biotech companies consists in uh, identifying uh, a mechanism of aging which can be targeted with a specific intervention and that is relevant for a certain number of diseases, usually multiple diseases, because uh, the mechanism of aging are relatively pleiotropic. So then you make the choice of which disease you bring to the market first, which is important. And that's what this chart is showing. But that by no means is an indication of the potential of uh, this uh, intervention, which can be much wider. Because then, once you have a successful drug for one indication, you can label expand and go into other indication. In the future, when the regulatory uh, path will be there, you might even consider giving this intervention, if they're safe enough, to healthy people in order to prevent diseases rather than curing them. As you can see, most of the intervention are prioritizing skin and uh, cardiovascular. But again, uh, this, can be, th this will probably evolve. We also mapped uh, how well our different ventures uh, are situated in terms of uh, commercial potential and alignment to our longevity mission versus uh, the feasibility and data. Each bubble is a project or a venture that we funded. The blue ones are startups and the other one are spin-outs. As you can see, most of them cluster in the right-hand uh, upper uh, quarter which is where you want them to be. There are some outliers, and in some cases there is an explanation, which is uh, that we assess startups uh, and other types of venture using other criteria, for example, company which may be not be so novel or uh, have big data, maybe they have a great team and we want to bet on the team. In other cases, this kind of representation can tell us that you know, maybe we want to refine the way we make uh, our due diligence. These are some recent examples. Not all of them are super recent, but a couple of them are, of our recent ventures that I wanted to point out to you. And I guess some of them are, have already been mentioned and they will probably be mentioned uh, even tomorrow in other talks. But uh, the first project on the left-hand side, the Victor Krolchuk Autophagy Activators, uh, it, uh, basically it has been funded a while ago, but the novelty is that uh, we made it into a fractionalized IP NFT. So that's a world first. The second part and milestone is about Matrix Bio, Virgo Bunova project, which was our first spin out. And I guess Maria will talk about it. And then we have two companies on the right, a Clarity Spectacular company that uh, is one of our closest to clinical trials. And Exception, which is a good example of the collaboration between us and uh, Pfizer Venture, the uh, strategic partner that we have uh, in pharma. Basically, Exceptgem comes from Mike Baran, and uh, we liked it, uh, we supported it, and uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Ra Capital, which is one of the most uh, important uh, investors in the biotech space, uh, come along. And I finish with this slide uh, with a couple of uh, feedback from uh, the people uh, who apply and who get funded from us. What we are getting as uh, feedback is that uh, we are smart money. Uh, we are not just giving cash, but also network expertise uh, and validation to the funded ventures so that they can get money easier. I got an email uh, a few days ago by uh, an academic project that was able to secure funding from uh, the government, uh, thanks also to our uh, letter of support. So with that, I am finished with the presentation. I look forward for any question that you may have. If there are, uh, maybe not. All right. Thank you so much, Paolo. All right. For our last and final session, 
Uh, we're actually going to have a panel talk, so I'd like to invite the following folks up on stage. Can we get Brian, uh, Michael, Simon, and Andrea? We're going to have four experts in the DSI space, and they'll be interviewed and by myself. And once again, as a reminder, please don't forget to be here before the end of the talk as we'll be taking a group photo and you don't want to miss out on being in there. All right, um, before we get into this, I was hoping each one of you could just give yourself a brief intro, that way I'm not introducing every single person, and then we'll just jump right in. Uh, sure, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me here. And my name is Simone Fantaccini. I've been working uh, in clinical development in pharma for a few years now. Um, I'm a medical doctor by background, I'm a clinician by background, and since a couple of years, uh, probably more, we um, have been studying emerging technologies in life sciences and how life sciences can benefit innovation in, in life sciences. And since two years ago, we started exploring the, the space of uh, DAOs in life sciences. Yep, nice to see everyone again. Uh, Mike Barron here from Pfizer Ventures. Um, so my scientific background is a PhD in biophysics, structural biology. Uh, I've been at Pfizer for 15 years in R&D almost the whole time, trying to make uh, medicines. And uh, for the last, coming up on six years, I guess, uh, dedicated to venture capital, biotech venture capital. So, thank you. Hi everybody, Brian Majerski. Um, my background's been in enterprise software for 25, 23 years. I'm an entrepreneur for those 20 years across four different ventures. Um, I don't have a bio or a neuroscience background, but um, I forked my career into brain health about a few years ago. And uh, mostly driven from my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter who has Down syndrome. And uh, the awakening when uh, she had her first uh, autoimmune condition that that whole population suffers from early onset of Alzheimer's disease. And um, just a frustration with the past 30 years of Alzheimer's research and in general the current lack of understanding of brain health. And so I fused my software and, and crypto interests with brain health and here I am. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Stefano Pinilla. I'm a pharmacist by training and a PhD in pharmacology. And uh, yeah, I was an early contributor at uh, BetaDAO, and now I'm uh, co-leading the, the science uh, and deal flow working group together with Maria Marinova uh, in Athena Down. So yeah, very interested in, in uh, the translational potential as an academic of, of DSI and how it can help academics uh, bridge this uh, path from the, the lab bench to, to the patients. Right. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Rampoldi. Uh, let's say I've entered the DSI movement uh, from the back door because I don't have a scientific uh, academic background. I started with uh, management engineering, then I specialized in finance and uh, throughout the years I was focusing more and more on finding uh, ways uh, uh, with which technology could solve financial problems. So financial innovation, open innovation, etc. And I got really into BioDAOs because I, I've seen that they really can solve a super urgent funding gap we have in science. And so, yeah, I, I started researching with Simone uh, on how finance can solve problems in life science. So, yeah. That's actually one way I get started. Um, a question I'd like each one of you to answer is where did you get the desire to get into the DSI space when, uh, in the DAO ecosystem as opposed to doing this through a traditional uh, venture, especially those that are experienced in starting traditional ventures? I'm happy to start. Um, being in the industry for a while, then you realize that many things you can do differently. Uh, you can do better, um, especially if you look at how long it takes to bring innovation to patients. Uh, it takes more than a decade. And uh, 
even more if you look at when the discovery happened. So we had a recent case, a CAR T, so very famous CAR T cell therapies. If you look back at when the discovery happened, uh, it happened 40 years before the drug reached the market, which is not acceptable for many reasons. So, and this is how I personally, I started looking into different ways uh, to accelerate innovation in, in life sciences, but at the same time, it was not just a gut feeling, so we wanted to be uh, systematic in the approach. This is how we started assessing all the different perspectives around drug discovery, around translational medicine and development until the, the go-to market, so until you bring these products to, to patients in needs. And we started mapping all the struggles of different people, like pharmaceutical companies, VCs, investors, patients, patient associations. And at some point, then mapping all the alternative and emerging solutions, we found out that probably we can solve a lot of these. Not all of these, because we have to be honest with ourselves. It's a journey. But probably, with a more open, decentralized approach, you can solve a lot of these. Because life sciences is already, by definition, um, an industry that relies on open innovation. There is no closed innovation in life sciences. So already in the most basic case, you have a discovery happening in the university and then an industry, I mean the industry, the company coming in and developing eventually that, that innovation. So open innovation is not new. We just need tools uh, to accelerate open innovation. And DSI is a way, at least for me, for accelerating open innovation. Yep, I can go next. Um, so my, uh, my journey here to Vita Dao and DSI is a little less formal. Um, I'll take you back to the lockdown years of uh, COVID. Um, a lot of us were trapped indoors with looking for new hobbies. And uh, I opened a Robinhood account and I bought some Bitcoin. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know anything about blockchains. I just bought Bitcoin. And it went up every day. It just kept going up. I was like, what is this stuff, right? Finally, I got out of the house and uh, the family decided to go on a long road trip and my wife drove a lot of the way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, wife. <laughs> but uh, I took that time to learn about blockchains and how they work. And um, DeFi, right, decentralized finance was a, a, a very hot topic at that time, 2021. And um, I started thinking, wow, like um, this is pretty cool technology. You know, not the tokens themselves, like the underlying blockchain technology. How can we apply this to biotech? I'd love to think of a way to do that. And then I stumbled across VitaDAO, which I just launched, like literally like three months before I uh, discovered it. And I said, oh, my first reaction, oh man, they beat me to it. <laughs> um, but that, then I started learning what they were doing. And I was like, you know, maybe this is like a good way to uh, pilot this with Pfizer. And, uh, and then that brings me to within Pfizer, how we got there. Um, you know, we're always looking for new ways to partner uh, with early stage, either academia, academia or biotech. And um, we, we, we have a, a nice history over the last 10 years of developing new models, right? So in around 2010, I think we were the, one of the first pharma to pioneer the open innovation model of co-locating academic and uh, Pfizer scientists together to develop drugs. That's our centers for therapeutic innovation. I had an a, a icon on, in my previous presentation about that. Um, then closer to 2020, maybe like 2018 or so, we came up with this concept of generating academic consortiums that we call ITENS. Um, and it's just a way of bringing together academics from different institutions to work in areas that you know, we have a common interest in. And so fast forward to 2022 now we're in, and I said uh, to my Pfizer colleagues, you know, we have an opportunity here to get involved in a new model that's just getting started. Clearly a lot of momentum in this space. I think we should take a look. And, you know, it's 2023, here we are. So. Well, when I um, decided to go into brain health to address this um, uh, issue with, uh, with the Down syndrome population and more broadly, um, I, I looked at the last 30 years and, and the thing with neurodegeneration and cognitive decline isn't, is, it's not a lack of funding. We have a lot of money in this space. Uh, it just comes from two sources, over 90% of it, and you know it gets allocated to very few strategies. And so I just said, well, you know, if the the 
the situation with, with neurodegeneration and cognitive decline too, a lot of people don't realize is it, it happens decades before any symptoms really emerge. And so it's silent and people don't know what's happening. Uh, so for Down syndrome in particular, it's going to happen in their 30s when the pathology starts. The symptoms emerge in the 50s and 60s. So I looked and said, well, I've got about 20, 25 years to make an impact here. Uh, what are we going to do to prevent the past 30 years of, you know, the past being prologue for the next 30? Um, because then it'll be too late. And uh, so I just started thinking differently. And I, I love software. Um, I was already addicted to blockchain and crypto assets. I got the bug a few years earlier than Michael. Um, and I, what I knew about blockchains and crypto assets and networks were their amazing coordination potential, properly designed mechanisms they can coordinate talent and capital globally to go after any common mission better than anything I've ever seen. And so I looked at venture philanthropy, I looked at just general foundations, I looked at impact funds, and all of those had so many constraints and nothing was gonna be different. And we had plenty of those with plenty of money and we still weren't solving the problem. So I wanted a different way to do it and that led me to the bio DAOs. Um, I'm also thinking I, you need a comprehensive approach on this too. And, you know, Web3, uh, it, it's growing and growing fast, but we need to onboard tens of millions of people. We need to get that community engaged. The brain health community may not be crypto native yet, maybe crypto resistant. So I needed something complementary to that, and that's kind of a Web2 app that's going to educate and train people and start tracking longitudinally. Uh, brain health data and fuse that with pointing these people toward the research that they can fund and participate in. And so I, I think that's how we can kind of change the game and I'm trying to do it comprehensively. Yeah, I come from directly from the academic side. So I'm, I'm a postdoc and when BDDAO launched, I, I started collaborating with them a little bit before. And I just, I was in the process of filing IP for something I uh, researched during my PhD. I was starting to come into contact with all these like TTOs, all these process that academic need to follow in order to, to basically try to spin out something out of the university. And I was extremely lost, uh, even though I, I work in Denmark and there they have a very nice ecosystem for, for these kind of things. It was uh, a very confusing experience as, as an academic. And I was not interested in crypto at all, so I. I was, uh, I mean, it was a cool technology, but the financial aspect was not super, super attractive to me. Uh, and then I learned about PeterDAO, what they were trying to do about Molecule and, and what they were trying to do with uh, tokenized uh, IP. And I thought, okay, I, this seems like a potential use that, that actually is interesting and it's useful besides the whole like self-referential crypto financial stuff. Um, and I entered the community, and I think only entering the community was much more valuable than all the conversations I've had, I've had had with my TTO. So like being able to connect with a community of people passionate about translating science, people with a lot of experience from very different walks of lives, uh, helped me basically uh, orient my, my own research and the next steps I needed to, to take for my own project, but also made me realize the importance of connecting uh, scientists, academic scientists, with all these communities. And it's basically what I've been doing since, in, in BDDAO first and now with Athena DAO, besides scouting for potential interesting projects, organizing the deal flow and, and the applications we receive, is actually talking with both institutions and individual researchers to onboard them into crypto. Because as, 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 as you said, it, it was, it, it, there is like a lot of resistance uh, uh, for crypto and, and science, I think, uh, is, yeah, it's, it's very much hostile uh, to, to crypto. It's perceived as a very hostile environment also for, for scientists and people that, normally scientists are kind of slow people, like we tend to, in, we, we tend to just read papers for hours, think a lot about topics, we are not very dynamic. Uh, and I think it's super useful to connect that kind of slow thinking with the ultra fast thing of both crypto, but also people that already have the experience to, to translate projects is, is I think the main uh, utility of, of these huge communities. Yeah, uh, I think my co-panelists uh, 
describe the, all the fundamental reason why this eye can be valuable. So I can add something from my perspective. Maybe you will agree with me, but what really made me make the switch and uh, enter the, this world is that after years of crypto projects, every day a new crypto projects, now you can find something that has a clear purpose and there is a clear problem to be solved and crypto is the mean, blockchain is the mean by which you solve it. So they are not selling you the crypto idea, they are selling the problem and how to solve it. So this, I think this is a, one of the main strength points of uh, this side. Totally, and, and when done correctly, uh, in a lot of cases, you, know, you don't even realize that there's a blockchain being involved, you just see the results you know, hit the market. Um, Estafano, you, you, you touched on something that I thought was really like, important that I've seen in my experience working with scientists. It's that uh, you know, scientists are very, very data-oriented. They think a lot about papers. They think a lot about science. Um, they don't think so much about like, marketing, branding, you know, go-to-market, so on and so forth. And, and so I, I want to ask you all, how do you think about uh, when, when scientists want to get involved into something that is so outside of the academic realm, that's so outside of the academic form of thinking, how can they wrap their minds around contributing to, to a DAO, which is you know, clearly not an academic setting? You know, what advice do you have for them uh, of like, how to leave the lab and kind of join reality? I, I can start, happy to start. Um, we touched on that a bit. I think we have to focus on the problem to solve. What is the mission behind? So as you alluded to as well, what is behind that vehicle? The vehicle per se is not important. It, it is important the direction, what is the, the ultimate goal? And, and we have seen that. I mean, discussing a lot of scientists, researchers, people that are very active in clinical development, if you start discussing about tokens, about blockchain, I mean, they're lost after 30 seconds. So you have to focus on what is the mission and how doing things differently through a DAO, through decentralized science can benefit them, can solve a lot of their problems. So flipped in that and you focus on the problems you're trying to solve and how can they benefit from, from that approach, then you get them immediately on board because they see it. So if you start from their problem in our experience, this is how actually how it went with, with sign up. So we were discussing about research. And of course, in our network, you have a lot of researchers. I mean, a lot of MDs, a lot of people working in, in com pharma companies. And they were like, actually, this, this is cool. So we could solve a lot of struggles. So, but we didn't discuss about what's behind. We didn't discuss about the blockchain. So that will come at a later point. So we discuss about the tokens, we discuss about everything. But you focus on the mission, and that is to, to be common, and then you focus on how this different approach can benefit them. Please. Yeah, I, I would say um, dealing with um, PIs or biotech operators that have uh, a specific project and they need to raise money for it, it's, it's not, it, in my experience, it hasn't been that difficult of a sell, right? Because there just isn't enough capital in that space to fund uh, research. And so people are open to, you know, by any means necessary, as, as uh, the quote goes, right? To get your project financed. Uh, I've also had discussions with the head of tech transfer offices from, you know, a number of high profile universities in the US. And there it becomes a little bit of a more more of a challenge, right? But the, the um, discussion is a bit different, right? What I first described, you're talking to an individual PI, there's like a clear project on the table that needs to get funded. My discussions with the TTOs are more like, hey, you know, this is an alternative funding source. Uh, you guys are always looking to recover your patent fees. Would you consider this? And then it's like, whoa, you know, crypto, uh, what is this? Uh, we don't understand this. And th there's a barrier there. And some will just say, you know, we don't want to get involved with that. Others are more more open. So that's my experience. It, it was surprising. I've had um, a couple of conversations now with large university tech transfer offices, and if you actually explain the IP NFT concept, um, you know, in a in an understandable way, I guess, um, the reactions are are quite positive. Uh, initially, it was you know these universities didn't want anything to do with crypto. They became the gatekeeper for the PIs you know, at that particular university, for me anyway. And then when I explained IP NFT, the reaction literally was, that is the first use case of a token I've heard that makes sense. <laughs> 
and, and, and so they're open to it, but then, then IP ownership becomes an issue. I, I think they're still more comfortable with um, you know, the, the out licensing and retaining their ownership of the IP. But it'll vary by university, I guess. Yeah, yeah, just highlighting the importance of speaking the same language of the scientists and the TTOs and uh, going to, to find them where they are, academic conferences. And I, when, I, when I try to approach scientists, and especially, as, as Mike has said, like TTOs, I, I try to not mention crypto that much until like very late in the process where, because it's not really important for the uh, deal we're trying to, to get into. And then I mention crypto at the end, like, okay, this is the mechanism that we use. It doesn't really affect anything we've been discussing until now. These are the implications, but really doesn't change any of the legal stuff that we have already been discussing or the scientific stuff uh, with, with, with the scientists. And, and I think uh, then, then you realize that people are much more open to, to to these kind of, of uh, mechanisms that initially uh, what is, is thought. Yeah, and also if I can add, uh, I mean, this is a transitory phase when you really have to focus on uh, speaking their language, etc. But I think that every time a deal is closed and someone adopts the technology, it makes it easier for the next time because you have some social proofs to show to, to the other. And so, yeah, I think that time will make it easier and easier. Definitely. Um, I want to switch gears a bit. Everyone on this panel has either seen or been a part of a successful uh, scientific DAO. What are the key metrics on the inside that tell you, hey, you're on the route for success, like things are going in the right direction? Well, it's, um, it's curious that you ask, because this is something I have discussed with many people uh, today, um, because coming from the mindset of, of a company, uh, you ask yourself, um, how do you measure success? So it's, it's, we had a great speech from, from Paolo just, just before this panel, and that's a nice way to measure success. You, you can tell, so this is su successful. Um, we have also to recognize that everything that we know about DAOs in life sciences is based on Vita DAO. That's the blueprint, I mean, at least for me. So that's, that's my perspective. And then the question I ask myself, and I don't have an answer to that, uh, how do we measure success when we deploy DAOs in other areas that are by definition very different? Because in, in the case of Vita DAO, this is something that emerged from our study. So Vita DAO is built on a very strong community that existed before the DAO. So now we will face um, different challenges. We will face challenges that today we don't know. And we have to find out then how we face and eventually we go past these challenges and how we define success with, with these new DAOs. Yeah, I would say uh, I look at it the same way we look at it within Pfizer Ventures. And remember, we're a little bit of a different profile than a traditional institutional venture group that's just driven by financial return. Um, so we look at financial return. I showed that one slide in my talk, right? For sure, we, we keep an eye on that. Uh, but on the strategic side, how do, you, how do you quantitate that? Can you quantitate that? Uh, the easier way is just to have a few clear examples to point to. Uh, Paolo mentioned the recent investment in Exception. Uh, that's an interesting case study, right? So that's a company that um, Pfizer was already in discussions with. Uh, um, I think we have an MTA with them and we had their material in our hands and we were studying it. Um, and an opportunity came for VitaDAO to invest uh, in the company uh, on the back of a, a larger financing. I think we showed on the slide, right, that RA Capital also uh, recently invested. And um, so that's great. You know, you can only do so much under the terms of the MTA. And now Pfizer, by participating in VitaDAO, <coughs> we're able to use VitaDAO to help Exception generate more data and uh, help us get more comfortable with this early stage uh, science opportunity. Uh, just one other note I'll just mention on this like uh, topic of performance is um, <clears throat> now wearing my Pfizer Ventures hat, uh, all of the b biotech uh, VCs, you know, we, we get together periodically, like once or twice a year, full team sit down and we just run through each other's portfolios. Um, we're always sharing deal flow with each other. And it's, it's really interesting, right? Like uh, in the traditional biotech financing space, you know, we participate in pretty big financings, like 50, $100 million rounds. These are massive, right? And we talk about those, but it's funny, like inevitably, I always get questions about DSI and VitaDAO. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'll just note that um, 
you know, I think while we don't have a lot of participation from the, you know, blue chip venture biotech world at this time, people are watching. And uh, this question of how we quantitate success is, is important. And I think we need to put some wins up on the board sooner than later, because eventually someone's going to say, uh, someone was showing today the market cap of DSI. Uh, I think Paul was showing that, right? Like trying to shoot for a billion dollar market cap. Well, that's great. You know, you've put all this money into this space, but what have we got out of it? And so I think we have two or three years, but we have to put some wins up on the board here. And wins will be like starting clinical trials, uh, spinning out new companies that go on to attract traditional venture capital. Maybe a pharma company licensed something from a, a DSI financed uh, project. Uh, but we need a few of those sooner than later. And then I think you'll see some of the people that are kind of lurking on the sidelines come in and put their money where their mouth is, skin in the game, so. Yeah, I'd echo both of those points. Um, it, it, it does come down, and each DAO by DAO, it's gonna come down to your mission uh, and your objectives and goals and measuring against those, and it's gonna be different for each DAO. Uh, you know, I, I think at the core, uh, certainly community engagement, these are, you know, patient-driven communities. Um, you know, uh, evangelist-driven communities, people that really care, they're looking for solutions. Uh, so that level of engagement, and not just engagement by, you know, participating, but also are they sharing data? Uh, are the incentive mechanisms working? Are they participating in some of the research that's going forward? Um, you know, the momentum on research projects, are we attracting high-quality projects um, and getting them funded? And are they tracking their way toward market and toward actual human use? Um, you know, those are, those are going to be the things that we have to do. And I, I do think um, institutional validation is going to be a big one at some point. Uh, we have to integrate into the system somehow. It's great to see Pfizer doing that. I think that was a huge lift uh, for the DSI space. I know I felt it from some of the institutions I was talking to when that happened. I could share it, and all of a sudden they were much more receptive. Uh, there are other cogs in these wheels. I mean, ultimately I hope that DSI kind of becomes the underlying network and heartbeat and the other institutions are latching onto it because they have to. Um, and, and I think that's where it all will go, but um, I, I think we gotta get them interested and engaged first. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with everything said, especially with Mike, like at the end, we, we will measure success when we reach, like uh, we bring some uh, drug therapeutic uh, diagnostic actually to, to the market and we can compare our performance. For, personally, for me, like the success metrics have been changing. Like at the beginning, I was like, as like if we receive an application of uh, a good application from a good institution, a scientist I admire, that's a success for me. And then it was like, okay, that that happened a lot. And then it started to be okay. Now we need to fund good science. We need to evaluate it. We need. And now, but it's but it's good news that my I've been moving the pulse, right? Because it means that that we've been like checking all those boxes. And now it's like, okay, now now we really need to to start spin out projects from all these uh, funded science and, and demonstrate that, that it can go as far as uh, other, uh, other mechanisms that are there. Yeah, uh, I agree with you guys, but you yeah, know, just to add, I think that currently today, BioDAOs are proving their success as uh, uh, community tools uh, and mission aligning tools. Take a big crowd and align them toward the mission. I think what we are missing now, and only time will tell, is are they sustainable? Because in the end, you need sustainability to exist, because right now they are pumped by funding. So yeah, it's just we missed the last brick, but time will tell, yeah. yeah it's time to value. I mean, it, it's the underlying you know, fundamental necessity for any emerging ecosystem or startup even. And I think that's what it is. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I could have these guys up here for another hour or two, but sadly, we are out of time. So please give a big round of applause to our panel. All right, thank you, everybody. Um, I, we are gonna all come up here and take a photo, but first, the, the five of us will, and then get prepared to jump on stage with us. We're almost by height. <laughs> Yay, day one's over, woo! <laughs>
just run up here. And we're going to have you go in the middle. Don't be shy. Come on. What, what are you waiting for? Get up here. 